resuming work on the bill now following a break for votes on the House floor. Live coverage on C-SPAN 2. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that we freeze the committee to those members in the room at present. It, <laughs> it, it's a fair fight right now. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I have a colloquy if, if you want to do that while we are waiting for the other members. I, I heard you, um, but I, I don't have uh, the information on the colloquy if it's, if it's a colloquy with me. I could, I could wing it. <laughs> uh, let's wait till we have more members here to begin. Ms. Christensen, you have an amendment on the territories. I'd like to recognize you for that. It's uh, Christian 21-002 on payments to the territories. Are you ready with this amendment? Yes, I am ready. Thank I'd you. I'd like the clerk to report the amendment. Amendment 21, is that what? Yes. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mrs. Christensen of the Virgin Islands. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and the gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While this amendment is far from the parity or state-like treatment in Medicaid that we would have wanted and which we want to continue to work with this committee to achieve, we thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we thank the ranking member for providing a meaningful increase in Medicaid funding to begin to put us on the road to get to where we really want to be. This amendment does three things. One, it keeps the funding provided in the amendment in the nature of a substitute at the same level 
but it's distributed by a formula that has been agreed to by all five territories. Two, it allows us within the level of funding to adjust our match from a fixed 50-50 to um, somewhat closer to where, the way the state's uh, FMAP is, uh, is adjusted. Third, it provides for a report from the Secretary on a process for achieving parity in Medicaid for the territories. And fourth, it provides technical assistance to improve the administrative efficiency of the program in the territories. I hope that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will support this simple but very important amendment for the people of Puerto Rico, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and the Northern Marianas. Although much, we would wish that much more could be done to bring the full benefits of health care reform to your fellow Americans in those territories. This is a substantive first step, and I ask for the, everyone's support. Generally, to yield to me. Yes. Uh, I want to express my support for this amendment and wish we could do more than this amendment because people living in our territories are U.S. citizens, and we ought to be able to provide them the full health care rights we give to all Americans. Uh, I w want to continue working with you as we uh, try to uh, figure out how to accomplish that goal. This is a major uh, step forward, and I'm pleased that we're able to uh, take that step. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it is, it is a very, very um, big step forward, and we truly appreciate the work of you and your staff on this amendment. Would the gentlelady yield for a question? Yes, that, I'd be happy to yield. If I heard you correctly, you indicated in your statement in support of the amendment that it didn't have any increased funding. M minority staff seems to think that it does increase the funding. That in the total is, do you just redistribute redistribute funding, Absolutely. or do you actually have an increase? We just redistribute it in a way that all of us sat down and figured it out, and it totals the same amount that's in the um, substitute amendment. Wait, well, if the gentlelady would permit, I'm being told we have the wrong amendment before us, so there seems to be some confusion about it. We uh, made some revisions working with your staff, especially on the match area right. yesterday. And, and is this uh, ref is, is your amendment reflect uh, the uh, agreement with our staff? Yes. Okay. Let's, the, let's the amendment that I have here reflects the agreement with, with the staff. The only thing that was changed was in the match area, and that has to be worked out so that it still stays within the, the same amount that's in the amendment in the nature of a Let me ask our council or uh, Medicaid expert. This is a big increase. It says it right here. Is this, have you had a chance to review the, the amendment? Is this the amendment that was worked out? Do we have the wrong I think amendment? The amendment that was distributed might not be the, the correct amendment that the member intended because it does not reflect. Okay, the, let's the, put, the, if you, lady, gently withdraw the amendment temporarily, we'll get well, right back. Before the, before the yeah. reserving the right to object. Well, there's the, no, there's no. Uh, you well, the amendment that we have says additional increase for fiscal years 2011 through 2019, additional increase. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, I, I believe that that means that the increase does not start until that time because we, in ARRA, we were given uh, increases for, for two years, and so the amount, the total amount that's in the amendment in the nature of a substitute starts to be used after, uh, in, tw uh, in 2011. Okay, well, we just need to... Obviously, you can offer anything you wish, but if it's just a redistribution, we're fine with that. But if you're increasing above the baseline, that's something we'd like to know how much. We were very, very careful in make, uh, ensuring that it did not um, it. increase above the baseline. It does increase above the baseline. They will. Uh, we'll, uh, and I'll, I'll just pull it back temporarily, if you would, because yes, uh, yes, it shouldn't Chairman, be any confusion. I'm willing to pull it back temporarily yes. until we can clarify. Uh, Mr. Terry, you have an amendment? Mr. Chairman, I've uh, got an amendment at the desk. It's uh, FEHBP 003. Clerk um, will identify the amendment. Well, we didn't know what was going to be next. <laughs> 
I didn't know what was going to be next. So I, this, this is. Sorry, thank you all. It's one that we had a member here and he's ready to go. That's what. Is uh, do you have the amendment? Wait. Did Frank or somebody reserve Frank? Mr. Chairman, can I uh, reserve a point of order? The gentleman from New Jersey reserves a point of order. Does the uh, clerk have the amendment? Could could we hear the uh, FEHBP003? It's a uh, Blunt Terry Gingri. We're lo locating it. Hold on. Okay. Perhaps somebody from our staff can help identify it for them. Mr. Terry, what division is this to, your amendment? Uh, A, is A. that what we're on now? And it has been at the desk since uh, beginning 9.57 this morning, if that's helpful. You've got it now? It just tells me this is not okay, it. Okay, I'm just going to keep talking until we find it. Well, that, let's, let's wait. Mr. Chairman, we have this. The amendment has been located. Would yes, the clerk sir. report the amendment? Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3200 offered by yes. Mr. That Terry. Like it. Strike subtitle A and B of Title II of Division A and insert the following Subtitle A Congressional Health Care for All. Keep reading. Section 201. Congressional health care available to all, A, in general. Notwithstanding any other provisions of law beginning with year one, any individual who is a United States citizen in the United States and who is not enrolled in a group health plan and in health insurance coverage covered, <clears throat> offered in connection with a group health plan shall be entitled to enroll in a qualified health benefits plan having the same terms and cover conditions as a health benefit plan under Chapter 89 of Title V United States Code. At this time, I'll ask unanimous consent to waive reading. May I begin, Mr. Chairman? It seems that they're striking the whole thing to get coverage. Uh, what, without objection, the, the reading of the amendment will be dispensed with, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. As the clerk uh, read, this is to provide those without insurance or frankly anyone uh, that needs a certain level of insurance to opt into a system, to enroll into a system exactly what we have as members of Congress and all federal employees. It's the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan uh, that is determined by much of the public uh, and uh, many of our colleagues uh, in the House of Representatives as the gold standard for health care. Uh, it matches what many of us on both sides of the aisle wish and uh, think is best for the American public. It provides coverage at an affordable rate because this plan can have as many as 47 million or more people in a group to drive down the cost. They have choice between different plans like we have in the Federal Employees Health Benefit. Whereas the market entities compete against each other to get someone to enroll in their plan. So we've got competition, we've got affordability, uh, we've got choice. Those are all things that I want and I think most of the Republicans want for our constituents and for this country. It just so happens that this is private sector, uh, not a government-run plan. Let me read you from a, a recent floor statement. The f this is a quote from 
one of our committee members. The fact of the matter is that some in the Republican Party don't want these problems fixed, accessibility, because they already are doing just fine. They've got choice. They've got the federal plan. That's what I have. By the way, uh, the government have the government-run plan. Well, in the Democratic Party, we're saying something else. We want the American people to get at least as good as my friends in the Republican Party have. We want at least the benefits that we have here in Congress, choice, affordability, lower cost, and lower taxes for all Americans. Mr. Weiner, I couldn't agree with you more. That's exactly what we're doing here today, is doing what you have asked us and challenged us to do. I can only wish that you would be a co-sponsor of this with Mr. Gingrey and Mr. Blunt and I. This is the right thing to do for the people of America, is to invite them into the FEHBP, uh, or at least a similar type of system until uh, another committee could rule on that part. But that's not what this bill does. It allows the like to be uh, created so they can get in. With Affordability and choice. At this time, I'd like to yield to Mr. Blunt. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I'll lead, uh, yield to Mr. Gingrey here in just a second. You know, numerous times during the last campaign, the uh, Senator Obama said that the American people should have exactly the same kind of insurance he had. Uh, he didn't point out two or three important things. One was that uh, every single federal employee from the forest ranger, the prison guard, uh, the postal clerk had that same kind of insurance. He also didn't point out that it was a policy, it was a plan where you could make lots of choices. Some of them at the higher end of the choices cost federal employees quite a bit. Some of them at the uh, health savings account end don't cost very much. He also didn't point out that there was no government run option. If anybody knows that they don't want a government-run health insurance plan, it's a bunch of federal employees who clearly know that fed the federal government can barely run the government, let alone also run, uh, run health care. Uh, there are federal employees in every state. Uh, this would be part of our overall plan that we want more choice, more competition, even if you have insurance at work. Be fine with me if you also had insurance access to this plan. But certainly, if you don't, we'd like to have every American have this, as well as every American, regardless of pre-existing conditions, have access to health coverage. Uh, that would solve a big part of this problem. I yield to our other co-sponsor, uh, Mr. Gingrey. Yeah, I, th I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I'm sure all of my colleagues have had the experience of either on a tele town hall uh, meeting or a live town hall meeting. Certainly, my Democratic friends I know have experienced some uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, outrageous, uh, loud opinions in regard to this, but people will say to us, why can't we have the same thing you guys have? Now, they assume that we get it for free. Obviously, we don't. We pay for it. But the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan is a good plan. Uh, it is a gold standard. Uh, and it, 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 we ought to give this the opportunity to everybody in this country and also let the supplements apply, those who ha are low income, they should be, have the same opportunity we do. And, and of course, this amendment, uh, we get rid of the government-run plan uh, and we get rid of the exchange. Chairman, we don't need that. Gentlemen's uh, so time I has Chairman expired. I strongly recommend this amendment Chairman, to my colleagues on both sides. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Pallone, for what's he? Well, Mr. Chairman, I insist on my point of order. This is um, specifically mentions in the bill uh, health benefit plans under Chapter 89 of Title V which is under the jurisdiction of the Government Reform Committee. This is outside of our jurisdiction. We do not have jurisdiction. Gentlemen, I, uh, Chairman, speaking his on point the point of order, order, speaking on the point of order, I'm sure we have checked this with the parliamentarian. We've written it with the parliamentarian. Uh, we believe it does meet the standard of the committee, and we're going to insist on a vote. Yeah. If, if or at least uh, we're going to encourage yield. the chairman to allow us to have a vote. Maybe that's a more. Uh, uh, well, let me. Uh, let me say to my friend from Missouri and my colleagues, we just read the, our staff just read this amendment to the parliamentarian, and the parliamentarian said this is solely within the jurisdiction of the Oversight well, House Oversight Committee and not within our jurisdiction. Before the gentleman yields, will you yield? I mean, well, then we need to call the parliamentarian, Mr. Chairman, because we, Chairman. We, we drafted this in conjunction with the parliamentarian. Yes. It, 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 it was redrafted specifically so that it would be germane. Specifically, that would, now either 
Either there's a Democrat parliamentarian and there's a Republican parliamentarian or there's one House, Repu one House parliamentarian. This is germane. Now, if you and I want to suspend the committee and we go see the parliamentarian in person, let's do it right now. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask just a minute. Mr. Barton, I think we ought to get your parliamentarian on your side of the aisle, our parliamentarian on our side of the aisle to go see the House parliamentarian. That's good. Right. And I'd like uh, to ask the gentleman from Nebraska to temporarily withdraw his amendment so we can get the official de decision by the yeah, pol I'd, parliamentarian. I'd, I'd, I have no problems uh, withdrawing as long as I'm not prejudiced. You're not prejudiced in any way. A, a later uh, time, we we will important. have to get further information from the House parliamentarian on this matter. So the gentleman withdraws his amendment. Where do we go now? Let's go do that. You get over. You. Ms. Sutton, you have an amendment. I do, Mr. Chairman. It's Amendment uh, Sutton underscore O three nine. It's Sutton Sarbanes, actually. I mean, something's wrong, Henry. <laughs> Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Sutton of Ohio and Mr. Sarbanes of Maryland. At the end of subtitle G of Title I of Division Without objection, the amendment would be considered as read and the gentlelady from Ohio is recognized for five minutes. Reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Scalise reserves a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm uh, very pleased to, to uh, offer this amendment in conjunction with my distinguished colleague, colleague from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, this uh, amendment deals with pre-existing conditions, and as we know, the America's Affordable Health Choices Act will prohibit pre-existing condition exclusions in insurance markets, but this section will not take effect until 2013. And Americans with pre-existing conditions cannot wait until 2013, so this is intended to remedy that situation. Currently, an insurer can deny coverage for any identifiable pre-existing condition for up to 12 months. If an individual has had continuous coverage, defined as coverage with no lapses of 63 days or more, then this 12-month period can be reduced based on the number of months of creditable coverage. In determining whether an individual has a pre-existing condition, insurers are able to look back at an individual's medical history for six months. This amendment simply reduces the pre-existing medical condition limitation period from up to 12 months to up to three months. This amendment also reduces the look back period from six months to 30 days. For group health plans, these changes would apply to plan years beginning six months after enactment. For health insurance coverage in the individual market, these changes would apply six months after enactment. This amendment makes these changes to the Public Health Service Act, which falls under this committee's jurisdiction. My friend, the distinguished uh, Joe Courtney from Connecticut, offered a companion amendment uh, during the Education and Labor Committee markup regarding this issue, and his amendment made identical changes to private employer-provided health care under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. His amendment, Mr. Chairman, was approved by the Education and Labor Committee by a voice vote, obviously widespread support, and Mr. Chairman, it is my sincere hope that our amendment today can also pass by a voice vote, and at this point I'd like to yield to my distinguished colleague from Maryland uh, for his remarks. Um, thank you. I thank the gentlelady from Ohio. I want to commend her on this amendment. I'm very pleased to join in offering it. Uh, I would imagine that there isn't anyone in this room, certainly no one on the committee, um, as they move around their districts, who hasn't heard uh, stories, heart-wrenching stories told to them, uh, where somebody thought that they would be covered for a particular treatment, and then when they went uh, to try to access that treatment, 
they were confronted with this um, pre-existing condition exclusion from their coverage. Um, it's the most uh, debilitating game of gotcha you can imagine. And of course, it comes at a point in time when the last thing people need to be worried about is whether their coverage is going to be there. As was indicated, uh, this is designed to uh, further modify the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which put in place uh, provisions that would limit this kind of exclusion for pre existing conditions. Um, and it recognizes that the total elimination of this kind of exclusion is not going to occur under the base bill until the year 2013. Um, but there is such high expectation on the part of the public that this particular issue will be addressed that we, we thought it was critical to try to do something during the transition period. Um, and as, uh, as Congresswoman Sutton indicated, uh, the Education and Labor Committee already took action in a unanimous uh, fashion uh, to address this with respect to employer-sponsored plans. What we do is pick up the rest of the universe um, and now limit that look-back period to 30 days instead of six months and reduce the exclusion uh, period from 12 months to three months. Um, we think this is the right thing to do. Uh, for the, the many people out there that have borne the, the, uh, the burden of this exclusion coverage based on pre-existing uh, conditions. And we would hope that this is non-controversial and would be uh, supported by our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Um, with that, I yield back. The yeah, uh, gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. Mr. Barton. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to oppose the amendment I offered right before the break, a, um, a um, national pool that covered all pre-existing conditions uh, at the state level. And I believe every member of the majority uh, opposed that. Now we have a proposal where, if I understand it correctly, um, you can um, be diagnosed with some catastrophic condition uh, wait a month, they apply for insurance, and they have to cover you. This is, I don't say that I totally understand it, but to the extent I do understand it, this is a disincentive to have uh, health insurance until you know you need it, which would tend to be kind of counterproductive to the whole point of insurance in the first place. So, um, would the gentleman yield on that? I'd be happy to. Because I think the way it's structured, it, it wouldn't permit the kind of scenario you're talking about. The 63-day lapse of coverage provision still applies. In other words, if you've gone more than 60, 63 days or more um, without being covered, then you're not going to get the benefit of what they call this creditable coverage that you carry forward from a period in which you were covered. So it's really addressing the situation of people who had some coverage, for one reason or another lost it or needed to change their job, had a lapse period that was less than uh, 63 days, and then when they went to get their new insurance coverage, they were able to carry over creditable coverage uh, from before. What it means, though, is that if you had six months of coverage from before, um, under current law, if you carried that forward, um, you'd still have exposure because you only get credit of six months against the 12-month period. Now, because we're reducing that 12-month period uh, down uh, to three months, the carry forward would, means you, would mean you would experience no uh, period of exposure in terms of your coverage. So I don't think it's, it's this, does not, um, this does not create an opportunity for people that want to game the system. It really just tries to uh, enhance and strengthen the portability element that was part of the original HIPAA Act, and we're trying to address that during this interim period uh, leading up to the, uh, to the, the uh, implementation. Would gentleman yield? Plan. I, yield I, I have another question for Ms. Sarbanes. If, uh, you know, the, the uh, ranking members um, bill earlier, we want to cover everybody regardless of pre-existing conditions, established ri a risk pooling mechanism where 
insurance companies would have somewhere to collectively go with patients that truly had extraordinary cost rather than passing those costs on to all of their other uh, customers. I'm wondering, is there anything like that in this bill? Would you expect them to create that on their own? And I guess why, why weren't we able to get that done earlier since we both have the same goal here and I, I yield? Um, I appreciate that. Well, my reason for voting against the earlier uh, proposal was that um, I think recently in particular there's been too much emphasis on this notion that you can solve the, these insurance questions by creating these, these opt-out opportunities. Um, the strongest kind of insurance models are the ones uh, that have the most people in the same pool. Um, those who are well, those who are not so well, those who are young, those who are old, so that you completely distribute the risk across the pool. This, I, I think, I'll reclaim, much better. Re reclaiming much better my time, George. I thank the gentleman for that. I, I, I think I would tr tend to agree with that, except you're now talking about putting people who are already sick into the pool as opposed to some other way to ensure that you cover people with pre-existing conditions. That would be my problem. I'll yield back to the... I want to go to Dr. Burgess and then to Mr. Stearns. And, and thank the gentleman for yielding. Between these two proposals, that that was offered by the ranking member and this proposal, Mr. Chairman, it is just such a shame we did not start from this point four months ago. There is a broad consensus here, and we could have delivered a product that would have solved a problem for 8 million American people, which is the real problem, the real problem they're asking us to solve. They don't want us to turn over 17 percent of the nation's economy to some program that they don't trust, but they do want us to fix this problem. And as you can see from this discussion, there are good ideas on both sides of the dais as to how to get this done. I'll yield back to Mr. Barton. And to Mr. Stearns. Quickly. Mr. Chairman, quickly. Um, uh, Council, it appears to me that the effective date of this bill starts six months after enactment, but there is a clause on page 3, a special rule for collective bargaining agreements. And the question I have for you is, uh, does this, who are these uh, collective bargaining agreements that get a special exception? Uh, the bill starts for everybody else six months after enactment, but it looks like into this bill that three years after the date of enactment, who are these people that the collective bargaining agreements are set up for? So they get a waiver of three years. What entities are we talking about? Collective bargaining agreements? Are well, you asking what entities collective bargaining agreements yeah. usually are? In other words, why do we have a special exception for one group of gentlemen's time has expired without objection? Uh, gentlemen from Texas will be given an additional minutes so you can okay. pursue your. I'm just uh, so the council can answer the question. We don't need additional time. Just a, a, oh, okay. An answer from the question. Um, collective bargaining agreements are usually between unions and employers, I believe. So, so in this case, the unions get an exemption for three years, but it, all the insurance companies. It, this bill would apply six months after an act. It has to do with the fact that normally insurance contracts are written on a one-year basis. So when an insurance contract is working with an individual, um, they can do that change within a year, whereas the collective bargaining agreements are usually multi-year contracts. And so it's about not disturbing those contracts. And the last question I have for you is, so six months after enactment of this bill, all insurance companies in America must comply with this? Is that correct? In other words, the bill as written is 2013, but with this bill passing, this pre-existing condition will apply six months after enactment. Is that correct? That is the way the um, effective date is written, yes. Okay. Thank you. All time has expired. We will now uh, proceed to a vote on the uh, Sutton Sarbanes Amendment. All those in favor of the amendment will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. I believe it's Gingri 10 would be listed. Clerk, have the amendment? Um, it says it's Mr. Gingrey's, but it's. It should be Gingrey, or Matheson, Gingrey, Rogers, or Rogers. Okay. Yeah. Gingrey, Matheson, or one of the. Hmm? 10 underscore 002. 
Uh, At the top? Yes. Okay. You've got it, Mr. Chair. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Rogers. Add at the end of section two. Without two, objection, the amendment two. will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would hope that this would be an amendment that the uh, majority would accept. Uh, we've worked on it in a bipartisan way, and one of the disturbing trends in this particular bill is that uh, there's been lots of misleading comments that if you like the health plan that you have, you can keep it, unless you're one of the 11 million seniors on Medicare Advantage or the 8 million Americans that have health savings accounts, by the way, which is growing uh, by about 30 percent each year, uh, or the 114 million people under an ERISA plan that after five years will lose their plan and being shoved into a government plan. Other than those over 100 million people, yeah, you get well, to keep I, the plan I, okay. that you well, like. Go back this is, uh, I think, an important amendment to protect something that is, it provides innovation, it provides catastrophic coverage, so those horrible stories about losing your home and... Will the gentleman yield to yes, me? Yes, sir. I, I, uh, I think HSA uh, eligible high deductible health plans should be treated as a qualified uh, health benefits plan. But what I'm concerned about is that we still have all the protections from uh, discrimination by anybody who offers such a plan. Would you be willing to work with us to allow people the choice of an HSA, but not a plan that, ex that exempts them from these issues of, uh, of uh, consumer protections? Well, I, if you're saying it has to mirror the government plan, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to disagree. I'm not saying I mean, it has, the, to, mirror, the, it has the whole, to mirror a plan. My, my only fear here, Mr. Chairman, if I may reclaim my time, is that the, the more difficult we make these things to be successful, the less opportunity people will have to participate in them. And one of the reasons these are so successful and growing so quickly is we've made it very easy for people to get involved in this program and employers to get involved in this program. Some 30 percent of everybody that's on an HSA never had health insurance through their employer before. So it tells me it's the one thing that's working, the one innovation that's working to get people connected to health care. Mr. Chairman, my only argument would be I wouldn't do anything to stop the progress. And by the way, by the time the exchange, if your bills passes, this new government-run exchange, 20 million Americans will be on HSAs. Why we would want to screw that up is beyond me. So I would respectfully uh, decline your offer and, and hope that we could take the amendment and protect the people who have opted to get connected to health insurance through an HSA. And, and if I may Gentlemen, yield up, further to me? I'd yield to the chairman. Your amendment would excuse HSA-eligible high-deductible plans from other requirements that apply to all other qualified health benefit plans. For example, there are HSA-eligible health plans that don't cover key benefits, such as maternity care or prescription drugs. Just like other health insurance policies, these high-deductible plans will eventually, after the grandfather period, have to cover all the minimum benefits. As drafted, the amendment would also excuse HSA eligible plans from other requirements. For example, the high deductible health plan would deny coverage for pre-existing conditions, allow insurers to charge cancer patients more for insurance, and rely on inadequate provider networks, fail to have prompt pay requirements, and more. And reclaiming my time, if I may, and, and I'm, I would hope you'd give a little extra time to our folks as you've been arguing, I think, on our time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Here's the point. If you really believe, as you, all of you have said, that you want choice, which this bill, by the way, does not provide, then let them have the choice. Let the people who have chosen health savings accounts keep them if they like them. You may find those, and I disagree with your assumption that those things are going to happen. I completely disagree with it. But even, let's just for the sake of argument, say it was. If they wanted to make this choice, they will. And if, if that is true, Believe me, it won't be a viable option in your new federally government mandated run uh, uh, exchange. So let's all this says is if you're an employer, you should have the right to be able to provide this. If you're an insurance or insurance provider, you should have the right to be able to sell this. And oh, by the way, if you're an individual American that believes in choice, you should have the right to be able to buy one. It's really all it does. And I would yield some time to Mr. Gingrey. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I ask unanimous consent for an additional minute? 
Without objection, that will be uh, the order. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, you know, again, going back to what the President said, if you like what you have, you can keep it uh, until you can't. Uh, and when you can't is 2013. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I think you pretty much made our case uh, when you said that uh, uh, maybe that uh, health savings uh, uh, accounts with high deductible, low premium uh, insurance policies that young people, uh, many of whom are in that 47 million today uh, that don't have health insurance, these are the kinds of plans they would choose. Uh, and certainly our, our great fear on this side, and I think uh, most people would agree, uh, that after 2013 the Secretary and her infinite wisdom, or whomever the Secretary is of HHS, could determine that uh, any employer plan, uh, not just uh, the, the high deductible, low premium uh, affiliated with a, with, combined with an HSA, but any plan did not meet the requirements, was not credible, and all of a sudden would be disallowed. And that's where those 110 million that are now insured by employers would morph into uh, the government, the public option, so-called public option. Uh, clearly, we don't want to deny 8 million people uh, the opportunity to have these plans. We would just be contributing more to the, to the uh, percentage and numbers of the uninsured. Uh, so this, this is a, a straightforward amendment. I would hope that members on both sides of the aisle would support it, uh, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. The chair recognizes himself. I made a simple request of the gentleman from Michigan. I wanted to support his idea of HSAs, but I want it to be treated like all other insurance plans that are competing. And I don't think it ought to have a, a separate special treatment. Uh, I don't want HSAs saying that they don't have to cover benefits like maternity care or prescription drugs. I don't want HSAs to say that, that uh, they uh, can deny coverage for people with pre-existing medical conditions or allow insurers to charge cancer patients more for this insurance. This is a form of insurance, but it should not be treated as a form of insurance that it's so special that they can do all the things that we're trying to stop insurance companies from doing. Now, I offered to take your amendment if you'd work with me, and you denied the willingness to even work with me. Well, I can't support well, your amendment well, as well, President Ford. Uh, well, there's Chairman. a difference between working with us and completely changing the focus of the amendment. That, that Would it change the focus of this amendment, the gentleman's absolutely. opinion? Absolutely. If, if you're if taking you, away if, someone's let, wait, 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 let me, plan before that they you, want. It's my time. I'm asking you a question. Would it change the focus of your amendment to allow HSA plans and not allow them when they compete to be able to discriminate when we're not allowing any other insurance plan to discriminate? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, if, if you're a yield, that's not what you're doing. I think what you say is right, but your intent in the language is wrong because actually these the premiums, what you've done it by about 70 percent cost, just by the I cost of I haven't given these, you language. I've asked you to work with me to make sure we accomplish these goals. Would the chairman yield? Yeah, I'll yield to the gentleman from Texas. I think we, we might have a non-intersecting conversation here. I think both of you are right. I think Mr. Rogers is right. The intent of a health savings account is to put cash money each month into an account, in most cases it builds up tax-free. Most health savings accounts have a, have a requirement that you have a catastrophic policy. But within the discretionary part, you can spend that money on anything. Many of the things that you're talking about would be covered by cash that's in the discretionary part of the account. Well, let, let, me, uh, hand, let me reclaim my time just to say, that, let's look at the amendment. It says, in the case of a health benefits plan offered in conjunction with a health savings account. So, in effect, the health benefit plan under the legislation in conjunction with the health savings account would not have to meet these requirements. Well, I, I may be missing something, but, but I would think but Mr. That Chairman, it's the choice of the end. If you believe in choice, then we should allow this to go forward. I don't it's believe in simple. the choice of insurance companies to exclude people. It's an individual choice to be, uh, to be allowed to be a part of the, ex the government exchange. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't the catastrophic part of the, so that's why I think you're both right. The catastrophic part 
of the HSA would have to meet the requirements that Chairman Waxman is talking about. But the, the cash discretionary part of the account that Mr. Rogers is focusing on, that money would be available for whatever the uh, patient and the, and the health care provider wanted it to be, is the way I would interpret it. So you both get what you want. Well, I'm just trying to make sure that high deductible plans have the same requirements as any other insurance plan. I'm not trying to dictate how the cash be, it will be used or whether it's a high deductible plan. We know that. But they ought not to be able to discriminate. They ought not to be able to, uh, to uh, ignore all of the things that we have in the consumer protections. Uh, no cost sharing, uh, no dropping of coverage for seriously ill, no gender discrimination, no annual or lifetime caps on coverage, uh, guaranteed insurance renewal. renewal. Gentleman from Michigan would not like to allow that. You reject those kinds of, of provisions? Uh, again, that's a it's it's a Trojan horse, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I, I I oppose the gentleman's amendment, and recommend that other members do so, and we'll try to work out something on high saving uh, uh, HSAs, health savings accounts that uh, would require them to be the same as others, and not allow this kind of discrimination. Are we ready for the question? All those in favor of the Rogers Amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's have it. The amendment's not agreed to. We have a roll call vote, Mr. Chairman. We'll, Please. We'll go to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Gett. Ms. Gett, no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Yes. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Ms. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. 
Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Hill. So Hill votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Mr. Gordon? No. Mr. Gordon votes no. Any member wish to change his or her vote? Clerk will tally the vote. Mr. Ross? No. Mr. Ross votes no. Ready to announce the vote? On that vote, Mr. Chairman. Okay. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 26 ayes and 33 noes. 26 ayes, 33 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, you have an amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Chairman, while we're getting that, are, is the bill open to amendment at any point now? Uh, it, not yet, but will be soon. <laughs> okay. You don't have a whole lot of time left. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Space of Ohio. At the end of subtitle H, of Title Seven of Division B add the following, Section 1783, prohibitions on federal. Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, for unanimous Medicaid consent to uh, dispense with the reading. I thought we had already, without objection, <laughs> the, uh, the amendment will be considered as read and the gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Mr. Chairman, reserve a point of order. Mr. Scalise reserves a point of order. Mr. Space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment is very simple. Uh, it ensures that this legislation does nothing to grant people in this country illegally new access to Medicaid services. It reaffirms and provides assurances both to members of Congress and to the American public uh, that, uh, and removes all doubt, frankly, that this bill somehow or another 
would afford benefits uh, to those who are here illegally or un in an undocumented fashion. I ask and urge uh, my uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, to adopt this straightforward amendment to the legisla leg legislation and uh, would yield uh, some of my time to my colleague from California, Congressman McNerney. You don't need to drop. I would like to commend my colleague from Ohio for his work on this amendment, which adds a common sense clarification to the bill to prevent Medicaid and CHIP payments from being made on behalf of illegal immigrants. Federal law prohibits illegal immigrants from enrolling in Medicaid and CHIP. This amendment simply ensures that those prohibitions are maintained. The amendment is a measure to maintain the integrity of our laws, and I would ask all our colleagues to support it. With this, I would yield to my colleague from Indiana, uh, Mr. Hill, who's not here right now. So I'll turn it back over to my colleague from Ohio. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd yield back. Uh, the gentleman uh, from Ohio yield to me. By all means. Uh, and, I, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. It says on line four of your amendment, nothing in this title shall change current prohibitions against federal Medicaid and CHIP payments under title. What, what verification system do you have to make sure that these individuals are lawfully present in the United States? This bill, uh, this amendment does not provide a, any new verification system. It, it simply applies the existing verification systems. What is that existing verification system, if the gentleman would? I, I, I would uh, refer your question to counsel. Uh, uh, Sir, the, the if he refers uh, the the question to me, counsel, I, I do ask you that question. What is the existing verification? The existing verification under this HR 3200. Under current law, not under the bill before you, under current law, already in place in the Medicaid program is a citizenship documentation requirement. Yes, and that was recently extended to CHIP in the legislation that passed earlier this year. Well, I thank counsel for that. Now, in regard to the, the language in this bill, what would be the verification? There, there's no new verification system in this bill, sir, in this bill. There, there is no verification. There is no new verification system. There's an existing law citizenship documentation requirement, both in Medicaid and in CHIP. Yeah, there is an existing law of verification system. It's called citizenship documentation. If the the, you know, can, uh, another question for counsel. Does this require a photo identification verification system the, under current law? The amendment before you does not. The bill does not, but current law does. Current, current law, the citizenship documentation requirement requires documentation of citizenship and identity. And the identity requirements include, um, in, include among other things, um, presentation of photographic evidence. So uh, that's, that's just current law. This, this, neither this amendment nor the bill makes any change in the current law citizenship documentation requirements. You have to approve citizenship. You have to establish identity. Well, I asked my colleague again from Ohio then, does, uh, does his amendment uh, include current law verification uh, for uh, legal uh, presence in the United States by virtue of, of identi identification system, photo? It, this and uh, I thank the gentleman from Georgia. This legislation reaffirms existing law and specifically, specifically directs that nothing in this section or legislation changes existing law when it comes to determining eligibility for Medicaid and CHIP provisions. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. If this doesn't change existing law, then why are you offering the amendment? Because there seems to be some uh, misunderstanding or concern that the legislation at hand will provide some kind of benefit to uh, undocumented aliens. Uh, this legislation is being offered to prov provide assurance those members of Congress who question that, as well as to the general public, that it is not, in fact, intended to benefit uh, those who are undocumented aliens. I think generating the sufficient uh, confidence in the American public in this legislation is a very important step in the process, and I think this is one of those steps that we as a Congress should be making. The gentleman, the time deal. has expired. Who wishes to be Mr. Chairman. Mr. Deal, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask counsel. 
isn't it true that the underlying bill has a provision that says that in certain conditions, namely in Medicaid, that individuals and family units will be automatically enrolled in the Medicaid program and that a state may not put any other interference in front of that automatic enrollment? The only, the only provision that immediately comes to mind, I have to go back and look at it, is the um, requirement for an automatic enrollment of newborns who do not have any other sorts of acceptable coverage. What about uh, those individuals who are up to the 150 percent of poverty who will be automatically enrolled now in Medicaid? The, the, or 133 percent, I guess The bill, the bill requires, co would require coverage starting in 2013 of individuals under 133 percent of the federal poverty level. Will be automatically and enrolled? If they, if they meet the, el the current eligibility requirements. And that automatic enrollment. That would include the citizenship, citizenship documentation requirements. There is no reference in that automatic enrollment to verification of citizenship, is there? The, the bill requ requires states to cover people under 133 percent of poverty in their Medicaid programs and leaves the existing Medicaid enrollment procedures and methods and standards, it leaves them in place. One of those procedures is citizenship documentation. That would apply to all people being enrolled under Medicaid under these eligibility levels. Uh, does Council recall when we reauthorized the SCHIP program as to what was done to the language that required verification under the Deficit Reduction Act? Did it not, in fact, in the SCHIP reauthorization, uh, make this an option that states could elect not to verify? States don't have an option with respect to whether they, they meet the citizenship documentation requirements. They have an option as to how they do it. Right. And, and that is they a have big... have to meet the requirements. Pe well, people who allege their would the gentleman you... Is, count, is council aware? Is council aware of the situation that existed in this area prior to the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, in which 46 states and the District of Columbia under the existing law that Mr. Space is referring to, which says you shall not allow illegals to enroll in these programs, 46 states in the District of Columbia use self-verification of just signing an affidavit. Is Mr. council aware of that Mr. fact? Mr. Deal, uh, that's not an appropriate question to ask of council. Council can tell us what the law is, what the bill right. says, that, but I, not what the Mr. facts Chairman. were. Mr. Chairman, question to council. Well. I will not ask counsel that question. I will tell this body that that's exactly the reason the 2005 provision was put in. Now, if you really wanted verification, you would have voted for the amendment that lost by one vote yesterday. I recognize that this is political cover, but I want to tell you, it is as thin as a gossamer sheet. It will provide you no cover on this issue, and the reason being is that verification is the key uh, to making this provision workable. And you have rejected the, uh, the provision that was offered yesterday that would have provided very clear language about the verification requirements that should exist here. The gentleman I would yield, yield to, um, I would yield to my colleague, Mill uh, And I thank my colleague. Uh, this is the debate we had last night. This is uh, a CYA amendment because my colleague is correct. The laws were changed to allow states to make a determination without federal identification proof. We all know there are states that allow illegal immigrants to get driver's license, and they can then use those through the state Medicaid system to enroll and to sign an affidavit that they are citizens. So don't try to cover up for the failure of your vote last night this bill will allow illegal immigrants access to state to federal funded taxpayers dollars and that's if that's what you want that's fine but don't hide it just be out front and i yield back to my colleague i yield to the gentlelady from tennessee 
I thank the gentleman from Georgia, and I thank him for his uh, good work on this issue, and I do oppose this amendment. I've talked a lot about the TenCare experience in Tennessee. What we saw with this is with the state verification, they could use a driver's license, which had been inappropriately obtained. They could use a utility bill. They could use a rental receipt. They could use all sorts of mechanisms to enroll in the TenCare, the public option plan, taxpayer funded, and we held a field hearing in Tennessee on enrollment with illegal immigrants and 10 percent of the growth of TenCare every year was attributed not by us but by TenCare itself to illegal immigrations, uh, immigrants coming on to that program. I yield back to the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself. I find this a, a, a a, 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 an argument on the other side that is as thin as a gossamer's wing because we're talking about very different things. What Mr. Space is arguing is that we ought not to allow uh, people who are undocumented to be able to access the federal Medicaid and, S and the CHIP programs. Now, Mr. Deal would make the argument that in order to enforce that, you ought to have everybody come in with a birth certificate or some proof of their citizenship. The reason that uh, uh, amendment was rejected is because it hurt more Americans than anybody who tried to uh, skirt the requirement that they be a, uh, a, a, a citizen. Uh, undocumented aliens were not the ones who were being disadvantaged. American citizens were being disadvantaged. Now, this uh, amendment would say that um, uh, new eligibles will be subject to the same citizenship documentation requirements that apply to existing beneficiaries. They'll have to document their citizenship through a passport or birth certificate. They'll have to document their identities through a valid driver's license with a photo ID. That's in order to ensure that undocumented aliens are not eligible. The Space Amendment makes clear that the current prohibitions against federal Medicaid payments for services to doc undocumented immigrants will remain in place and that this title does nothing to change these prohibitions. So I don't understand this argument, except it's argument for argument's sake. And I, I almost think we ought to have a recorded vote and see if the Republicans want to vote against this amendment. I can't believe that they would any more than they'd want to vote against the Medicare. Uh, which they chose not to do when it was offered by Mr. Weiner. And speaking of Mr. Weiner, he asked me to yield to him, and I will do so at this but just, time. Just, just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that my colleagues on the other side, and to some degree inherent in the Space Amendment, look, there's a big conversation going on that we have to continue in this Congress about how we deal with 11 million undocumented people in this country. But we tried Real ID, and it was a failure. Fifty states have rejected it. E-Verify, we can't seem to figure out a way to get it up and running. This is not just in health care. Uh, my colleagues are correct. There are problems in figuring out both for employers, for government, for everyone trying to figure out how the undocumented, how we figure out a way to bring them out of the shadows, enforce the law, how to get terrorists uh, prevented and things like that. But I just want to remind all of us a little. I know there is almost an and an and, and irresistible urge to demagogue when it comes to immigration matters. Just remind everyone that when you're talking about young children who are sick, who are trying to find care, like the, the likes of which that might be in, in your examples here, you know, those children who are sick have committed no crime. They're too young. They're just children. And to some degree, we need to have a health care system that figures out how we make people well, how we don't bankrupt, how we have a system that makes sense. We don't have that now. And so what you have is young children being kept home because parents are fearful of bringing them to a doctor or they don't have a doctor at all, going into hospital emergency rooms and getting care that's not being paid for by the bill ferry. It's getting paid for by all of us. So I know there is this desire to, to beat the rostrum about immigration and this urge to use this ugly language about people being illegal. These undocumented children are what we're talking about here, and I hope we could keep that in mind. But make no mistake, I agree with many of my colleagues, and we're trying to figure this out, how it is that we solve these immigration problems and how it is that we solve the idea, how you identify someone. If I can reclaim my time, notwithstanding your very powerful argument, the amendment before us would prohibit for federal Medicaid and CHIP 
payment for undocumented aliens. You can give an argument that, they, that you think they ought to be covered or not, but the Space Amendment says they will not be entitled Chairman. To, to, those, uh, uh, to that coverage. Who Mr. Chairman, I, I would ask time to uh, ask a question to counsel, if I may. Uh, Mr. Radonovich, I will yield to you. Thank you. Um, time. For a question to counsel, in the law, where does it require a, the Health Care uh, Choices Commissioner to require, where are they required in the law to apply uh, citizenship, the citizenship verification under 1903X of the uh, Social Security Act? Sir, in my, in my responses before, I was referring just to the current Medicaid law and just to the current CHIP law. It's not speaking to the Health Choices Administration. Reclaiming my time, I yield it back and uh, ask for the question. All those in favor of the space amendment say aye. Aye. Oppose no. <laughs> the ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. Mr. Chairman, Barton. Mr. Chairman, I want to um, ask unanimous consent to amend the, um, the Gingrey Terry Blunt Amendment uh, that we withdrew because of the um, question about germaneness. I want to bring that back up and then I want to ask unanimous consent to strike line 13 on page 1 through line 2 um, on page 2. Uh, Mr. Barton, you seek to re to uh, bring back uh, for consideration the uh, amendment offered by Mr. Gingry of Georgia uh, that we put aside while inquiring of the parliamentarian whether the amendment was germane to this committee. Right. Uh, when, when your staff and my staff went to the parliamentarian, um, they were told that the uh, the part that we had we on the minority side had shown the parliamentarian was germane, but there was another section right below it that apparently we didn't read to the parliamentarian, and that was not germane. So, and that was the part that we read to the parliamentarian, <laughs> upon which we received the opinion but that it was a, a the burden of proof is on us, Mr. Chairman, and it is the minority that messed this up. You were right to rule that it was non-germane. Uh, I'll accept the fact that you're pointing out that I was right, and I appreciate it. <laughs> I can't argue with you. But if, if we we'll When agree. you are right about my being right, you're right. <laughs> if you'll agree, if, or if every member will agree to the unanimous consent request that we strike that portion that I have uh, uh, identified, then we are told, and I hope you are told, that the remainder is germane. Well, uh, the gentleman's correct. That, however, doesn't make it uh, without controversy. But well, let's At least bring, it makes it germane. But let's bring it before us. Without objection, the amendment uh, offered by Mr. Greengree, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Terry on a congressional health care for all will be uh, put before the committee again. And by unanimous consent, uh, everything after on line 10. Right, right here, line 13. Oh, everything on, uh, from line 13. Through. Through line two. Through line two on page two will, will be stricken. And Mr. Pallone reserves a point of order in case we can find another germane response. Reserve the point of order. But I don't believe there is one, Mr. Pallone. Okay. And then I would I would yield to the authors. Okay, we, we the the, yeah, the uh, amendment is now under consideration, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen's recognition. We've already spoken minutes. on our five minutes. I, I'm, Mr. Terry, you wish to control the five minutes in support of this amendment? We're saying we, the proponents have, have spoken. It's, 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 we would certainly let the opponents have five minutes, then have a vote on the amendment. Okay. Uh, I, I will recognize myself then in opposition to the amendment. The amendment seeks to uh, require that all uh, citizens may uh, go into a plan for insurance that would be uh, under the same terms and conditions as a health benefit under Chapter 89 of Title V. And it's, so it's like the FEHPB, but in the process, it does work. It strikes the public plan, it strikes the public plan completely. And in, 
in fact, would substitute something else. And will, will they've argued that it would substitute something like the Federal Employees Benefit Plan, but not the, that plan. Well, I think that that's not what we intended in the underlying legislation. We intend a, a market competition with a public plan. And I would have to oppose this amendment because it strikes the public plan and, and, uh, and does not give that as an option to any uh, American uh, who might choose it. I'd be happy to Mr. yield Chairman, for, for, for the debate. Uh, who want, Mr. Sarbanes, and then we'll come back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. I would echo what you just said. Um, the biggest problem with this is that it does strike the ex not just the public plan, it strikes the whole exchange. The, the purpose of the exchange is to begin to bring innovation and choice uh, into insurance markets all across the country that right now are captive of a handful of insurers with predictable, predictable consequences for cost and innovation, which means often high cost and little innovation. And so I can't understand why uh, the other side would want to remove an opportunity to generate more options and more choice to explore to test the proposition, really, that if you add more actors into the mix, more um, choices into the mix, that you might get to a better health care system. So my, my uh, primary uh, uh, concern about the, the amendment as proposed is, is the fact that it would completely wipe away what is a prime mechanism in this bill to get to the kind of choice and options and competitiveness an exploration of reducing costs that has to be central to this reform effort. And so for that reason, I would urge us to reject the proposed amendment. I yield back my time. Uh, Mr. Pallone. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just to go back to what I basically was saying before, I mean, we have set up a, a, a really great uh, a proposal here under this underlying bill. Uh, and I think Mr. Sarbanes and you described this to, to some extent, whereby uh, people now who don't, who are in an indiv individual market or small group market or have no insurance, can enroll in, a, in a, an exchange that offers them a, uh, a benefit package, consumer protections, and all kinds of ways of reducing costs because it is a large, sort of like a group plan because it has the competition between the public and private insurance because it has subsidies. You know, just assuming that somehow letting people enroll in something like the Federal Employees Plan is somehow going to be better, I think is a false assumption. Well, let it's me throw back my to time. the past. This is not a Federal Employees Health Plan. It's something like something like that or something like something that's like that. It's very vague. Yeah. And we shouldn't uh, would the chairman yield on that point? Yes. The reason it's like that is, is for germane purposes. We had, I mean, honestly, we couldn't say the FEHB -E plan because that would have not been germane. So well, I the reason, understand it, why the you reason did it. it's vague is because that's what we had to do to make it germane. So it's this. germane, and now that it's germane, you say congressional health care for all, but we don't have congressional health care. We're federal employees. And you make it sound like it's for uh, the same thing as we're getting, but it's, it's no certainty of that, of that at all. And you strike in this amendment an option for a public plan. So we are objecting to it. And Mr. Uh, Chairman. we'd like to proceed to a vote. Mr. We have Chairman. a lot of amendments. Mr. Barton said he's willing to vote. Mr. Now, we're Chairman, we're willing. let's vote. Let's, let's go vote. to the vote. All let's those vote. in favor of the um, amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 And that would last for a roll call okay, vote. Okay, let's go to a roll call vote. Can I borrow this? Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. No. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. 
Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett passes. Mrs. Capps. Ms. Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. No. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner passes. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Aye. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill passes. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. No. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Mr. Space passes. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Aye. Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bonomac. Aye. Ms. Bonomac, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Boucher. No. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Deget. No. Ms. Deget votes no. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Gordon. 
No. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey, no. Ms. Eshoo? Mr. Chairman, Ms. Eshoo is recorded as voting aye. Ms. Eshoo, off, aye, on, no. Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes aye. Mr. Space is off pass and on aye. Ms. Harmon. Mr. Weiner, how are you record? How is Mr. Weiner recorded? Mr. Uh, Weiner is recorded as voting pass. Mr. Weiner votes no. Ms. Harmon has. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon is not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Ms. 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 Harmon. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Mr. Hill? No. Okay. Mr. Hill votes off, pass, on, no. Have all members uh, been recorded who seek to be recorded? Okay, the clerk will give us the tally. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 28 ayes and 31 noes. And the amendment is defeated. Uh. Uh, let me announce that uh, from here on in, um, the amendment, any amendments uh, to divisions A, B, or C uh, would be in order. We're no longer. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think, I believe Mr. Rush has an amendment first. Yeah, that it requires. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have three colloquies that I would like to offer for the record in the interest of time. Uh, these are four amendments, 8001, 4002, and 7001. And I ask for unanimous consent to accept uh, these into the record before offering my amendment. The clerk uh, will report the amendments. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Rush is asking uh, unanimous consent to put the colloquies in the record. Yes. Without objection. So ordered. Mr. Chairman, reserve a point of order. My. Yeah. Okay, the point of order has been reserved. Uh, my understanding, and, and let me, uh, if uh, I misunderstand, uh, you can correct me. You have some colloquies that you're uh, asking to put in the record, and then we're going to go to your amendments. That's correct. Okay, there's no, is there an objection to the colloquy, I asked unanimous consent to have the colloquies be put in the record. Is there an objection to that? Yes. Chairman, the colloquies are already part of the record because the woman's keeping track of whatever you speak about. So what does it have to be part of the record? Uh, he doesn't want to have to read the colloquy. He's just asking that the colloquies oh, okay. be put in the record. And I would ask that we do that without objection. Is it possible we could see the colloquy? Yeah, we can share it to, with you, certainly. 
All right, why don't we do this? While we're sharing those, um, why don't we move to your um, to your Mr. amendment? I, I have an amendment at the desk 002. Okay. okay the, uh, the clerk will report the Rush Amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Rush of Illinois. Yes, unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my amendment makes it a violation of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act for brand name and generic drug firms to enter agreements selling patent infringement claims except in certain prescribed instances. This existing regulatory framework established by Hatch Waxman created powerful incentives for, making, for makers of generic drugs to challenge brand name companies' patents prior to their expiration. Because these new generics threaten the patent protected profits of brand name companies, brand name firms have responded by offering, and I quote, pay for delay settlements to generic firms. In doing so, it is their intention to safeguard their enormous profits and extend the time it takes for new gen generic versions to enter in the market, which would dramatically drive down the cost of these drugs. My amendment will curb these eyebrow-raising settlements, which makes allies of industry sector members who in all other respects behave and should behave as arch competitors. Earlier entry by generics will save consumers billions of dollars. This will result in significant cost reduction and contain those costs in association with the health care reform package that we are now considering. The CBO has scored this amendment as savings for the federal government while protecting settlement agreements for patent infringement claims, except where the consideration received by the generic entry relates to marketing of new generic drug prior to the expiration of the patent. This amendment protects against unfair and deceptive acts or practices and an unfair method of competition under Section 5 of the FTC Act. Mr. Chairman, as requested by the minority at the su subcommittee markup, this amendment will require the disclosure of these settlement agreements to the Comptroller, uh, Comptroller General for purposes of completing a GAO study. My subcommittee uh, held a hearing on the bill and passed it out of subcommittee on June 3rd of this year. Mr. Chair, I want to thank you and I ask for the, that the committee uh, do vote in favor of this amendment and now I yield uh, to the uh, vice chair of the subcommittee, Ms. Shikowsky. Mr. Thank you. Uh Thank you for, uh, for, for yielding, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the Federal Trade Commission and state's attorneys general and consumers have raised many concerns about um, a, a, pro a, a process called pay to delay, which actually allows brand name drug companies effectively to pay generic drug companies to delay bringing generics to, to, to market. Okay. Now, the uh, CBO scored it, but also the Federal Trade Commission uh, economists think that this amendment will save about $35 billion over 10 years, reducing costs to individuals and, and families. Um, so here's an example of how we can help consumers save money and also um, pass something that is uh, supported by many, many organizations and, and is in a much more efficient way to do business in the uh, pharmaceutical market. Um, and, and so I, I would say that this is really a win-win a situation to um, 
change this unfair rule that prevents consumers from getting access to generic drugs. It's a good deal, I guess, the way it is for the pharmaceutical companies, both the generics and the brand name uh, companies, but while they collude right. with each other in a way, uh, consumers are really yeah, on the really get the raw end of the deal. So we can uh, we can save uh, lots of money for for consumers and do the right thing. And I would urge my colleagues to vote for it. Gentlemen uh, from Illinois, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just want to uh, further say that this does end uh, this uh, practice that have been uh, so significant in terms of the rising cost of medical care. Uh, to uh, all Americans, and with uh, the passage of this amendment, we will bring to a screeching halt uh, this uh, onerous uh, and unhealthy and unwholesome reliance and relationship between generics and brand uh, brand name uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, anyone like Mr. to be recognized on the uh, minority side? Mr. Chairman. Yes, the gentleman yeah. from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while I recognize it's, um, and I support the goals of trying to help promote competition at lower drug prices, I can't support the approach of this amendment. It's unprecedented for Congress to intervene and limit lit litigation rights, particularly when the federal regulators have the ability to challenge the settlements in court. Also, I don't believe that the amendment will guarantee lower drug prices for consumers and could actually result in fewer patent challenges and less competition in the drug industry. There is no guarantee that the amendment will provide consumers with lower drug prices. In some cases, early settlements have benefited consumers greatly, such as the case where Bar Labs brought a generic version of Prozac to the market approximately two and a half years earlier than it would have because it was settled early and involved a cash payment. Consumers say between $1.5 and $2 billion, according to Bar. If such settlement opinions were removed, the, in the incentive for the generic companies may be reduced greatly when they are not overly confident of the strength of their patent challenge claim. Reducing available options will increase the risk to generic drug company of challenging a patent and failing. Such an outcome will influence their decision to um, challenge additional drug patents and reduce the number of generics coming to the market. This outcome will not benefit consumers. The FTC has challenged a number of these settlements, but has failed in a majority of cases to convince courts of their position. And as I stated in the subcommittee markup, it is not for Congress to decide the terms of litigation settlements when courts review the settlements and they don't see a problem. For these reasons, Mr. Chairman, I respectfully oppose the amendment and urge my colleagues to vote no. Uh, and Ms. I yield Would back. Would you yield to me? Yes, Mr. I'll Don. yield to you. In terms of uh, savings to consumers, uh, the FTC's Bureau of Economics, using conservative assumptions, has estimated that the cost to consumers of these uh, pay for delay deals. Uh, the cost from the lost savings is anywhere from 35 to 70 billion dollars over 10 years, at least 3.5 billion dollars annually. And there is bipartisan support uh, uh, at the Federal Trade Commission. All the commissioners since 2000 have thought that this is uh, shabby, shoddy, anti-competitive behavior, and that we should change it. Uh, so I uh, salute Mr. Rush and all the co-sponsors for offering this amendment and salute the FTC for trying yeah. uh, to ban this practice. And I really think we should adopt this amendment and uh, appreciate your yielding to me. Gentleman uh, from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yields back. Okay. All well, time has expired, so we'll um, call the question. Let's draw a point of order. Point of order? Who? Oh, withdrew the point of order. Thank you. Okay. All those in uh, favor of the amendment by the gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Rush, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. 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 Gentlemen, the ayes have it, and the amendment uh, is carried. Uh, let me uh, say that Mr. Stern has reviewed uh, Mr. Rush's colloquies, so at this time I would again ask unanimous consent that the uh, colloquies uh, uh, for Mr. Rush uh, be uh, included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Next, um, Mr. Stearns has an amendment. Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's Amendment One or A I N S dot E C. Clerk will report the amendment. Stearns, number twenty.
Yeah. 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 It's the uh, government plan bailout amendment ECR 22-001. Does that help you? Okay, thanks. Mr. Chairman, we should probably give a uh, great uh, laudatory uh, support to the staff who's tracking all the amendments. Well, the amendments being distributed. Yeah, they seem to do a well. The job. clerk uh, report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a subsidy to HR 3200 offered by Mr. Stearns. Add at the end of section 2.2b. Yes, consent that the amendment uh, be considered as read. I, I would point out um, that uh, we're willing to uh, accept this amendment. So Good. I don't know if okay. you want to continue. I'll just, about, or I'll just speak about a minute on it. Okay. Gentleman's uh, recognized. Let me just read it. No bailouts and no case shell. The public health insurance option receive any federal funds for purpose of insolvency in any manner similar to the manner in which entities receive federal funding under the Troubled Asset Relief Program of the Secretary of Treasury. You know, this year Medicare will report an $89 trillion unfunded liability and become insolvent in just eight years, in 2017. And if you go through all these federal programs, you can see that they are in financial extremis. So my point is, why put the new public policy in the same type of thing? And so we should start the game with my amendment, which says that public money will not be used to uh, bail out this health care plan. And so I appreciate the majority accepting my amendment. And uh, I think it's good for both parties to make this statement early on. And uh, with that, I yield back to balance my time. Gentleman uh, yields back. Unless there's further debate, we'll call the question. All those in favor of the Stern Amendment, say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. It's uh, Pitts 2 001. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. It's the unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, last night when we were debating uh, life issues, uh, Mr. Pitts and I said we'd offer four amendments. We actually offered three. I offered one. He offered two. This is the fourth one. And, and this amendment goes directly at the CAPS amendment, which was uh, approved by one or two votes here last night. And this really is the Hyde Amendment. This is Hyde Amendment being codified. Because the issue, and I believe that unless abortion is specifically excluded, the Health Benefits Advisory Committee and or the Secretary of Health and Human Services, or if not them, then a court through a lawsuit brought by any abortion advocacy group will mandate coverage of abortion as an essential benefit. For example, when the federal Medicaid statute was passed, nowhere in the statute did it say that abortion would be covered? But the administrators running the program deemed abortion to be covered. As the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals explained, because abortion fits within many mandatory care categories, including family planning, outpatient services, inpatient services, and physician services, Medicaid covered medically necessary abortions between 1973 and 1976. As we all know, back in 73 and 76, Congressman Jim Oberstar and Henry Hyde put together the Hyde language. Since that time, since 1976, it has been part of our law. But we have to renew it every year in the appropriation bills. So as we take a look at it, and in the CAPS language last night, when we amended, we said abortion is neither required or prohibited. That means the legislation is silent on it. Therefore, if the administrator isn't going to, then the courts can interpret it, as we see from the sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. So the CAPS amendment, as we have in this bill now, does not include any restriction on the use of federal subsidies to pay for health insurance that covers abortion on demand. And because the bill authorizes and appropriates the funding for these subsidies, there is no need for Congress to pass future appropriation riders like the Hyde Amendment. The CAPS amendment that was approved last night is really an end run on the Hyde Amendment. We must get the Hyde Amendment language back into this bill right here and now, or we'll be looking at massive subsidies for abortion. 
And that's without even talking about the funding of abortion through Medicaid and a public plan. So it's really critical we pass this amendment. And I would yield to uh, Mr. Pitts. I have two minutes left. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill will provide massive subsidies for plans that cover abortion, including the public plan. The amendment we dealt with last night had to do with mandates. This has to do with subsidies or funding. Once again, we need only look to history to give evidence to this fact. Under Medicaid, the federal funding for abortion was mandated by the courts. And as a result, the taxpayers funded over 300,000 abortions per year between 1973 and 76 when the Hyde Amendment was passed, before it was passed. It is for this reason that statutory exclusions have been necessary in programs like SCHIP, in the Federal Employees Health Benefits Plan, and DOD, and, and Indian Health Bills. Now, some of our colleagues have talked about the status quo. In these plans, the status quo is no federal funding for plans that include abortion. The CAPS Amendment last night repudiates this longstanding federal policy, and instead, it established what I would call an accounting gimmick. Instead of creating a bookkeep, it created a bookkeeping measure to create the illusion of a prohibition of taxpayer support for abortion. This amendment actually prohibits public funds from being used to subsidize plans that cover abortion. The amendment before us will correct these negative effects of the CAP amendment. Moreover, the CAPS amendment is dependent on annual reapproval of the Hyde Amendment. The health care bill of such massive proportions should have permanent language clarifying that taxpayer dollars will not be used to subsidize abortion. And if there's any doubt about intentions to attack annual provisions like the Hyde Amendment, my colleagues need only remember the Dornan Amendment, which was just gutted this month in the D.C. Approves Bill. The amendment will have no impact on the legality or illegality of abortion. It's about what the government chooses to subsidize. So the issue here is simple. Americans should not be forced to have their tax dollars pay for plans that include abortions. And that is 71 percent of the public, according to uh, the, the recent polls. 71 percent of Americans do not support public funding of abortion. And when asked about whether taxpayer funds would go to pay for abortions, the budget director, Peter Orzog, state, I am not prepared to rule it out. So this amendment would simply protect taxpayers from being forced to finance the destruction of human life against their will by definitively ruling out taxpayer funding of plans that include abortion. And I urge support. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Gett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me try to say this extremely clearly. This legislation and the CAPS amendment, which we passed last night, prohibit the use of any and all public funds for abortions except as specified in the Hyde Amendment. What this amendment does is it expands the Hyde Amendment in ways never contemplated before. It puts the Hyde restrictions into statute for the first time, but more disturbingly, it applies the Hyde Amendment even to the private plans even, even to private funds that are used in the private plans. This has never been done before. And it would, in essence, restrict health insurance plans, private or public, all around the country from offering a medical procedure which, as of today's date, is a legal medical procedure. Under current law, women can use their own private funds to choose private insurance that covers abortion services, and this amendment would completely wipe this out. It would restrict private citizens from using their own private funds to purchase, pr purchase private insurance that covers health care services from plans that also accept public funds. Would now, you yield on that point? Uh, in a moment. Okay. In, in, the CAPS Amendment, we clearly say, and this is passed as part of the manager's amendment, no public funds will be used for the abortions. Now, the CAPS, 
Amendment also says that every American will be able to choose a health insurance plan that provides no abortion coverage. So someone's not going to be forced to enroll in an insurance plan that will be well forced that that will cover abortions, except as specified by the Hyde Amendment. And so, so I think it's a very reasonable compromise. I will just note, as I noted last night, again. We just passed the Labor HHS bill, which included the Hyde Amendment again. The President has not issued a veto threat. No one is talking about taking that language out. What we need to do today is preserve the status quo and give quality health care to every American, not to make this a debate about a false issue about expansion of abortion, which is not true. I'll yield to would Mrs. Capps, and then if I have time, I'll yield to you, Mr. Stupak. And actually, I would like to ask the author of this amendment uh, a question about people today, many in this room who have private health insurance plans, um, many of which have abortion services as part of them. Under this amendment, those plans, I, my insurance policy would be null and void. Is this correct? No. Uh, would you explain why? No funds authorized that may be could, used to pay for could abortion could or to cover any part of costs of any health plan that includes abortion. That's all it is. Well, well my, no. my health plan ask includes Collins. abortion. Could I ask counsel? Well, he, yeah. If you could repeat the question, I'm sorry. The question is for my health insurance policy today or anyone's in this room, private health insurance policy, um, uh, the, if it includes abortion services or re reproductive services that, in, that allow for abortion using private funds, will this amendment, if it's part of our bill, uh, uh, prevent that? As I understand the question, you're asking whether the FEHBP program, which I think all of us are under. Um, or, or, uh, uh, no. Remove it from that, then anyone, any, anyone in the health, anyone. Not just federal employees. As I understand it, this amendment would affect the plans in the exchange. Right. Um, and but my, but it, it, my plan let, may go into the exchange. Let, let me reclaim. And if, and if that's true, then it would not allow any. It, so my plan. You know, let, let no me reclaim my time. Funds. What I want to, I would like to reclaim my time, and I would like to ask Mr. Stupak the question. Any plan in the exchange which takes money from the subsidies could not use private funds in that plant, whether the plan is public or private, to provide abortions, correct? If it receives subsidies, it's That's public correct. funds. If then I, it, you could not subsidy, use, it could not use private funds no. to, for, to do abortions, correct? Yes or no? Correct? Public funds. If you take a subsidy, public subsidy. Then you cannot use private funds you within those public plans funds for, to provide for abortions, abortion. correct? You could not use. Council, Council is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Mr. I'd Chairman. like us to go to a vote on Mr. this. Mr. Chairman, could I ask uh, questions of counsel, follow up on that? A uh, gentleman's uh, recognized. We still have five minutes if we want to use Yeah, them. I haven't claimed any time. You can't ask. Well, I, oh, you haven't used your five minutes at all in your No. Oh, I'm sorry. Please, gentleman from Pennsylvania's uh, recognized. I'd like to ask counsel, could federal dollars under this legislation, subsidize plans that include abortion? As amended by the CAPS amendment adopted last night, yes. Thank you. Question two, is there any existing federal health subsidy that funds plans that include abortion other than those permitted in the case of rape, incest, or life of the mother? I, I, forgive me, I'm trying to go through a quick inventory of federal health, uh, federal plans. Um, the FEHBP plan does not. The Indian Health Service does not. The Medicaid program, although it does not allow federal funds to be spent for abortion services, allows states to use their funds to pay for abortion services. And I believe at this point 17 states do so. And what about Indian Health and Indian DOD? Neither FEHBP nor Indian Health currently allows abortion services with federal funds. So this is a new policy with regard to federal funding. 
this would expand federal funding with respect to plans that cover abortion. It would, I, I'm sorry, sir, the way the fresh question is phrased, I have trouble answering it directly. The CAPS amendment as passed last night mm -hmm. allows, um, allows a plans that pay for abortions, but it does not allow federal funds to be used to pay for those abortions. I understand the accounting gimmick. Uh, the CAPS amendment changes the status quo by gutting the current pro-life policy with a scheme which plans that cover abortion may receive taxpayer funding. I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Terry. Yeah, Thank you, uh, Mr. So Pitts. Funding, the, uh, the issue here is that under the exchange with the private insurance and, of course, with the government-run public plan, the people that enter into the exchange Many of them will be eligible for a government subsidy, some up to 100 percent of the policy costs, others not at 100 percent, but you cannot deny that those are government funds going into uh, and paying for a plan of which then, depending on the mandates uh, within the CAPS amendments, uh, amendment, uh, would go towards uh, the cost of an abortion. You can say that there is a wall between them, but the reality is money is fungible. Yeah. Uh, you have to admit yeah. that if there is public dollars going in there, whether you create a fictitious right. wall, the fungibility of the dollars will subsidize the abortions regardless. Uh, and that's our concern here is that we prevent the taxpayer dollars going from in there. So. Uh, we can't stop what a state does or what an individual does here, but we can stop the taxpayer dollars from subsidizing uh, the exchange uh, and the public plan. I'll yield back to Mr. Pitts. Thank you. You're uh, reclaiming my time. Just to respond to uh, uh, what Ms. Capps said, uh, nothing in the amendment says anything about disallowing voluntarily offered abortion coverage. It simply says the government can't mandate abortion coverage, and if private plans want to cover abortion, uh, the amendment doesn't stop that. What it stops uh, is, is uh, what we try to do is for, stop the mandate to force abortion in every insurance plan in the country. And the question really is whether the secretary or the advisory committee or the commissioner can at some point mandate that plans cover abortion. Yeah. And uh, if that's not their intent, um, this amendment should yeah. pass. Uh, okay. Joe, would you yield? I'll yield, I'll yield the gentleman. Who, who was uh, he? Mr. Pitts, to, thanks for yielding. Sorry. You know, when Ms. Capps asked whether about her plan and her coverage, that's a private plan. That's not receiving any subsidies money. This is the Hyde Amendment. That's what this is, amendment is, the Stupak Pitts Amendment. It says no public funds for abortion. That's really the question that we have before us. Therefore, I urge all members yeah. to vote in favor of this amendment. Mr. Joe, you yield? The remaining 16. Joe, up here. Uh, just I'll yield to the gentleman. Just to uh, uh, thank my uh, colleagues and my colleague and friend from Michigan for his courageous stand, and, and I look forward to supporting his amendment. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Harmon. Thank you. I'm well, we, we've been trying to operate five on each side. We had five on each side so far. Oh. Uh, Could, let's, this let's, is uh, a critical debate, Mr. Chairman. It is Could a critical debate. So I, separate... I will recognize you, and you can and yield to others or yield, yield back to, when you're finished. Uh, I'll yield to Mr. Doyle, too. Uh, just very quickly. Uh, if I recognize how personal this subject is to everybody sitting here. Uh, and most of us are parents, and those of us who were mothers and have daughters have really struggled with this over years. But, but here is my point, um, and I, I would like to ask this to Council. Um, the comments over on the other side were talking about federal dollars subsidizing plans. My understanding is that federal dollars uh, subsidize parts of premiums for individual people. Is that correct? Yes. Who then purchase plans. Yes, ma'am. So generalizing it to the whole plan, I think, is, is somewhat misleading. Could, do you agree? I, I... All right. Well, I, my personal view is it's somewhat misleading. Secondly, is it true, counsel, that 
Many private plans that many people purchase, including people sitting in this room, include abortion services. Is that true? It is my understanding that 86 percent of private plans now 86 percent of private plans. And they wouldn't include those services, I don't believe, unless people were interested. And people use their private dollars or they use dollars from employers for which there is a tax deduction to purchase those plans. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, I. I believe, and then I'll yield to Mr. Doyle, that the intent of the CAPS Amendment, which I thought was very carefully crafted, was to give people basically the same options they have now to use private dollars to purchase abortion services if they choose in plans that they choose that have abortion services. Is that correct, counsel? Is that the intent of the CAPS Amendment? That is the effect of the All CAPS right. Amendment. I'll yield to Mr. Doyle. Uh, thank you. I, I have questions for counsel, too. I, I want to make sure I understand the Pitts Amendment. If, if a plan wants to offer abortion services and that plan accepts one customer that's subsidized, you know, once it takes that first subsidized customer, is that, is that plan then precluded from offering abortion even if, if they have private pay customers? Or are they, are they just excluding the subsidized people. If someone comes into a plan and, and they're not subsidized, it's all their own money. If I may, sir, I think I understand the question. I think it occurs in reverse, that the, plan, that the plan may not accept any person with a subsidy in, if that plan offers abortion services. So, so if a plan wants to offer abortion services, it can accept nobody in the plan that's subsidized. Yes, sir. And uh, even if that person is 10 percent subsidized and 90 percent of their own money, that person is precluded from entering that plan because that plan offers abortion services. Yes, sir. And, and one last question is, again, I want to just say this once more for that. Is there any way possible in any circumstance, under any loophole, under any condition, that anybody under the CAPS amendment that was adopted yesterday can use public funds to pay for abortion? Not legally. No, sir. Would the gentleman Thank yield? Thank you. I'll yield to Ms. Well, Kastner. I think would, it's my time. Would the gentleman I'd yield? Like to, to, yield to Ms. Kastner. Thank you very much. Um, this, this amendment is unnecessary because of the adoption of the CAPS amendment yesterday. But I'm afraid that if this is adopted, it will have a very serious consequence of interfering with individuals and families' choice of their own insurance coverage and which medical services that they need. That decision is rightfully left to that individual or to that family. Now, I understand and I respect that some in Congress do not agree with the current status of the law that certain women's medical services are legal, but they are legal in America. And because certain medical services are legal, the appropriate course is to trust and leave it up to the individual or to the family to choose their medical care, to choose their doctor, to choose their insurance coverage. It is not appropriate for the members of Congress uh, who disagree with the law to, to intervene. It's important ultimately to ensure consistency and stability in health insurance options and not restrict access to certain legal medical services because certain members of Congress didn't disagree. We should not interfere with that doctor-patient relationship and a person's uh, choice of insurance coverage. I yield back. Thank you. And I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. I thought you were going to ask. Let okay. Yeah, all time, the no, gentlelady yields back her time. Let's proceed to the vote. Let's, it, uh, let's call the roll, because I know we're going to get there. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. No. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo? No. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak? Yes. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel? No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green? No. Mr. Green, no. Mr. Get? No. Mr. Get, no. Mrs. Cap? 
Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Doyle? No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon? No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky? No. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin, votes no. Mr. Ross? Aye. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner? No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? No. Mr. Butterfield? No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson? Yes. Mr. Melanson, yes. Mr. Barrow? Aye. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill? Ms. Matsui? Ms. Matsui? Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen? No. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor? Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space? No. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney? Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton? Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley? Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton? Aye. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton? Mr. Stearns? Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal? Aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield? Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus? Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck? Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt? Mr. Blunt? Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer? Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Rodanovich? Mr. Rodanovich, aye. Mr. Pitts? Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mac? Aye. Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden? Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry? Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick? Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania? Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn? Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry? Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise? Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher? No. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Upton? Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Matheson? Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Rush? Mr. Rush votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Here's Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon? Mr. Gordon votes no. Any member wish to change his or her vote? Clerk will tally the vote.
give you an accurate vote here. <laughs> Clerk, ready to announce the vote? Yes. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'd like to change my, my vote to a no. Yeah. Mr. Shimpkis votes off, aye, and on, no. No, but he's not on the prevailing side. That didn't do good. Clerk will announce the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 28 and the nays, I'm sorry. That's right, we have to take one off. <laughs> the ayes were 27 and the nays were 31. 27 ayes, 31 noes. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Go to yours. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Radonovich, you uh, have an amendment? Yes, I do. Amendment number 22 at the desk. Mr. Pallone reserves a point of order. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can we check with on the time of that amendment? Yes, that was at uh, three twelve p.m. Okay. Wednesday, the twenty ninth. Okay, we have the right one. Thank you. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. thirty two hundred offered by Mr. Radonovich. Keep reading. <laughs> Add at the end of section 221 the following. H, level playing field. Um, Compliance with general. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we object. Uh, we're get, we haven't seen this amendment, so Very we're going to have it read until we can understand it. Compliance with generally acceptable requirements, notwithstanding any other provision of this subtitle, the Secretary, with respect to the public health insurance option, shall comply with the following requirements in the same manner as such requirement would apply to any private QHBP offered, offering, offering entity offered <laughs> a qualified health benefit plan through the health insurance exchange. One, finance all startup costs of the option by loans secured through non-governmental non lending institutions without any assistance from any other government agency except to the same extent that such financing or assistance from a governmental entity would be available to other QHBP offer, offering entities. Two, payment of state premium taxes. Three, payment of state and local property taxes. Four, payment of market rates for all buildings, equipment, and services. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. This amendment will ensure that government plan competes on a level playing field with private health plans by making it meet the same requirements. According to the independent Lewin Group, under this bill, coverage under <clears throat> private insurance would decline by 83 million people. This is a 48 percent reduction in the number of people with private insurance. Despite its supporters' claims, it's abundantly clear that the government plan can't compete on a level playing field with the private plans. <clears throat> the private insurance market will be destroyed. Americans' access to their current health plans will be destroyed along with it. With the inclusion of this government plan, the President breaks his promise to Americans who want to keep their current health insurance. The government plan will not pay state premium and property taxes will not be subject to lawsuits, will not be forced to abide by state financial stability requirements, and it will not pay market rates to doctors and hospitals for their services. These are just some of the advantages. Specifically, my amendment requires the government plan to do the following. Finance all startup costs by loans secured through non-governmental lending institutions without any assistance from any other government agency, pay premium taxes, pay state and local property taxes, pay market rates for all buildings, equipment, and services. 
receive no access to any special data from other government agencies. It cannot accept funds from the U.S. Treasury or any other government agency unless those funds are available to all private sector health insurance companies, must fully finance the cost of all employees, pay the U.S. Treasury and the state and the state a rate equal to what their state and federal corporate taxes would be, be subject to lawsuits, pay market rates to providers, and it can't force doctors and hospitals to accept public to accept public plans as a condition for participating in Medicare. This amendment is not offered to protect health insurance companies. Republicans agree that they need to be held accountable. Instead, this amendment is offered to save Americans' ability to continue to access their current health insurance if they want to do so. Our President, our Speaker, and the distinguished, my distinguished colleagues on the committee have all repeatedly stated that the intention of the public plan is to provide competition. If that's truly the goal, then let's ensure that the playing field is fair to all competitors. Well, I had trouble when he... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I couldn't answer it without... The gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Murphy, recognized for five minutes. Take it apart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, to rebut the notion that began the gentleman's comments that the public option is going to destroy private health care insurance, you have very little faith in your constituents if you believe that a public plan that only gets enrollees by people choosing to join it, that only gets providers by providers choosing to participate, uh, is going to destroy private health care insurance. Um, the fact is, as we've said before, over and over, CBO has, has looked at this, has determined that though there will be a certain number of people who will go into the public plan, potentially 9 or 10 million people, uh, that it will only represent a small share of the overall number of individuals who are receiving coverage, and in fact... Uh, will, will the gentleman yield? Yeah. Will the gentleman... Well, let me finish. I, I'll be glad to yield. Let me, let me finish my thought. Um, and overall, the number of people who are in private insurance actually increase over the course of the 10 years of this bill. Let me just make, I'd be glad to yield, but let me just make one specific point to your, to your amendment uh, here, and, and that is the requirement that the public plan would pay state premium taxes. Um, I think that provision in particular is particularly wrong-headed uh, because as a nonprofit health care provider, which is essentially what we're attempting to create with the public plan, it should frankly be treated just like most other nonprofit health care providers are treated. Uh, in 24 states, Blue Cross Blue Shields don't pay premium taxes. Medicare Advantage plans don't pay premium taxes. Nonprofit health care insurance companies in most states are not required to pay premium taxes. So by requiring, requiring that the public plan has to pay premium taxes, you actually set an unlevel playing field with respect to the major insurers in most states, which is Blue Cross Blue Shield. So on, on, on that particular point, I think If the gentleman would yield. If I would, I'd like to. I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Rodonovich. To the gentleman. Thank you. I, I'm just, just wanting to provide a level playing field between the public and the, and the government health care plan. And, and, and I'm assuming that you would uh, agree that there ought to be a level playing field between both plans. We're reclaiming, reclaiming yeah, my would, time. Would you yield after your gentleman your yields account? to me also and he has a chance? Sure. Re reclaiming my time by requiring that this plan pay state premium taxes when n other nonprofit but, but health care plans, it, 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 including it, it, the biggest. There was a long list of other things that no, yeah, were required yeah. to make would a you, better uh, this. Would you yield on I'm, that point? I'm making a specific point there that you are. Yeah. In that particular instance, Mr. you Murphy, are very you, consciously unleveling, un unlevel the playing field. Gentlemen, Thirty yeah. Mr. Pallone. You know, I, I understand um, what the author of this amendment is trying to do, take him in good faith that he's trying to level the playing field. I think we all agree that we have to have a level playing field. But the problem is you just you have to be careful about exactly how you do that. And, and Mr. Murphy is talking, you know, pointing out that with state premium taxes, you go the other way because Blue Cross and some of the other nonprofits don't pay that. And I would say the same thing with regard to this uh, provision that says finance all startup costs by loans secured through non governmental lending institutions without any assistance from other government agencies. You know, now we do say that you can use some federal funds for startup, but they have to be paid back. And you understand that initially, unlike the private insurance plans, you know, which have been around for years and you know, ha have been operating, the public plan is starting from scratch. 
And it is going to have to have some startup costs. And to say that it has to go out and get these loans that are, you know, are going to be difficult and it can't use Federal funds even for that, I mean, these, this is going beyond. This is, a, a, in my opinion, an effort to basically, and I don't, I'm not saying intentionally, I hope not, to cripple the public plan from the very beginning. And I don't think that's fair. I mean, we've got a very good idea here of competition between public and private. We have a level playing field in the bill, and this amendment goes beyond that. It makes it, I think, virtually impossible for it to be even started up. And I, I just think that's not fair. It goes against the basic grain, and, and we should oppose it. I yield back to the gentleman. Thank Would you, you yield your last 30 seconds? Yeah. Do I have 30 seconds? Sure. Who's, yeah. Mr. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, two quick statements. When we had CBO in front of us, I asked them specifically on the administrative costs if they calculated any of these type of things in, and they said they did not. Uh, and I think when we look at whether they are getting an advantage on the administrative costs, it is important about whether it is a level playing field, because there are a lot of insurance companies that are paying, if not all of these items listed, at least some of them. And the issue about the intelligence of our constituents, yes, we respect that. That is why if they are the same product and one is artificially lower cost for the same thing, they are going to take the lower cost one, which is the public option. Gentlemen's time has expired. Let's proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the Radanovich Amendment will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The noes have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher, Mr. Pallone, Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon, Mr. Rush, Ms. Eshoo, no. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Supak. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. <laughs> Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett, no. Mrs. Capps. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. No. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee? No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross? No. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner? No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? No. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield? No. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Malinson? No. Mr. Malinson, I. Mr. Barrow? No. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill? Ms. Matsui? No. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen? No. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor? No. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes? No. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? No. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space? No. Mr. Space? No. Mr. McNerney? No. Ms. McNerney, McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton? Ms. Sutton? No. Mr. Braley? No. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch? Mr. Barton? Aye. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton? Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns? Mr. Deal? Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield? Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus? Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Blunt? Mr. Boyer? Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. 
Mr. Rodanovich. Aye. Mr. Rodanovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mac. Aye. Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Stearns. Not recorded. Mr. Stearns was aye. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak. No. Uh, Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Rush. No. Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. I'm sorry. Mr. Shattuck. Votes. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. All members have responded to the rule. No member wishes to change a vote. Clerk will tally the vote and announce it. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 23 ayes and 32 noes. 23 ayes, 32 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Who am I going to? Ms. Matsui, you have an amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk, Matsui 6-002. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Ms. Matsui of California. Add at the Without end of objection, subtitle H. The amendment will be considered as read. Generally from California will uh, be recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, the amendment I'm offering today is one that's critically important to millions of Medicaid beneficiaries across our country and Medicare managed care plans. Since 1991, states have had the federal authority to tax Medicaid managed care plans in order to generate revenue for their Medicaid programs. Eight states have utilized this taxing authority to expand Medicaid eligibility, increase Medicaid reimbursement rates to providers, and strengthen care coordination. Unfortunately, the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005 limited the ability of these states to generate money for the Medicaid programs by taxing managed care organizations. When Congress changed its authority, it recognized the negative effect this would have had on Medicaid beneficiaries in the eight impacted states. As a result, Congress delayed the effect of this provision for those states until October of this year. On the first day of October, California and seven other states will see their available Medicaid dollars drop by $2.7 billion. When Congress last acted as a body on this issue, no one could have predicted the immense fiscal crisis which would hit our states. In our home state of California, Mr. Chairman, our governor signed a budget this week that cuts more than $1 billion from Medicaid. If the DRA provision on Medicaid managed care is allowed to take effect in October, 
Almost half a billion additional dollars will be lost from California's Medicaid program this year alone. In Georgia, $253 million will vanish from Medicaid in October unless we act. In Ohio, $242 million Medicaid dollars are at stake. Medicaid beneficiaries in these states and in states across our country are already faced with serious service reductions that will lower the quality and efficiency of health care they receive. Will the gentlelady yield? Oh. Yes, please. Uh, my, chair, my, uh, my leader has uh, left us for a minute. I know this is a, an amendment that very positively impacts the state, the great state of Michigan. And uh, with his absence, we are ready to and willing to accept it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Don't you know, tell him I said so, but he signed off. That's let's good. Move, Thank you very much. Let's move quickly. Very good. Yes, let's do. All those in favor of the Matsui Amendment will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment's agreed to. Okay. Who's our next Democratic Amendment? I'm not ready. Steve's here, so he, Boyer, he might. Uh, Mr. Boyer, you have an amendment? I do. I have, uh, I have three amendments, and I ask that they all be considered in block. One would be Boyer, number 142. The other would be, I think it's 142B. Do you have that one? And the other one is uh, 002, and the other one is 004. We, uh... Mr. Chairman, can I reserve a point of order? The gentleman from New Jersey reserves a point of order. Um, Will the um, pardon? If the gentleman would permit, we we are being told by our staff they haven't had a chance to r read them yet, and I. Uh, so why don't we take them up but reserve sure. the question of end blocking them? But I don't know why we wouldn't. But let's just don't go well, to that. Why don't I? Why don't I suspend? We'll put them in in an in-block form, let your staff take a look, that, look at them, and I'll be more than happy to speak with them, and I'll let you... Okay, All right, I'll, I'll suspend the offering of those amendments until okay. I work it out with the chairman. Okay, thank you. All right, so go back to your side. Well, Joe Martin. Mr. Weiner? I know he's been seeking recognition. The chair recognizes uh, Anna Eshoo from California. Do you have an amendment at the desk? I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the amendment at the desk is uh, numbered 001, Eshoo 001. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yes. okay. The, uh, without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and the gentlelady is recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to offer this amendment, which is really the culmination of nearly three years of, uh, of work uh, to create a regulatory pathway for FDA approval of biosimilars uh, or follow-on biologics. 
I know that this is an issue uh, which you also care deeply about, Mr. Chairman, and while we have different views on some of the details of our legislative approaches, uh, we both share the same goal of bringing new competition and lower prices to the biotechnology sector. Along with uh, Representatives Inslee and the ranking member of this committee, Mr. Barton, earlier this year we introduced the Pathway for Biosimilars Act, which now has 142 bipartisan co-sponsors. This bill today mirrors the biosimilars legislation introduced as an amendment in the Senate Help Health Care Bill. The amendment drew the overwhelming support uh, the help com of the help uh, uh, committee. Would the gentlelady yield? Um, I know our side is prepared to accept this, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we can we can speed things along a little bit. I think um, uh, I appreciate that, and uh, I'm as anxious as you are to take the vote. Uh, I do think that uh, three years of work uh, merits at least uh, two minutes of, uh, of remarks because the legislation does have complexity. So I'd like to uh, uh, just, um, uh, I'll do it as quickly as I can. Um, the Senate Help Committee uh, uh, produced a vote of 16 to 7 on the legislation. Uh, Chairman Edward Kennedy cast his vote in absentia. Uh, and. Uh, the legislation is scheduled to save $9 billion, according to the CBO, over 10 years. We have drawn on the Senate help amendment to incorporate provisions related to the approval process and the issue of data exclusivity. We have also included in our amendment the patent resolution provisions uh, of the bill, which we believe will protect the rights of all parties and ensure that all patent disputes involving a biosimilar are resolved, very importantly, my colleagues, before the expiration of the data exclusivity period. Uh, I'm going to summarize, uh, since uh, members are anxious to take a vote. Um, I think that this amendment sets forth a straightforward, scientifically-based process for expedited approval of biologics based on innovative products already on the market. It ensures that patients are given safe and effective treatments, that they uh, are subjected to thorough scrutiny and testing by the FDA, and that the bill provides uh, for the promotion of competition and the lowering of prices. I think that those are uh, more than worthy goals. I'm proud of the co-sponsorship on a bipartisan basis. I want to thank everyone of you that have worked on it, and I want to ask my colleagues uh, for their support for this new and historic pathway for the approval of biosimilars. Would and uh, I'd be would happy to yield, yield to um, uh, Ms. Christensen and uh, Mr. Inslee if they, uh, we've got, what, a minute and a half left. Thank uh, you. Ms. Christensen. I'll be very brief. I just want to speak in support of, of this amendment. Um, it's important that there be the process established for biosimilars and one that ensures safety for the patients. These are very complex molecules, and they uh, you, the provisions in your bill ensure that um, when the biosimilar or the follow-on biologic is approved, that it's gone through a, a, a sufficient pathway and that it is actually a, a similar drug with similar impact and effects on the patient. So I thank you for the amendment, and I'm pleased to support it. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Inslee, and then uh, t uh, 10 seconds for Mr. Stupak. Very briefly, there's a fellow named Eric Lindbergh. He's, uh, he's uh, Lindbergh's grandson of fame. He's in Suquamish, Washington, who was bedridden due to rheumatoid arthritis. Until these guys invested about a billion dollars uh, to, to build a product called Embril. He's now up walking around. He's, he's a successful artist. His life has been restored because we had laws that allowed investors to put a billion dollar investment that eventually, due to luck and incredible creativity, built this drug to save his life. That's the guy I'm thinking of when I'm voting on this that does create the appropriate balance of protecting investors' investment and moving forward. And I think this is the right balance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Stupin. Remaining two seconds. I just want to compliment the gentlelady on this uh, amendment. She's worked long and hard on it for three years. And uh, Jay mentioned how it's helped people in his district, it's helped people throughout all of our districts. This is really a good amendment. I want to compliment you on your work. I thank the gentleman. 
Gentlelady's time back. has expired. The chair recognizes Thank himself, and I'll yield to others if they uh, wish me to. I know that members of this committee support creation of a biosimilar pathway. I know they believe it will bring competition and reduce the high price of biologics. I endorse that. But I strongly believe that adoption of this amendment is exactly the wrong way to achieve increased competition and lower prices, nor will it enhance innovation. This am amendment enacts a lengthy monopoly period, 12 years, and then allows those periods to be extended indefinitely, the so-called evergreening problem. The evidence is overwhelming that these open-ended monopolies will create huge obstacles to competition. To those who want competition in the biologics market, I'd refer people to a letter from the CEOs of the 28 major generic drug uh, companies. They say monopolies with this long and unpredictable period of time uh, will not, uh, uh, th that they will not even enter the biosimilar market because there's no economic incentive for them to do it. To those who want lower cost, uh, look to what the payers are saying and the patients group, a coalition of consumer groups, AARP, unions, businesses, and state and private payers strongly oppose this amendment because it will rob us of the opportunity to achieve significant cost savings for patients and payers. To those who think this is going to bring innovation, Look at the report from the Federal Trade Commission, which conducted a year-long investigation and concluded that monopolies this long would severely damage both competition and innovation. Creating real competition in the drug marketplace is one of the best opportunities we have to control costs. But by passing this amendment, we're not only missing a historic opportunity to bend the cost curve, we're guaranteeing higher co drug costs for the foreseeable future. I understand a large majority of this committee supports this amendment. I do not. And I will continue to make my case that we need real competition to bring down the cost of the fastest growing segment of our nation's drug bill, not endless monopolies for the drug industry. As, a member, as members continue to look at this issue, I think they will come to understand that this amendment is not the right way to go. Well, the gentleman gentleman yield. Yield. Who seeks um, for me to yield? Gentleman yield. I yield to uh, Mr. Mr. Deal from Georgia. Thank the chairman, and I concur with his statements. Let me give you a very quick illustration of what I consider to be the problem with this legislation and this amendment. I, I likewise do not object to a pathway. We need to establish a pathway. The, the real problem is the period of exclusivity. 12 years, and remember that is in addition to the 20-year patent life. Let's take an example. Let's suppose a child is born today with a problem, a disease, genetic disorder, and this same day a patent is filed for a biologic that holds the potential of being a cure or at least a help for that child. 20 years of patent life plus 12 years of a period of exclusivity. Now, it is true that there can, they can run concurrently. Let's assume that by the time the child reaches the first grade, that the patent has still provided the protection and now the product is on the market. The child enters the first grade. By the time the child graduates from high school, still the period of exclusivity applies. With evergreening, it's probably going to be before that child is at least a junior in college, before some lower cost alternative in the form of a follow-on biologic is in order. That is too long to expect the people of this country to wait. It stifles innovation. It has the exact opposite from what the stated intention is. And for that reason, I must oppose the gentleman the yield. yield back. Yield. Uh, the gentleman it's my, it's my time, and I yield uh, to Mr. Palone. Mm -hmm. Just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I want to associate myself with your remarks and those are also the remarks of Mr. Deal. Uh, I, I know this uh, is a crucial issue, and I know that it saves money, and I know that this is a moving train, but I really believe that the exclusivity period at this, uh, that it's in the amendment is too long, and I think that we need more opportunity to look at this and spend time and look at it separately from this bill. So I think that this is not the time for the amendment, and at this point I can't support it. 
My time has expired. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Barton. I rise in uh, support of the amendment and seek recognition. Okay, but if the gentleman, um, I certainly do want to recognize you, but if Mr. Dingle was seeking recognition, I. Okay, Mr. Barton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and I don't think I'll take five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'm proud to be an original and primary Republican co sponsor, along with Congresswoman Eshoo, on this uh, piece of legislation. When my friend from New Jersey talks about you need more time, we have been debating this uh, for at least three to four years that I am personally aware of. Uh, we had a major effort on this in the last Congress uh, that didn't bear fruit. Uh, it's been in play in this Congress, the entire first year of this Congress. Um, the time has come. Uh, the period of exclusivity is longer than uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and others wish, but it is identical to the period of exclusivity in the bill that Senator Kennedy is supporting that has passed the Committee of Jurisdiction in the Senate. In fact, I think the legislation or the amendment is identical to the, uh, to the bill that's come out of committee in the Senate. Is that not correct, uh, Mrs. Eshoo? So um, we have a bipartisan coalition. We have, uh, if my whip count is correct, almost two-thirds of this committee in support of this bill. Uh, uh, there will be sufficient time as we go through the process to continue to modify the bill if necessary. But when you have a bill that has come out of the relevant committee of jurisdiction, uh, with its primary sponsor being Senator Kennedy, who is one of the most noted legislators in the health care field, uh, when we have almost two-thirds of this committee in support of it, when it's an issue that we have worked on for years and years, which is very important to innovation, very important to health care as we intend to practice it in the 21st century. Um, uh, the fact that there's a disagreement whether the period of exclusivity should be 12 years or 5 years or 7 years uh, is not a reason to hold it up. Uh, the greater good, the larger underlying issue is that uh, uh, there is so much uh, um, effort being put into this field that we need to provide legislative certainty and we also need to give enough time for those people that invest to develop these breakthrough uh, biologics a reasonable period of time to recover their investment before we go to the uh, biosimilar mm -hmm. generic uh, equivalent or similar to it. There's no such thing as an exact generic equivalent to these, uh, these particular drugs. So I'm strongly in support of it. I want to thank Congresswoman Eshoo for her tireless leadership. Uh, when I go on the floor and seek her out, I normally have to wait in line because she is talking to some member about this bill. So. Uh, uh, it's to her dedication that the bill has gotten this far, and I'm proud to be the primary Republican. With the gentleman yield, her. be happy to you. Uh, I appreciate your good words. Uh, I I think that there are a couple of things that needed to be added to the record, uh, and also corrected. This is not 20 years. I know that Mr. Deal said that. Uh, the, uh, the patents, uh, the approval process, the exclusivity are all they are concurrent. Uh, and on uh, uh, biologics, uh, the uh, uh, biotechnology industry today in producing biologics um, has infinity. That's how long they have, forevermore. We are bringing this down to straight 12 years. It is not 20. I think that there needs to be a very special balance in this. And that's where we differ with the chairman. Hatch-Waxman worked very well for pharmaceutical compounds. They are small molecules, but they are not the same as biologics. They are not the same as biologics. And uh, I think that we need to accomplish the three things that we have worked so hard to build into the bill. Uh, I respect those that don't agree with us, uh, but we didn't snatch this number out of nowhere. And so uh, 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 the, the members need to know uh, that this is concurrent. It's not any 20-year uh, 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 exclusivity period, which would be ludicrous. So I wanted to uh, correct that. And I thank the gentleman for his work, for the support of members of the committee. Uh, and uh, I look forward to finally taking a vote on this. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, and I, I yield, back. Uh, yield back the time to uh, uh, the ranking back. member. Yield back my time. To would you, would you yield to me? 
Uh, I'll yield the last bit of time. I'll be quick. Deal. Um, it is true that the 20-year patent and the 12-year period of exclusivity may run concurrently. They do not have to run concurrently. You may not have the period of exclusivity to kick in until a later point in time when the patent may be well into the 20-year period. So there are two different things. Patents can be challenged. A period of exclusivity is without any challenge, regardless of what the motivation or the facts might be. It is a total period of exclusivity, not subject to challenge. And I thank the gentleman. All time has expired. The vote now comes on the SU amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Uh, the ayes have it. And the request of to. roll call vote, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. You uh, told me you wouldn't do that, Anna. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You wouldn't do that. I didn't say that. Gentle lady from California, you request a roll call vote. Well, if uh, we've we've won, you, you've we've won. won. Do you want a roll call vote? I will, re Mr. Chairman. I'll request a roll call vote if she wants it. If the, well, if you want it, we'll go with it. I, I would adopted. like one. I would like one. Okay. I request a roll call vote. On okay, let's go to a roll call. Sorry about that. I did my best. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Yes. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green. Yes. Mr. Green, aye. Mr. Gett. Yes. Mrs. Capps. No. Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Doyle passes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Mr. Doyle votes aye. I apologize. Ms. Harmon. Yes. Ms. Harmon votes aye. Ms. Joukowsky. No. Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Doyle, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Aye. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner. No. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Math Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Aye. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Aye. Ms. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Ms. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill. Yes. Mr. Hill votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Aye. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Aye. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Yes. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. No. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Aye. Yes. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Aye. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Aye. Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booyer. Aye. Mr. Booyer, aye. 
Mr. Rodanovich. Aye. Mr. Rodanovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Aye. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Aye. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Sullivan votes aye. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes aye. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? If not, the clerk will report the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 47 ayes and 11 noes. 47 ayes, 11 noes. The amendment is agreed to. Next amendment. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Boyer. Are you prepared to proceed with the veterans' amendments? Yes. The gentleman has. Uh, Three amendments? Three it? amendments, and I'd ask that they be considered en bloc. Without objection, that will be the order. The clerk will report the amendments. Would be uh, Boyer 142B would be the first amendment. The second would be Boyer 002. And the third amendment would be Boyer 004. I'd also ask unanimous consent uh, that a packet be distributed to all members of the committee. This packet would be uh, letters from uh, disabled American veterans, the Blind Veterans Association, the Vietnam Veterans of America, the Jewish uh, War Veterans uh, of the United States, AMVETS, Military Order of the Purple Heart. The list goes on and on. Is that right, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Would it be okay to distribute the packet with regard to the letters? Yes, without the objection, Service. the Thank amendments you. will be considered Please. as read. The Please. amendments will be distributed, and the gentleman no. is recognized for five minutes. Th Thank you very much. The packet, I'd like for all members, uh, when you get them, to take a look at them. The, uh, the veteran service organizations are very concerned about provisions in the bill, and so I've, I've worked with them. I've asked the professional staff of uh, the VA uh, to examine the bill and uh, how do we best protect not only the uh, members of the National Guard and the Reserve, but also uh, veterans that are utilizing the VA hospital. And that's the purpose of three amendments. Really, I have six amendments, but I just couldn't figure out how to make the other three germane. And that's the real challenge that we have. And that's why earlier I had brought up with the chairman uh, that when other committees did not receive jurisdiction, when, the, when this bill comes out of this committee, we're going to have to sit down, uh, everyone together here, and figure out how to, uh, to take care of uh, other issues within jurisdiction outside of this committee. The, uh, uh, I have these, the three amendments I offer uh, address the concerns that are shared by the major veteran service organizations. The first amendment would exempt all veterans enrolled in the VA health care from a punitive tax levy against veterans who do not have, quote, acceptable health coverage. As currently defined in the bill, VA health care could be considered unacceptable coverage. This is simply wrong and unacceptable. Veterans enrolled in VA health care should not be subjected to punitive taxes for failure to have a, quote, 
acceptable health insurance. My second amendment would ensure that nothing in the bill would affect the military and veterans' ability to retain both VA and additional health insurance. Uh, H.R. 3200 gives a bureaucrat the authority to determine whether individuals enrolled in VA health care have acceptable coverage for purposes of participating in the exchange. If VA health care is considered, quote, qualified, end quote, coverage, a veteran enrolled in VA health care would be prohibited from ob obtaining additional health insurance. In 2007, almost 80 percent of the veterans enrolled in VA health care had additional health coverage. My amendment would protect and preserve their freedom to have multiple health care options. My third amendment would make it absolutely clear that the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary set priorities to meet uh, the needs of the service members and uh, veterans that the departments would never be challenged or obstructed by another secretary or the, the commissioner of the, of the health exchange. Our service members and the veterans require specialized medical care that is unique from the civilian health care and they should not be subjected to uniform bureaucratic decisions of other government officials. The other uh, amendments that I did want to bring up that I, I just can't offer, but Mr. Chairman, we're going to have to um, address. It deals with the, uh, uh, the National Guard and reserve, Reserves, and that is that employers, there should never be a disincentive for employers to hire a National Guard or a Reserve member. But a closer look at the bill itself, in fact, has an unintended consequence. So when you have an individual that could be uh, called to active duty, and uh, when they're called to active duty and maybe they have a, a, a dependent that is in, a, they, maybe they are sick and they have a particular health coverage, and maybe the, the service member those, then goes on to the active duty roles and they want to keep them under particular coverage, uh, this, this dual eligibility doesn't allow them to do that, and we've got a, a real problem. Take, for example, the person, though, that has an employer in their job and they trigger out of their employment insurance and are now on active duty, is the employer now subject to the 8 percent tax? These are real issues that we need to get resolved. And so, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you on these, these other issues. And I just couldn't get around the, uh, the germaneness issues. Will the, so, gentleman, uh, sure. will the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. I just wanted to say I appreciate these amendments because I know, um, you know your major role uh, with regard to veterans issue and your efforts here to clarify the role of veterans coverage. But there is one amendment that I understand had to be drafted broadly to remain in our jurisdiction. And it seems very broad. It says, no studies commissioned by the Health Choice Commission can study the role of veterans coverage in the United States. And we're, we're willing to accept the first two, but I would ask that you uh, speak to your intent on the third and withdraw it, because um, it's, it's, it's frankly on that third one, I don't really understand what it's going to achieve at this point. Well, H.R. 3200 would level a 2.5 percent tax on individuals who do not have acceptable health coverage at any time during a taxable year. So, so oops, strike that. Hold on. That's true. That's right. Well, that's no, on, no, but, but that's, that's, that's on right. six. Hold on. So the, the, as currently defined, um, veterans who receive 100 percent of their care through the VA health care system and choose not to carry additional insurance should not have punitive taxes levied against them for their decision. So my amendment would exempt all veterans enrolled in VA health care from being unfairly subject to an individual penalty tax for failure to have acceptable insurance. And so the, it's, it's written in such a manner, uh, Chairman Plum, because of the germaneness issue. I tried to do it with such clarity, but then I, I ran into the germaneness uh, issue. But that, this is exactly what, it, what it's going to. It's just that my concern is that in an effort to, to make it... Um, well, Chairman you know, Blown, here, here's what I would recommend. Why don't, we, why don't we accept all three? We have three other issues that we have to work together on. And so when we come out of this committee, I pledge to work with you and Chairman Filner and, and with, with uh, Chairman Waxman and the ranking member. And let's work on these along with Chairman Skelton because these are very difficult issues between TRICARE, between the military health, you know, the health delivery system, and the, and the VA and other that, that Would that work, Chairman Plone? 
if the gentleman would yield to me, uh, yes, I, 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 I think that's fine as long as you understand that on that I, third. I will work with to, you and I'll massage this language. We as have to proceed. figure it out better. Yes. Thank you. I yield back to you. I, I yield to the Chairman Dingell. I'm, I'm trying to understand here. Are we deciding that we're going to accept three of the amendments and yes. not one? We're going is to accept correct? all three and work, work through it. All right. Now, is, is the one, is the second, uh, rather the third one or the fourth one that will not be accepted, uh, Booyer number 142B? We're, we're accepting all three amendments that I'm offering, Booyer 142B, Booyer 2 and 4. There are other three amendments that I've not offered that I've agreed to work with the, the chairman. I have, some, I have some real problems with this, the gentleman would permit. Uh, I think it goes too broad, by too far. I, the, other, the other amendments are, I think, fine, but this one just goes too far. Hold, hold on, Mr. Chairman. It, let's check and make sure that the right amendment was handed out, if we could, please. The wrong amendment was handed out. That's the problem. The wrong amendment, There's, and they're trying to correct it right now. All right, thank you. And with all respect to the staffs, when you have 200 amendments at the desk, it is difficult to get the right amendments. So we understand that. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I Mr. Dingell, I'm going to recognize you. Uh, what have five we minutes. agreed? Mr. Dingell, you're recognized. Um, I mean, we have three amendments. Another one. Which have we agreed to? Which have we not agreed to? They were corrected by. Uh, so they by must have given them both out. Is that what you're trying to tell me? They did, but they're they're, they're handing out the one that is correct. Now. So. Yeah, that one is, that one is not being. The correct three. So that's why they should be handed out. The chair would like to address a question to council because evidently there's some confusion. We have um, some amendments that are not the amendments that were being considered and then the amendments that are being considered uh, have just been handed out. Could you explain which amendments are under uh, consideration? As I understand it, sir. Is your mic on? As I understand it, Mr. Chairman, the amendment. As I understand it, Mr. Chairman, more, some of the amendments that Mr. Boyer did not intend to be offering were also handed out. So the ones that I believe that Mr. Boyer is asking be considered are Amendment, uh, amendment 002, which is about exceptions for veterans and members of the armed forces, Amendment 004, Department of Veterans Affairs and Department of Defense Health Programs, and Amendment 142, untitled, but beginning insert at the end of Section 142. So Am I correct? 142B. 142 142B. We have two copies here, 142 and 142B. We believe, 142B. We believe they're identical. They're not. There's the insertion of in Would you look at, we had to insert in this act in 142B. Do you see that? You the commissioner is prohibited from using any funds in this, in this act. act. Yes, it, sir. So when I asked for consideration of 142B, that's what I asked to be passed yes, out. And that, and that was one of the ones that was passed out, okay. fortunately. Okay. Mr. Uh, Boyer? Okay. Yes, sir? 142 is, is too broad, and we get a little nervous about it. So if you would be willing to withdraw, that we'll continue to talk about it. Let us accept your other two. Well, we now know what's in front of us, though, Mr. Chairman. It's 142B, and it's restricted to this act, and that's what I had. That's the language I had to put in. I understand. In. I just trying to avoid having to have a opposing it and then a well, vote. I don't think. I, I think what Mr. Pallone and I had just agreed to while you were having a conversation. With well, Mr. Chairman, if I, if the would, gentleman would yield, um, I was referencing the three that I believe now we we did have at our desk. But again, I, I would reiterate that the third one inserted at the end, you know, the 142B is the one that I have a problem with, and it would be preferable if we could 
clarify that, and if the gentleman would withdraw it, the and difficulty, we would accept the other two. Well, All right, just want to share this with you guys. The difficulty here is doing it in a manner that maintains germaneness under the rulings the chairman has done on all other amendments. So what I'm hopeful that you'll do here is that you would take these, and then we'll work to clarify. If you say, no, Steve, we are not going to take the 142B, you invite incredible, um, you invite a lot of, um, gee, visits by all these veteran service organizations over the August break that is just not necessary. So what I'm just saying here is if you take this, we work together on it, and we work together to, uh, with regard to these other three amendments that address, Mr. Chairman, the National Guard and the Reserve and the TRICARE issues. These are very in the weeds issues that I know that are outside the jurisdiction of this committee, and I want to work with you, Mr. Chairman, to do that. It's just not possible, Mr. Pallone, for us to say, well, let's see how we can make it more narrow. Every time I tried to do that, Chairman Waxman, Chairman Pallone, I ran into a germaneness problem. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. There is a unanimous consent request made to accept all three. I will object. If there's a unanimous consent request made to accept the first two and not 142B, I will go along. I will suggest that 142B is, it appears to have some merit, but some problems. And I'd like to have, and I don't want to agree to something like this until I'm sure that it is, that it doesn't do violence to the purpose of the legislation. Let me see if I could get a clarification, Mr. Boyer, on your 142B. It, it says the term, commissioners prohibited from using any funds in this act to determine that health care coverage under Chapter 17 of Title 38 U.S. Code is not acceptable coverage for any purpose under Title III of Division A of this Act. What is your intention? Are we talking about veterans exclusively? Uh, yes, sir, we are. So your intention so is, is to limit this to veterans, but you were not able to do it in a, in a way that would meet the germaneness. That's, that's correct. And, and that's exactly what this has narrowed, narrowed Mr. itself into. The, Mr. Chairman, I have to be recognized in uh, opposition to the amendment. Under the, if the gentleman would permit, I'd be happy to work with you and go to the Rules Committee to, to get this in, the bill, but I'm loath to, to adopt an amendment that appears to be outside of the jurisdiction of our committee, even if it's not, even if it's not technically not germane, but it, 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 you draft it in a way that is confusing because you're trying to accomplish a purpose that I don't disagree with. So if, if you would be willing to accept my help so that we can do this right, I'd like to ask you to withdraw this particular one and we go with the other uh, two. It, it, my only suggestion was is if you took it, then you've got, you've got yourself a marker that we work from. If I don't want it to go blind, you, when you go blind, you're subjecting all the members to, um, I, I have learned about the wrath of the veteran service organizations over the years. I'm just sharing a little counsel with you. You don't want the wrath. And, and uh, I've got I was the, just asking. Yeah, I get the wrath of a lot of people. I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't mind it because if you just try to work things out. I, all right, well then here's, here's what, what I'll suggest. I, I will, um, Let's do, a, let's do a different unanimous consent request. I will withdraw, withdraw um, Booyer 142B, and I had asked for an end block uh, for Booyer Amendment 002 and Booyer 004. And when I do this, and, and as I do this, then, Mr. Chairman, I, I understand you and I are going to work on this uh, issue on 142B and the issues regarding the exempting the Guard and Reserve employers who are also subject to the penalty, and the other issue deals with the VA reimbursement on third-party uh, medical insurance. Council seems to have a question, so I want to ask If I may, Mr. One. Boyer, we have two sets of amendments from you with the exact same numbers on them. Can you look at the bottom left corner and tell me the time at which they were drafted, please? Well, give me the latest one. How's that? The last one fi filed. So 3.48 p.m. and 3.51 p.m. in the footers? This is July 17th. On July 17th? It's 
Is this correct? Yes. Yes. Fine. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. I told you. So I have a unanimous consent request on an end block sitting before the chairman. And uh, uh, you, you have a unanimous and, and just reserving the right to object so I can get further clarification. You are not you are talking about dealing with veterans exclusively and you're not going beyond that. I'm I'm dealing with the amendments that are presently before the committee deal strictly with the veterans. The other amendments that you and I have agreed to work on also deal with guardsmen and reservists when they're called to active duty and have other forms of insurance. It gets into a very delicate issue when people move on and off of active duty and already have tax, or, or excuse me, already have insurance. So, Mr. Chairman, when you accept one of these that says that, they're, that they can have dual eligibility, we begin to clean up part of this challenge that these guardsmen and reservists are going to have. Is there objection to the unanimous consent request? If not, uh, that will be the order. And um, we will now vote on the two Boyer amendments. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose no. The ayes have it. The amendments are agreed to. Mr. The Chairman Chairman has my commitment Mr. to Chairman, work one, together. One last thing I, I need to share with the committee was last time during the mark, uh, Ms. Harmon had offered an amendment dealing with, with uh, taking medics from active duty and making go into EMTs. I'd, I've done all the due diligence. She did a great job. The only concern that was raised by anyone was DOD was giving incentives to medics to leave active duty. Outside of that, there are no problems, and I congratulate Ms. Harmon for her amendment. Very good. Um, for, further amendments? Who am I seeking? Mr. Weiner. Ask. Uh, Clerk will report the amendment. Oh, the number. <laughs> amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute for H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Weiner of New York and Mr. Welch of Vermont. Amend Division A. Without to objection, read the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Chairman, reserve a point of order. And the gentleman from, I assume, Louisiana uh, has reserved a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I offer this amendment with uh, su the sponsorship of Mr. Welsh, also Mr. Doyle, Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Schakowsky, Mr. Rush, and Mr. Engel. And I think with the support of many Americans who are asking fundamental questions about the way the bill we're considering is structured and whether or not there is a better way. This is an amendment that would strike the guts of the bill and replace it with a single payer option that would, I believe, be less expensive, more simple, and would ultimately cover more people in a way that they understand and know. Let me begin by saying that we have tried with some success, but a great deal of confusion, to jerry-rig a health care system on top of the foundation of the private insurance model, that if we were going to start from scratch, we would never choose. We'd never choose it because it's expensive. We'd never choose it because it's, it's, it's complicated. But we primarily never choose it because the insurance company's role in this is fundamentally contrary to what our role should be as members of Congress. They have an incentive, not because they're bad people, but because it's what they do, to take money in exchange for offering the service of health care. But they're not providing any health care. Let me begin by making something very clear. We all have single-payer health care now. We have a single-payer health care, whether we have private insurance, whether we have Medicare, whether we have TRICARE through the VA. We take money, we give it to someone, and then we go visit doctors. We, some of us have a choice, but most of us really don't. Most of us who have health insurance through our, our businesses can't just go out and say, I want to choose another one. Most of us don't have a choice to shop around when we're sick to say, oh, I'll have my gallbladder removed some other time. I'm going to shop around a little bit first, or never mind my gallbladder, could you work on my liver a little bit? So in the mythology that there is a lot of choice that consumers have now is just that it's mythology. Under a single payer plan, the way it would be structured is you pay a payroll tax, then you choose a doctor, you go to the doctor, 
And from your payroll taxes or the taxes that you pay in other ways, they reimburse the doctor. That's it. To show you how it looks on a chart, this is it. Plain and simple. No 800 numbers, no problems with pre-existing pre conditions. This is it. And what's the benefit of this? Well, you take this of the $2.2 trillion that we pay, this $775 billion that goes to private insurance, of which about, say, $295 billion of it is profit and overhead, and it goes back to you, the taxpayer. It goes back to you, the patient. It goes back to you, the doctor. It goes back to you, the hospital. It doesn't go to the hospital. It doesn't go to the insurance company. That's it, plain and simple. Now, what can we do with, with $293 billion of profits or $775 billion a year? And that ignores something else. That ignores the fact that there's about $270 billion in out-of-pocket out of costs that we pay each year. Well, some people around here are saying, let's come up with a system where we take private insurance companies, we put a public option on top of it. Left and right have been saying the same thing about the public option. We need the public option to compete to drive down prices. That's what the left says. The right says, oh, we have to make sure we harness and make sure the public option isn't too strong because we're afraid, tight. so we're afraid that that public option will drive down prices too much. Both sides are saying the same thing in Lee, Gesundheit, and are saying the same thing. You got to get some kind of option over there. <laughs> They're saying the same thing. They're saying if you have a public option, people will choose it. Doesn't that tell you something? When my friends on, on the right say, oh, we can't make it too strong, they'll drive out the private plans. Aren't they saying that consumers are too dumb to make the correct choice? And when folks over here in the construction of this bill and my friends in the blue dog say, oh, we have to be careful. We can't have too strong a public plan because it might gobble up all of the business. What they're saying is that consumers would prefer a public plan, and they're right. Overwhelmingly, people, when they look at Medicare, say, you know what? That's a public plan that I like. That's a single-payer plan that I like. That's a government-run plan that I like. And overwhelmingly, the, the doctors and the hospitals say that they like dealing with them. Now, make no mistake, one of the concerns that I've heard raised about the public plan is they talk about the problems that Medicare has. No doubt about it. We have to fix them. But if Oxford Insurance, just to pick out one, has problems that we don't like, what do we do? Well, we have two options. We can get on an 800 number and complain, or we can buy shares of stock in that company and try to change the policies. If Medicare has problems, or a single payer plan has problems, you know what we do? We go to the government officials, or we go to Congress, and we say, we're going to change those rules. If you don't like the reimbursement rates, we're going to change them. If why we want to incentivize preventative care, that's what we're going to do. Now, why did this rise up this way? Why did we create this type of a system? Because we haven't acted. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, we're acting. This is as close as we have to starting from scratch as we're ever going to have. Why is it, I say, you know, consent for one additional minute. Why would we take this plan that is flawed and expensive and try to jerry-rig it on? And if I've heard one concern about this plan that we're voting on today, which is certainly better than the status quo, but not as good as a single-payer plan, people say, I'm confused. What does it mean? What are all these new things I'm, under, I'm learning about? Go home over the break, my colleagues, and say, you know what? We're going to provide you something like Medicare when you're 45, when you're 35, when you're 25, when you're 15, when you're born. And they're going to get it. They're going to understand it. And they're going to understand what it means because it makes sense, it's simple, it's cost effective, and it covers everyone. And with the money that we save, we're going to give people tax cuts, or we're going to get them better roads, or we're going to get them better, better and better research into coming up with cures for new diseases. We are no longer going to take hundreds of billions of dollars every single year and give it to insurance companies who do bupkis in return. They don't give me a checkup. They don't give me an operation. Gentlemen's instructed to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank. I, and your time has expired. I, I, I thank you. I, I, I urge a yes vote. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barton. The uh, minority uh, opposes the amendment and yields back the balance of its time. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Chair wishes to recognize for uh, 
additional comments, other members, but we hope they will not be as lengthy as uh, uh, comments by uh, Mr. Weiner. I'm going to yield uh, five minutes to Mr. Engel, but I would hope he would take just a short part of it and then yield to others who wish to speak on the subject. Mr. Th Engel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will take less time and, and yield to others. Uh, first of all, I am in strong support of this amendment. I want to commend Mr. Weiner. I think single payer makes the most sense for this country at a time when we are looking to change health care, at a time when we know that 47 million Americans are uninsured, at a time when we know what the health care system is broken, getting more and more expensive. The insurance companies are cherry picking. People can't get insurance. Uh, people like Medicare. Let's expand Medicare. <clears throat> I, to me, it's simple. I go to my senior citizens and I speak with them. They like Medicare. They're afraid that Medicare will be cut, but they like it as it is now. Uh, we know that this plan, we're talking about saving money, this plan will save money in the long run. It's cheaper, it's crisper. Why are we the only industrialized country uh, without single payer? People say, well, if you have single payer, you're going to have to ration care, you're going to have to have lines. It doesn't have to be that way at all. If we are building a, a structure from the bottom up, we can build it any way we like. We can take Medicare, we can expand Medicare, we can add things, we can take away things. We can do this. Uh, private insurance companies, frankly, have had their chance and they failed. And they failed because people are not happy and 47 million Americans are uninsured. You t talk about health care costs. How much of the health care costs go to administrative costs? 10 percent, 15 percent, it is as high as 30 percent. Imagine if we had it all under one unit and we would eliminate administrative costs. We could take that money and put it to real health care. Uh, well, we could take yield. that money and put it into helping people. Uh, this is what this amendment does. Again, when I go around in my district, senior citizens want this kind of thing. There well, was the a lady yield. in my district named Pearl Corn, and I hope she's listening today. She came to my office and started to talk to me about single payer and convinced me and convincing others. So well, the gentleman I think yields that, some of his time. I think that we have a very good chance to do this today, and we ought to do it. And I yield to Mr. Doyle. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, I, I want to also lend my support to this amendment. Uh, my congressional di district is the second oldest in the country, second only to Dade County, Florida. Florida. My people in the 14th congressional district of Pittsburgh understand Medicare and they love that program. If you ever tried to take Medicare away from the people in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you'd have a revolt that you wouldn't see anywhere else in the country. This is the best of both worlds. This retains a private delivery system that Americans want and, and have come to love, uh, combined with the administration that doesn't have a profit motive, that can do this for less administrative cost. It's a program people understand and support. Uh, I want to yield to uh, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you. Um, thank you for yielding. I am one of the members of this committee who believes strongly that a single-payer health system is the best way to comprehensively and fairly reform our health care system. And I am one of the many members who believe that health care ought to be a right for all, not simply a privilege enjoyed by those with means and access. Every American, every American deserves quality, affordable health care and private insurance simply has not delivered on this profit. As I mentioned last night, last year the average salary of a CEO of a top health insurance company was over $9 million, enough to provide health insurance to 648 families for an entire year. So I commend Mr. Weiner for putting single payer back on the table, and I thank you for working with me and many other well, members to make this, uh, to allow for this meaningful debate. Yield to Ms. Schakowsky. Listening to the uh, prior debates, you would think that the obligation of the Congress of the United States is to protect the insurance companies primarily. And if you look at the contortions that we've gone through in order to make sure that um, they have uh, mm -hmm. enough profit, um, I think the, the evidence is, uh, is, is abundant that somehow that seems to be the priority. But no, the goal is to provide every American, finally, after so many decades, with an opportunity to have affordable access to, to health care. The goal is not to just support an insurance industry that has brought us to a point where we live sicker, 
die younger, and pay twice as much as any other country. I want to thank Dr. Quentin Young, a, uh, my, my personal Young. physician for many years and a leader on this movement for uh, a single-payer health care system. We have an opportunity to do that. It is simple. We have seen, we don't have to imagine what a single-payer system looks like. It looks like Medicare, but better, because we have the kind of resources to make a strictly American kind of system that would provide everybody with health care. It's a shame that we would have to try everything else before we get to the kind of system that would really work. And I support it. And I would yield to, to, to Mr. Welch. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, I'd ask unanimous consent that we give two minutes to Mr. Welch and two minutes to Mr. Rush, and then we'll go. Well, I, we'll move on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my Republican colleagues as well. You know, I do believe that we're here with a common enterprise, and the goal is to do something very challenging: to change our health care system. And it's very simple to me what our goals are. We want a system where everybody's covered. In order to achieve that, everybody has to help pay. And each and every single one of us has a stake in making it and maintaining it as an affordable system. And what we have is a tale of two charts. We've got Mr. Gingrey's chart, and you know we like to criticize it, but it's a pretty complicated example of what our health care system is right now. And we have Mr. Weiner's chart. The, those of us who advocate for a single payer do so because we, it, we believe it can achieve simplicity, better value, health care for all, all of us having a stake in paying for it and making it affordable. But the bottom line here is that if we're going to make a choice about a health care future, individuals are going to continue to have the right to choose their doctor like they do under Medicaid and Medicare. They're going to have an opportunity to choose their hospital as they do under Medicare. And then the challenges that come up are going to have to be resolved by all of us here in Congress. And on Medicare, what we've seen is that Republicans and Democrats alike do every single thing within their power to make certain that our senior citizens have access to the health care that they do need. That's what would happen, I believe, if we had a single-payer system. I yield back. The uh, Chair would like to now yield uh, two minutes to Mr. Rush. Oh. Uh, Mr. Uh, Weiner, would you yield to me? Uh, I, I understand the points that you are making and our other colleagues on this very issue. And I've talked to Speaker Pelosi about it, and she has pledged to me that she will allow this issue to come to the House floor for a vote, uh, and that she expects that you will be offering this amendment in a different venue than this committee. And based on that fact, I request that you withdraw the amendment, and uh, we will look forward to what, a debate if, and a vote at another uh, place. Mr. Waxman, am I, am I to understand correctly that the Speaker has said that if I withdraw it here in this venue, I and my other colleagues will have an opportunity to present this before the entire House and the entire country for a debate, with the possibility being that this would be adopted as an alternative to the bill that we're going to pass out of this committee? I, I want to be very clear. Uh, the, the Speaker cannot uh, the Speaker has said that she will allow this to be brought up on the House floor and debated and voted on. That is, well, I, I gladly accept that, that offer uh, because <coughs> I think there should be an alternative to what is going to be coming out of this, and I think that this is the appropriate one. And if that is the pledge, then I gladly, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, ask as you have consent that the amendment be withdrawn and moved to the. I object, it's Chairman. Not, I object. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I object. Mr. Chairman. I know it's not a subject it, to a yeah, it, unanimous it, consent. The gentleman it doesn't require his unanimous amendment. consent. Any member can withdraw. The gentleman their amendment. withdraws his amendment. Who, who do I recognize next? Uh, uh, Ms. Bono Mac. Doctor. Well, we have a Dr. colloquy. Gingrey. <laughs> Dr. Gingrey, I think, is <laughs> ready. <laughs> Mr. Gingrey. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Will, the, will you inform the clerk which amendment it is so we can have it reported? Mr. Chairman, I believe the number on this is 45 uh, subscript 001, the amendment ensuring seniors access to affordable health care. Thank you. Good, Good job. job. Good okay, job. this was fun. That was great. It makes sense.
May report. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Gingrey of Georgia. Without objection, the amendment will be cons considered as read. The gentleman from uh, New Jersey reserves a point of order. And uh, we recognize Mr. Gingrey uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. Chairman, I hope all seniors across this country who are Medicare recipients are listening and watching these proceedings uh, and, and listen very carefully to the last amendment uh, by Mr. Weiner. This, uh, my amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, is addressing the fact that in our current Medicare system, we have an unfunded liability of $37 trillion by the year 2075. And yet, to fund this new program, to try to come up with the pay-fors, uh, what this bill does is cut $500 billion out of the current Medicare system that already has a $37 trillion unfunded liability. And I hope every senior uh, is listening very, very carefully. Mr. Chairman, this amendment would take all of that pay for, all of that $500 billion and put it back where it belongs. Put it into the Medicare system. Here are some of the things that we could do with that $500 billion rather than trying to create a whole new public plan Medicare for all. We could close the donut hole. We could provide better coverage under Part D, the prescription drug plan, something our Democratic colleagues have been screaming for uh, since December of 2003. We could do better than just a birthday physical when you become 65 and are automatically enrolled in the Medicare program. That's one physical. Why not a physical exam on an annual basis? Broader nursing home coverage, more than just 100 days. Lower deductibles, lower co-pays. How about catastrophic coverage? We don't have that under Medicare. And now we're taking away from 11 million, 11 million, 20 percent of, of Medicare recipients who choose Medicare Advantage. We're taking away from them dental care, vision care, here in AIDS, and all of a sudden they've got to pay that out of their own pocket at a time, Mr. Chairman, when their 401ks are probably off by at least 40 percent. My good friend from Vermont referenced my chart, that complicated chart that I held up the other day, and I think there's a picture of it in the Washington Post this morning, and he compared it to the simplified chart that uh, Mr. Weiner uh, showed us just a, a second ago uh, in regard to, to a single payer system. If I were artistic, I would hold up another chart of uh, Noah's Ark. Essentially what we're doing is we're saying, uh, Noah, load more people onto the ark, even though there, there are leaks in the ark. In fact, it's leaking like a sieve. And once you load it down with more people, indeed, maybe even 110 million more, pretty soon, Mr. Chairman, that ark is going to sink. And what Noah is going to do is he's going to start throwing people overboard. And I want to say to the seniors out there, guess who gets thrown overboard first? So Mr. Weiner's chart may be very simple, and you, you have heard many other members on the other side of the aisle uh, praise a single-payer system, but what it leads to is a sinking, slowly but surely sinking Noah's Ark. The only way it stays afloat is you start throwing people overboard. Uh, you ration their care. You deny coverage. You don't let them get that cancer therapy they need, just as they do in Great Britain and other countries, and your five-year survival rate on cancer goes down, whether it's breast or prostate. So, 
Mr. Chairman, this is a simple amendment. This just simply says, let's fix the system. We can do it. Let's not throw the senior out in this case, not the baby. Let's not throw the senior out with the bathwater. Let's protect our precious seniors. Let's restore Medicare. We can do it. We can restore a healthy insurance for all program in regard to the delivery. Uh, we can, we can uh, make our insurance companies uh, create high risk pools. We agree with all of that. So, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a simple amendment, as I say. Uh, I, my time is concluded. Let's do vote. And let's vote yes on this Mr. common Chairman. sense amendment. Mr. And Mr. I Chairman. Yield back. Has expired. Mr. Chairman. Oh, I Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope indeed that senior citizens and people with disabilities and all Medicare beneficiaries are listening right now. And I speak as the former director of the Illinois Council of, uh, State Council of Senior Citizens, and I admit a new Medicare beneficiary myself. Here are the facts. Much of the savings in Medicare is going right back to help Medicare beneficiaries, including eliminating cost sharing for preventive services, closing the donut hole, investing in a new delivery system in new delivery systems that will improve quality and affordability of care. But senior citizens and persons with disability, disabilities are going to benefit from many other portions of the bill. Let's listen to those. By lowering the cost of health care, we help address the rising cost of Medicare, and it has been estimated that this amendment will that 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 this will amendment will cost Medicare solvency by five to seven years. The bill will extend it. By improving nursing home transparency, we're improving the quality of care for seniors and persons with disabilities. By looking at ways to improve the value for treating Alzheimer patients, we're helping seniors and their families. By providing assistance so that early retirees can continue to receive health care until they're able to get into Medicare, we help them stay healthy and avoid having problems turn into costly issues that Medicare ends up paying for once they're eligible. Comparative effectiveness research and investments in public health are not just for the non-elderly, it's for everyone. But let's also be very clear, if we pass this amendment, it is not as if Mr. Gingrey has a plan for covering the uninsured, improving coverage for the poorly insured, or improving health care quality. If this amendment had a second part, a part to pay for other critical provisions of this bill, then others might be willing to consider it, consider it, but it doesn't. So this is a myth that the plan that we have produced, the good plan that we have produced, will be hurtful to Medicare beneficiaries, but I assure you that that is going to be one of the major lines of attack to frighten the elderly and persons with disabilities that somehow this is going to do damage to, to, uh, to them. Remember, the people who are supporting this bill are the people like uh, our Chairman Emeritus John Dingell, who was here and in the chair when Medicare went into effect and have supported it all these years and have been fighting off attacks on Medicare and, and uh, proposals that would diminish Medicare. We are the people who have protected that program. We continue to protect that program. Don't let anybody scare you. We will be there for you as we always have been. And I yield back. Mr. Generally to yield to Mr. Dingell. I will. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I say this with respect and affection for the author, but this is a bad amendment. By using some of the savings in Medicare to reduce the rate of health care growth costs about the system, we are in fact helping Medicare beneficiaries. The bill permits that. The amendment does not. Specifically, we can then find that the, the amendment will preclude us from extending the financial solvency of Medicare by another five to seven years based on efficiencies. Part of our expense expenditures here would make the whole country healthier so that as people reach the Medicare age, 
they're not as sick or as frail as they might otherwise be. We thus save more money and we help people. Remember, others are contributing to the cost of Medicare as well as the Medicare beneficiaries. And the, we are helping them in the time when they're in fact paying for the cost of these events. We want to make the whole country healthier. This is a fine amendment, but it is counterproductive. It's offered with good intention, but it has a bad effect by hurting Medicare re uh, beneficiaries and by seeing to it that we cannot make the whole country healthier as we might otherwise if the amendment is rejected. Uh, you're back. I would like to uh, yield to uh, the chairman of my subcommittee, uh, Congressman Rush from Chicago. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the general ladies uh, yielding to me. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman uh, and the other members, I want to just uh, add my voice of, of support and gratitude to the gentleman from New York for uh, his uh, amendment that he introduced and that he withdrew. I am a, uh, a signer on that amendment. And I do it for a, a lot of reasons. Uh, and I think that this amendment goes um, to the heart and the guts of what has been plaguing this nation for a, a long, long time now. And how to adequately provide uh, medical attention, medical uh, access, medical care to its most impoverished citizens and to all the citizens alike. Mr. Chairman, I am reminded of uh, how I first got involved in this business, the public service. And that was during the 60s. And uh, I remember so well uh, when we, along with uh, Dr. Eric uh, Cast, uh, Dr. Quinn Young, and some others organized uh, a health center, a free health center on the west side of the city of Chicago, where the only uh, provision that people needed to, uh, and the only requirement that they needed to have met in order to get uh, first class care out of this free health clinic was that they be sick. And it served as a, as a, as really a, a, a lifeboat uh, for those individuals taking care of their needs. Mr. Chairman, I am uh, opposed to this amendment that we are presently uh, uh, entertaining. But I also want to uh, just in uh, closing want to say to my friend uh, Dr. Gingry, you uh, use Noah's Ark as uh, as an example of what it. Uh, of a problem uh, that people face. Well, let me just tell you, uh, to me, a single player plan is indeed uh, a Noah's Ark, uh, but it's an inclusive Noah's Ark. It's a Noah's Ark uh, that certainly uh, the Creator has made. It's a Noah's Ark and that is meant to get people through uh, rough and tumultuous times, uh, through indeed through a flood. And, I'm tell and uh, I want to just uh, uh, let the gentleman know that since the Noah's Ark, most people have found themselves in a, in a, in a quandary, found themselves in a predicament whereby uh, they cannot escape from the flood of, of health care costs. And certainly this single payer plan that Mr. Weiner int uh, has introduced and withdrawn is the way to go. It. And I just can't wait until we look out the window when we get back and see the rainbow uh, that will come in as a result of, uh, of Mr. Weiner and uh, other activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the time has expired. Uh, since we've gone a little longer on our side, uh, Mr. Gingrey, do you want any more time? Are we ready to go to the vote? Mr. Chairman, we're ready to go to a vote. Okay. All those in favor of the Gingrey Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. No. Uh, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman, with that, I'd like a recorded vote. Okay, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush, Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo, Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak, Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel, Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, no. Ms. DeGette, Ms. DeGette, no. Mrs. Caps, 
Mrs. Capps, no. Mr. Mr. Doyle, no. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee, no. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross, Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, I. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space, Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley, Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch, Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Ms. Blackburn, Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry, Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise, Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Rodanovich. Mr. Rodanovich, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Blunt is not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? Clerk will tally the vote and announce it. Okay. 
Mrs. Christensen is not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Want to vote no? Vote no? Okay. Ms. Christensen votes no. Will the clerk announce the vote? Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the ayes were 23, the nays were 35. Uh, 23 ayes, 35 noes, the amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Braley, I want to recognize you for colloquy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask that you enter into a colloquy with Mr. Inslee and I to discuss the agreement reached last Thursday between you, Speaker Pelosi, Chairman Rangel, Chairman Miller, Representatives Becerra, Crowley, Schwartz, Kind, Inslee, McCollum, me, and others. The agreement is to, to include language in H.R. 3200 as it moves to the House floor to address, address geographic disparity in Medicare reimbursements and shift toward a Medicare payment system based on high-value care. The gentleman will yield. I, um, I was pleased that we were able to address many of your concerns with the Medicare payment structure. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, enter laughing. On stage I appreciate right. that, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the agreement we've come to, and this is Exhibit A, and with, you know, I ask unanimous consent to enter it into the record. Um, with uh, Speaker Pelosi's support, should take great strides to address the geographic inequity in Medicare, and moves toward a payment structure that reimburses for high-quality, low-cost care. Specifically, the language will mandate two studies by the Institute of Medicine. And I'll discuss, or discuss the first, which relates to geographic inequity in Medicare. Mr. Braley will discuss, this, discuss the second, which moves our Medicare payment structure towards rewarding high-value care. With respect to geographic inequity, the first IOM study will address the accuracy and efficacy of the factors that make up the various geographic adjusters in Medicare. Upon completion of the study, the Secretary will make the recommended adjustments and provide appropriate increases in reimbursements based on the adjustments from the Medicare Improvement Fund. After two years, a hold harmless provision expires, and the payments for all new adjustments will then be provided in a budget neutral way. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to put in the record Exhibit A incorporating that agreement. Without objection, that will be the order. Mr. Chairman, the second Institute of Medicine study will assess the best ways to shift our Medicare payment structure to one that reimburses for high value care. According to our agreement, the IOM study will be completed within two years and the recommendation submitted to the Secretary. The Secretary will then have 45 days to submit an implementation plan to Congress, and Congress will be faced with the options of a joint resolution of disapproval subject to presidential veto by the end of February 2012. If Congress does not pass a joint resolution of disapproval by the end of February 2012, then the implementation plan directly reflective of IOM's recommendations will be implemented by the Secretary. I thank the Chairman for your hard work to address our concerns in this area and for the inclusion of our agreed upon language in the House bill as it proceeds to the floor. Will the gentleman yield to me? I assure the gentleman that it's the uh, leadership's intention to add the agreed upon language as you have both described, you and Mr. Inslee, to H.R. 3200 before the bill reaches the House floor, this agreement will provide us with a fair, unbiased assessment of, the, of, the, um, of how uh, to best proceed towards a Medicare reimbursement structure that pays for high-value care and addresses some of the issues of geographic inequ inequity in Medicare. And I thank both of you for your efforts, and it is leadership's intention to make sure this language is added in the House bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Ross for Mr. purposes of an amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Chairman, I reserve point of order. Yes. Clerk uh, will report the amendment, and Mr. Deal reserves a point of order. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Arkansas is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm pleased to, to offer this omnibus amendment, which reflects concerns that some of my colleagues and I had when we first began this markup. And, and um, it's a, a product uh, 
uh, and a result of about two weeks of uh, uh, intense negotiations where there was a lot of give and take. And specifically, this amendment would make sure that small businesses remain open while ensuring affordable health insurance to their employees as well as to those small business owners. Uh, ensures that the public option competes with the other qualified health benefit plans on a, on a level playing field and clarifies that physicians uh, will make it their choice to op opt out or into uh, the public plan. It makes sure that providers who accept the public option are paid at negotiated rates and are not tied to any other governmental plan. Uh, clarifies that no one will be forced to enroll in the public option and that all who enroll in the health insurance exchange are free to choose the public, public option or a private health insurance plan of their choice. It ensures that agents and brokers are allowed to sell health insurance plans. Uh, enumerations that states have the option to create their own cooperative type health insurance plan to provide consumers even more choices clarifies that existing state insurance exchanges are allowed to continue operating, requires states to maintain a share of the cost in ensuring their Medicaid populations while ensuring that federal Medicaid dollars are being used in a quality and efficient way, implements innovative delivery reforms to bend the cost curve, including the creation of a new innovative payment center to speed up comprehensive testing of new payment models ensures that all Americans are provided with clear, straightforward guidelines regarding their options for advanced directives, finds additional savings within our current public programs, and ensures we get more value for every health care dollar we spend. Mr. Chairman, we have an historic opportunity to transform our health care system into one that meets the needs of all Americans. We cannot pass up this moment without fundamentally Mr. Chairman, the committee is not in order. The gentleman from Arkansas deserves to be heard. Mr. Barton is correct. The committee is not in order. Mr. Ross, continue. We cannot pass up this moment without fundamentally changing the incentives in our system to reward high quality, efficient health care. I was pleased that we were able to come to an agreement. I appreciate my colleagues' work on this amendment and, and look forward to working with the chairman and others on ensuring these and other provisions are included as the bill makes its way uh, to the floor. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would ask for a yes vote on this uh, little old non-controversial amendment that I've got here. <laughs> so, gentlemen, yield to uh, – gentleman still has two minutes, is it? Any other member? Uh, Gentlemen, yield. Gentleman from Ohio. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space. Thank you. I first want to thank uh, my friend from Arkansas, uh, Mike Ross, along with my uh, colleagues Baron Hill, Bart Gordon, Jim Matheson, John Barrow, and Charlie Melanson uh, for working so diligently over the last couple of weeks in a sincere effort to make this bill better. Uh, we believe that's what this amendment does, and it does a lot of things, and I, I don't have the time to detail all of them, but I, but I want to uh, focus my remarks today on just a couple uh, portions that I think this, make this bill a lot better. Uh, one uh, of those areas is with respect to the reimbursement of the public plan. Uh, the original bill uh, tied that reimbursement to Medicare rates. And while that may sound good, in rural America, certainly in rural Ohio, that will not work. Uh, our hospitals back in southeastern Ohio are very ge small generally, and they have an inordinate number of Medicaid and Medicare recipients, anywhere from 65 percent to 75 percent of everybody that walks in the front door of these hospitals is either on Medicaid or Medicare. They're losing money on those patients. They're only making their profit margins on that very narrow group of, of patients who are privately insured. By tying the reimbursement rate to Medicare, it's ensuring or almost ensuring that many of those hospitals will go out of business. Not only would that be disastrous to the quality of care delivered in rural America, because that's our primary interface with the health care system, it would be a financial and economic disaster as well. Uh, these hospitals usually employ more people than any other uh, organization in the counties that they're located. They are economic engines that these areas depend upon. This uh, change in the legislation as incorporated in the amendment will help these small rural hospitals survive. 
Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Barton. I recognize I, for five minutes. Before I speak, I want to make sure that I've got the right amendment. Is the amendment that is being considered Blue Dog 3 that was noticed at 3.34 p.m.? Is that the amendment? I believe so, but I'd ask the clerk to make sure. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Yes. All right. Then, Mr. Chairman, I make a point of order. You know, I want to insist on the point of order that the amendment is not germane. Gentleman is uh, reserved a point of order. May I speak on the point of order? Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, we have been advised by the Office of the Parliamentarian that the health care coverage of members of Congress is, and I quote, not within the jurisdiction of the Committee on Commerce. End quote. Section 230 of this amendment on page 29 is a sense of the committee that members of Congress should have the option to enroll in the public health insurance option. The parliamentarian office has been very consistent and the chairman has been very consistent in the application of the parliamentarian's advice and has advised us on numerous occasions several times during this markup that the germane this here is not affected by merely mentioning health care coverage of members of Congress. Accordingly, I make a point of order that the amendment before us right now is not germane. Uh, I believe the gentleman is correct, and I would ask uh, the gentleman from Arkansas to, uh, to strike or to remove that part, unanimous consent to remove that Mr. part. Chairman, I will object to unanimous consent request. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I be heard on the point of order? I mean, on the, on the, uh, on the point of order? Yes. Is of Congress. Page 29. Committee. Section 230. Sense of committee regarding is this, enrollment. Is it, I, I, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, isn't it, isn't it true that something that is not binding on the law, such as a whereas clause or a sense of, a sense of Congress, is not what governs the parliamentary trigger? It's got to be the part that changes the law. The pa House parliamentarian is available right now. If uh, the if gentleman from Arkansas wishes to withdraw the amendment and the chair wishes to check with the House parliamentarian, I am absolutely certain that they will as state as I have stated. The amendment as it is currently before this committee is not germane. I don't uh, disagree with the gentleman, but I would just like if we could just pause for one minute. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Arkansas has a unanimous consent request. I object. Mr. Chairman, uh, at the urging of the ranking member of this committee that uh, the section be removed that, that states it is the sense of the Committee on Energy and Commerce of the U.S. House of Representatives that members of Congress should have the option to enroll in the public health insurance option. It's clear we want that language in the amendment. That's why it's included in there at this time. But at the urging of the ranking member that members of Congress not be included, I would ask unanimous consent to strike page 29, section 230, uh, which simply all, we'll make this real easy. Everyone's got to copy the amendment. All you got to do is go to the last page and do that, and then do that. And, uh, I, and I that's can, what we would ask to be done, Mr. Chairman. Believe it or not, we're taught to read in Texas. I can read. I still object to the unanimous consent request. We've played this germaneness game in this entire markup, this is probably the most important uh, amendment. It's not my fault that it was drafted to be non-germane, but it is non-germane. So I'm going to insist on the point of order. Gentlemen, yield to me. And, and, and uh, uh, I'll be happy to yield to the chairman. The last time there was a germaneness issue, the gentleman came back after he realized that we uh, uh, were following the parliamentary parliamentarian's instructions correctly. And we agreed to a unanimous consent and request to strike the part that was not germane. I, I would hope the gentleman would give the same courtesy uh, to Mr. Uh, in, in almost any other uh, case, I would, but not in this case. With this bill being as big as it is and this amendment being as important as it is, uh, I simply am, have to insist on the point of order and that the rules are the rules. Mm 
Gentleman from Arkansas withdraws his, uh, his amendment. Gentleman will withdraw his amendment. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if everybody wants to be here another three or four hours, I'll withdraw my amendment. We'll start again. We'll file it again. Mr. Doyle, do you have an in block amendment ready to go? Uh, I'd like to call up uh, the following amendments in block. Uh, Doyle, Dill, Engel, Doyle 2 on autism, Eshu 1, 0, 0, 1, Schakowsky 7, 0, 0, 1, Sarbanes 5, 0, 0, 1, Green 9, 0, 0, 1, Waxman Division C funding 0, 0, 2, Waxman Division C funding 0, 0, 4, Gordon 13, Gordon 7, 0, 0, 1, Gordon 6, 0, 0, 1, Castor 10, 0, 0, 1, Ross 3, 0, 0, 1, DeGette 5, 0, 0, 1, Gonzalez 3, 0, 0, 1, Gordon 2, 0, 0, 1, and Inslee ACO 0, 0, 1. Well, I got some you can throw in there. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, I've got to recognize Inslee, and then I'll, when he yields back, I'll recognize that. Mr. Doyle, have you completed the presentation of your? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. With uh, the the. The gentleman from Pennsylvania requested that all of those amendments that he mentioned be considered in block. No objection. Without objection, the reading of all of those amendments will be dispensed with. And as I understand it, they're non-controversial. So if anyone, uh, if, so therefore, let's proceed to a vote. Is this, I just want to make this the, the list that we have agreed to. I'm assuming that it's. Yes, list. it is. Then we have no objection and we support them. Let's proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the end block amendment will say aye, aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment's agreed to. Who comes next on your side? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think there is a Barton transparency amendment. Mr. Barton, you have an amendment at the desk. I do, sir. Mr. Ross and others, <laughs> yeah, <maybe> Mr. Pallone <laughs> reserves a point of order just in case. Yeah, I think that's Mr. fair. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's fair. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in, to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Mr. Barton and Mr. Stupak. Mr. Chairman, at I'm the end ask. of Division C, add the following new title. Title. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Well, I thank the gentleman, and um, I want to thank Mr. Stupak for uh, co-sponsoring this amendment with me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the House, the House, the uh, committee is not in order. The gentleman is correct. The committee will please come to order. The gentleman from Texas is entitled to be heard. Thank you, and I, I'll try to be brief. Um, regardless of how we feel about the specifics of what kind of a health reform package this committee and this Congress should adopt, uh, we should all be united uh, that we need more transparency uh, in the health field. Uh, this amendment uh, is a very strong transparency amendment. It would establish a health care information transparency office in the Department of Health and Human Services. 
That uh, commission would be composed of five commissioners appointed by the President with the advice and the consent of the Senate. Uh, this commission would have the authority to, uh, to get information on health care pricing, health care quality, health care outcomes, and make it available uh, to the health care uh, user community uh, in an open and transparent, easily accessible fashion. Uh, if we have more transparency uh, in, the, uh, in the quality indexes, in the indexes of outcomes, in the pricing, in all these different areas, uh, obviously, regardless of which kind of a health care plan uh, each member of this committee uh, chooses to support, uh, more transparency and uh, accountability is a good thing. So I'm, I have worked uh, very hard on this amendment with a number of people. Uh, Mr. Stupak, uh, Mr. Green, among others, on the uh, minority on the majority side, and uh, I would hope that the committee would uh, would adopt it. I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Stupak. Okay. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Just quickly, uh, I think you've explained the amendment well. We want transparency. Transparency will help patients. It will also help uh, medical providers provide the best information available to their patients, not just only to the price, but also quality of the product they're purchasing. This is a critically important, especially as we deal with the public option. Uh, you're asking them to make uh, decisions for their own health care, and we're giving them the information so they can make informed decisions as not only just cost, but also the quality. And uh, myself, Mr. Green, and I know others had transparency uh, amendments, but this one is probably about the most comprehensive, and I'm, I'm proud to co-sponsor it with uh, Mr. Barton and yield back. Uh, I yield to uh, Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, Joe, I want you to, I'm, I'll get my own time, but we have tried to work this out and working earlier with the original text with uh, our Texas colleague, Congressman Burgess, um, but this is not an amendment I can support, and I'll get time in a few minutes, so I'll let you keep your time now. I just want to make sure this is not an amendment that, uh, that, that I can support. I was, we, have, I was, we have an alternative that will be coming up shortly. Okay. I was told that you did support this. Uh, seeing no other hands raised, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields back his time. Uh, Mr. Green, do you want to be recognized on this amendment? I'd like to be recognized in opposition. Gentlemen's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I have great respect for my fellow Texan, uh, Joe Barton, and I'm dismayed. Discussions halted on the amendment, and we were unable to reach an agreement on the Barton Amendment and the Green Amendment that we've been working on. Again, I worked with uh, our Texas colleague, Congressman Burgess, earlier. Uh, but I will have an amendment uh, shortly if this fails. I think we all agree that this committee wants to provide reliable health care information to help consumers make decisions about their care. However, the Barton uh, Amendment would create a new federal agency, the Health Care Transparency Office with Security and Exchange Commission subpoena powers to demand any type of information from doctors and hospitals. That's not what we need. Under this proposal, the HHS Secretary could not intervene in any manner before the Commission, could not prevent the delay of the issuance of any rule made by the Commission. The Commission would also have litigating powers independent of the Attorney General. Many of the duties out of outlined in the Barton Amendment uh, or duties are already being performed by a range of other entities, both federal and like CMS and also on the state level. More than half the states are working to provide consumer-friendly hospital price information. In fact, 34 states already require hospitals to report information on hospital charges or payment rates and make that data available to the public. An additional seven states have voluntary efforts. Our amendment that will be up shortly if this fails would build on this existing structure and also require insurers to participate in the disclosure process by providing information on estimated out-of-pocket costs for health care services. The real test of pricing information is what is more, most helpful to consumers. Most consumers have health insurance. What they want to know is how much their insurance requires them to pay. Consumers need insurance to provide real-time information, whether either via the uh, phone or online explanation of benefits, and that tells what their insurance company will pay and what their individual co-payment will be. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time and ask for a no vote on the Barton Amendment. A uh, gentleman yield to me. I had to, Mr. I, uh, I, I just want to join you in urging that we uh, look for your alternative rather than this one. Uh, the Barton Amendment uh, was offered and withdrew, withdrawn when we first began the markup on H.R. 3200. And our staffs have worked to bridge the differences 
over the last week and a half, and unfortunately it seems a compromise could not be reached. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Barton's integrity in staying firm with what he believes to be the best way to get information to consumers of health care, but I respectfully disagree with the outcome. Uh, I think we uh, have a better alternative, a narrower alternative, and one that uh, will not draw some of the opposition to the bill that uh, Mr. Barton amendment uh, would do. So would, I also would, would urge the amendment. Uh, would either, would, would, would uh, the gentleman. I'm glad to yield to my friend from North Texas. What is the, uh, what is the primary objection to the Barton Stupak amendment as you know it? The creation of that new federal commission and actually the subpoena powers, it's outside of our current HHS secretary, but also there's a lot of state examples of what can be done on, on, uh, on transparency that this would almost reinvent the wheel do, compared to what we have so many states. And I want to build on what the does, states Does do. the gentleman from Texas and the gentleman from California object to the collection of pricing information? No. That's not the issue. I, this creates, and it's interesting, Joe, I'm arguing against creating a bureaucracy. I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican. But you create this uh, transparency office with literary securities and exchange subpoena power. I think you will, we will generate a lot more opposition to, this, to the legislation if your amendment's adopted. But is, 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 is your opposition and Chairman Waxman's opposition just to the organizational structure? It's not to... It's not to the types of information. Will the gentleman yield to me? See, I'm, if, if, if we're fighting I'll, over I'll, how to... I'll yield people. to the chairman. Well, we've had discussions at the staff level, and we've argued that your amendment is too broad. For example, it gives too much authority to collect data that does not protect the privacy, privacy of individuals and shares that data with researchers. It would allow the government to collect and share with others all claims data Everybody. for private insurers. It can increase the cost of health care as providers learn the reimbursement rates of other providers. Uh, this is a phenomenon that the CBO and other economists discussed. Uh, so there are a number of, of uh, concerns that we have about it. Uh, we try to reach a, uh, an agreement to, re to narrow your amendment, and we have not been able to do so well, I'm as, not, as I, much look, as we would have liked to. Uh, we, st we cannot support it. Okay. If uh, well, the time has expired, so... Uh, Let's proceed to a uh, vote. Could I you, have one minute to wrap up? Without objection, gentlemen's recognized. Okay, I'm trying to, you know, this is... Our, our staffs do such a wonderful job, and they do, in all honesty, probably 95% of the real work. But listening to the objections that have just, at some point in time, we could find a compromise on structure, I think. And, I'm, and on privacy, nobody's a stronger privacy advocate than Mr. Markey and myself. What I was told the objection was that there was an objection to collecting pricing information. And I, I can't agree to compromise the ability to get pricing. In, you have to have pricing information to let the consumer and the marketplace know um, how to make the appropriate health care decision. So Mr. with that... Chairman, gentlemen, yield. Yeah, I'll be happy. Joe, I think maybe we've had so much on our plate for the last two weeks, we haven't been able to. I know you and I have talked past it a lot of times because we depend on staff. I think the objection is how you create that agency and not well, we, necessarily we'll continue some of the dialogue. information we need to get. So, But I'll, I will have an amendment right after this, I hope, if the chairman will recognize me. I think Mr. Deal wants his own time. Uh, well, we were going to proceed to the vote, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Barton asked for an additional minute. Do you want an additional one minute? Well, I just want to know that uh, apparently I know we've worked hard on this because this is an issue I've been talking about in this committee for years, yes. and uh, here we are with the last opportunity, in my opinion, for us to have a transparency amendment inserted into this bill, and I'm not so sure that we're not throwing it out the window with this uh, amendment being rejected, and I have not heard any, quite frankly, very detailed explanation as to why we are rejecting this approach. Gen gentlemen, yield. Mr. Green yes. will have one. Should this one be defeated? <laughs> okay. 
All those in favor of the Barton Amendment will say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. Mr. Chairman, can I, I have a show of hands on that? Okay. All those in favor of the Barton Amendment, please raise your hand and the clerk will count the one hand per person. <laughs> You got one over there, don't? Did you notice there was one over there? There's one over here too. I want all the hands counted. All those opposed to the amendment, please raise your hand. Uh. <laughs> I hope the clerk noticed everybody. The clerk will announce the um, tally. Mr. Chairman, on the division vote, there were 18 ayes and 28 noes. 18 ayes, 28 noes. The amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Ross, you seek recognition for an amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. We want to reserve a point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Texas reserves a point of order. Amendment. In the nature, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 32. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Arkansas recognized to explain his amendment. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, 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 this is the this is the same amendment that I uh, uh, described earlier, less one page, and I might add to you that uh, I'm very disappointed that uh, the minority uh, would not want to require uh, members of Congress to same, have the same option as, as the American people will. Uh, there's been a lot of rhetoric over this public uh, health care option, and maybe this is an opportunity to set the record straight. Uh, the public uh, health care option is just that, an option. It gives consumers more choices and does not require a single American citizen to select this option unless he or she chooses to. And all we were attempting to do is to give members of Congress the same option that every American citizen will have that qualifies for the public option plan, and that is the opportunity to opt into it if they so desire, the same opportunity that will be afforded to many American citizens. So it's with sadness uh, that members of Congress will not have this option at the, at the insistence of the minority. But other than that, everything's in this amendment that was in the amendment two amendments ago. And uh, I'd ask for a, once again, I'd ask for a yes vote on this little old non-controversial amendment, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Yield. I will yield to the gentleman from Indiana. I uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. I've been asked to speak about uh, the language that, that addresses advanced directives or living wills in this bill. Um, we all believe it's an appropriate way for individuals to make choices for themselves. Far, many, far too many times loved ones are left to guess as to what their relative would have wanted. Advanced directives are one way to ensure that everyone's personal wishes are carried out by medical personnel. This provision would direct all qualified health benefit plans to provide information on advanced directives to all individuals seeking enrollment in their plan. A person can then choose whether or not to establish an advanced directive for themselves so they have choice. Uh, it's not forced upon them. Uh, the provision also clearly states that we are not promoting suicide, assisted suicide, or the intentional hastening of death. Um, members of the committee, uh, this is always a very difficult thing to talk about, the end of our lives. And um, I, just about every state that I know, I think all the states, uh, have living will legislation. This is one where a person uh, can, before he nears death, can sign up for one of the insurance policies or the uh, government plan and either say yes or no to a uh, living will or advanced directive. Uh, choice is here. Uh, these are also all, always difficult decisions, but this is a very important component of uh, the agreement that we worked out, and I thank uh, uh, everybody for working very hard on this, and I'll yield back to the, to the gentleman. 
Mr. Ross, you. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, uh, yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space. I thank my friend from Arkansas. Uh, this, this amendment does a lot of things. Uh, it helps uh, bring costs down. It provides assurances that many of the same uh, programs that this bill applies to Medicare, these pilot programs that are designed uh, to save billions of dollars over the course of this, in the lifetime of this bill, those, some of those same programs are now being applied to Medicaid. Uh, I think most of us in this room recognize that Medicaid uh, has been improperly managed uh, for many, many years, and it has served as a, a, a sieve, as my friend from Georgia uh, used uh, an analogy earlier. Uh, this, one of the things this bill does is it directs a study so that we can determine once and for all whether the formula that determines the FMAP federal contribution under the Federal Medicaid Assistance Program is fair and equitable to all states. Right now there is a lot of question as to whether or not that FMAP formula is, is fair to an Ohio or, or fair to a California. Uh, this bill or this amendment contains specific language designed to identify the problems associated with the current formula uh, and fix them. Uh, this bill is designed to, to control the cost curve, something that all of us recognize as a major problem. One of the compelling reasons why we need to fix health care, not only is it right in terms of providing a better standard of, uh, of care and a quality of life for the people we represent, our country can no longer sustain this cost curve. This amendment is designed to help control that cost curve. Uh, I urge all of my colleagues to look at this very closely and vote yes on this amendment. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has Chairman, expired. I Mr. Have, Barton. I have several questions for uh, counsel uh, and, and the chairman. The first, gentleman's recognized for five minutes. The first is this appears to be the same amendment. They just took the last page off. Has, has this been at the desk without the last page for two hours? I don't believe so. And then it wouldn't comply with your rule. But my second question, if we get beyond that, there, the, the amendment as it's currently drafted is replete with brackets, which usually a bracket is a work in process and is to be inserted later. In this case, you have brackets, and then you do have text that appears to comply with the bracket until you get to page 28, where you have a bracket sense of Congress on a congressional option, but then there's nothing that re replies to that. I mean, how can we have, I understand that this has been, been worked on feverishly uh, for several days, but it is about to go into one of the most important bills that this Congress is going to consider. I would hope that we could at least get a, an amendment at the desk that, number one, complies with the Chairman's request that all amendments be in place for two hours, and number two, is drafted in a way that complies with the normal uh, drafting requirements for amendments to be considered by, by this committee. So I would ask the Council about these various brackets in this amendment. Mr. Barton, the bracketed language or simply refers to titles they would not go into the final legislation. Well, why are they in the amendment then? Why do you have a bracket that refers to a title that's not in the bill? They're, they're just for descriptive pur purposes so we, we can track our way through the amendment. But they would not go into the final legislation. Well, why, why do the brackets in most cases actually refer to what's in the bill but the last bracket doesn't? Is that normal drafting procedure? I've never seen it before. I've been on this committee 25 years. I've never seen a, an amendment drafted like this. Uh, again, that language would not be reflected in the final bill. You have a, you have a legislative council behind you. So, or, I mean, this, this is the most important amendment in this markup. It's not complying with the two-hour requirement. It's not drafted in a way that every other amendment has been drafted. You know, if we want to take a recess, get it right, bring it forward, have the debate on the substance, let's do it. Gen Mr. Grossman? Sure. Um, Legislative Council? 
because of the length and complexity and the number of elements in this, it was felt that it would be helpful to the members to have a distinction among the different components of this particular amendment. And therefore, we had decided as a matter of helping the members to identify the specific elements to put in well, How does it help the members to have a bracket for something that's not currently in the amendment? How does that help us? For, for the last provision, it would have been helpful if there weren't a point of order raised on that last provision. So why wasn't the amendment redrafted properly, put at the desk for the proper time, and then considered under the proper rules that the chairman has requested this markup be conducted I'm under? Uh, gentlemen, yield to me. I'll be happy to yield to my Legislative friend. Council drafts the, 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 the bills that we consider. And this is the draft of the bill that we received from Legislative Council. As far as the two hours are concerned, that has been a rule that uh, the chair has used for purposes of recognition. So members would have an amendment available so they'd know what's coming up. This amendment has been available for uh, uh, in excess of two hours. Members have known what the amendment was going to be. Uh, a minor change has been uh, 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 made to the amendment because of the uh, uh, non-germane section. Uh, we've allowed other amendments that have been available for two hours or more to have some uh, minor changes made to them. And I see no reason uh, why I shouldn't recognize, as I have. Well, uh, you're violating Mr. your own Ross. rules, Mr. Chairman. Well, my, are rules are, are my rules are for my recognition of members to make sure that all of our colleagues have the benefit of what the proposal is going to be. And I can't see that anyone could argue they did not know that this amendment was going to be considered. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think it's disingenuous for you to put a rule into place. I didn't put the rule into place. The history of this committee has been members could offer amendments at any time. I think there is some value in your two-hour rule. But if you're going to have it, it should, it should be effective for every amendment, for every member, regardless of their majority or minority status. I understand the frustration. I understand how difficult this process has been. I respect what the authors of this amendment have, are attempting to do. I commend them for it. But on something this important, I think it is fair for the minority to insist on proper order. If you choose to overrule that, you're overruling your own order that you have insisted upon throughout this markup. I disagree with the gentleman. The amendment is before us. Does any member seek recognition to speak in opposition to the amendment? If not, I will, I'll, I'll take some time. Okay. In opposition to the amendment, um, the um, the amendment. I'll ask counsel. The amendment does not do anything to impact the public plan. Is that right? That, that's not correct, sir. It, the, the amendment impacts the public plan and how it pays providers. It, it changes the underlying bill and changes that so that it negotiates with providers instead of using Medicare rates. And is that similar to the amendment that the committee rejected yesterday that would have done that same thing? There was an amendment yesterday that the, you couldn't use the Medicare rates as a negotiating tool. You had to negotiate independently that the committee rejected. Is that similar? I, I, I believe the thrust of the amendment is, is similar, sir. And that, that is in here in a way that requires the public plan to negotiate its rates totally separate from Medicare? The, the, the uh, amendment provides that it negotiates no, rates no. with an upper ceiling of the average of the payment rates of health plans in the community and a lower ceiling of the average of the Medicare rates what the amendment provides. It would do, what, what was that last statement, sir? It, it, the, the amendment provides for negotiated rates um, with an upper ceiling of the average of, of the private sector payment rates in that area and a lower uh, bound of the average of the Medicare rates in that community. And does this amendment, which I haven't had time to look at until we had it handed to us, does it deal with any, uh, any penalties on employers? Is that is anything like that in this amendment? If you don't, if you don't provide insurance, are there penalties on employers here? Is that going to? Uh, no, sir. Not in this amendment. Uh, any of my colleagues seek time on this, uh, Mr. Deal? Uh, on the same issue, 
as I read the negotiation of rates, the, the minimum would be the average Medicare reimbursement rate. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So if they negotiate the minimum, then that would be what the original underlying bill called for in the first place. If, if, if the secretary w ended up at that place, that would, that would end up at the, at the lower level, yes. So that's, the, that's not what the, the negotiation just provides for that at the lower bound. Um, she can go up to the, the negotiating rates at the average of the private rates in that community. But there is no assurance that the secretary wouldn't just pick the lower rate and, and say that's where this public option plan would reimburse at. Is that it would nothing to prevent that. that? There's no assurance that she would try to do that. The, the question would be, of course, whether providers would accept that rate. And there's no assurance she would not either, is there? No, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you very much. Um, this amendment is, I think, particularly important because over the past few weeks, the American people have been totally focused on the changes that were going to be advocated by the Blue Dogs uh, in the U.S. Congress. And I think uh, everyone has been asking what, what was the uh, agreement made uh, between the leaders of the Democratic Party and the Blue Dogs. And in this amendment, I think all of the changes or the agreement must be set out in this agreement. And I may be wrong, but it seems to me that there's not any major significant changes in this agreement. Now, I know that they changed the levels of the, um, the small business revenue, revenues before you, had, uh, you uh, tax the rate. I mean, the, the rate is still 8 percent above $750,000. Uh, I don't think there's anything in here about the penalty for anyone who does not buy insurance under the mandate. There are some studies in here, as Mr. Space talked about, regarding the state government's uh, reimbursement uh, under Medicaid and a study on that and some other studies. But I think the American people uh, are, were really looking forward to this amendment and were expecting some major changes. Now, well, gentlemen, I, yield. I, 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 let me just make one. My, other my time. And I would just. Time. I would just say. I, I know this has been there for uh, two hours or so. We've not had an opportunity to look at it thoroughly, but I'm just expressing my my personal view. We have great respect for the Blue Dogs. We have great respect for every member. But I think the American people were looking for more in a significant change of this legislation than what this amendment represents. Without objection, I'd like to give the gentleman from Missouri an additional minute. I'd like to give time to Mr. Rogers. And if we have time, Mr. Gangry, but we'll see. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess I'm, I'm also very, very disappointed. I thought my friends in the Blue Dogs had a great opportunity to turn this thing back into something that the American people could embrace. Um, but, and I think it is an important amendment, not for what's in it, but for what's not in it. There are some good things in here. But there still is a federally government-run plan, a federally government-mandated uh, exchange. A hundred million people through Section 102 are going to lose their coverage. Eleven million Medicare Advantage uh, senior citizens are going to lose their coverage. Eight million people who have HSAs are going to lose their coverage. Forty-eight boards, commissions uh, and programs new in this bill. It is confusing and, I have to say, very, very disappointing. As a matter of fact, the only thing I think happened here uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is you allowed the blue dogs in and you, got, you allowed them to pick the color of the lipstick that's going on this pig. That's about all you got. Pretty disappointing. And I, uh, I'll, I'll yield back to the chairman. I, again, I, I, wish I wish you'd have really hung in there, sir. I think you could have made a huge difference for the American people. Time has expired. We'll now proceed to a vote on the amendment by the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Ross. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Mr. Chairman. The yep. ayes have it. Like a roll call vote. Call vote. A roll call vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. 
Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, aye. Mr. Mr. Rush. Miss Miss Eshoo. Miss Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Yes. Mr. Green, aye. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget, aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen, Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space, Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton, Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley, Mr. Braley, I, Mr. Welsh, Mr. Welsh, Welch, I, Mr. Barton, Mr. Barton, no, Mr. Hall, Mr. Hall, no, Mr. Upton, Mr. Upton, no, Mr. Stearns, Mr. Stearns, no, Mr. Deal, Mr. Deal, no, Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, no, Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts, no. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bonomack, no. Ms. Bonomack, no. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick, Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, no. Mrs. Ms. Blackburn, Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Ging Gingry, Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes aye. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, is a, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? Clerk will tally the vote. Clerk ready to announce the vote? Yes, sir. 
Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 33 ayes and 26 noes. 33 ayes, 26 noes, the amendments agreed to. Mr. Shimkus, you have an amendment at the desk. I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It is um, um, e ELR 017001. It's the only Shimkus one that's filed. It is a um, religious non discrimination amendment. Without a, did the clerk report the amendment? Not yet, not yet, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. I'm ready. It's an amendment offered by Mr. Shimkus of Illinois. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be real quick. Uh, this is to uh, hopefully ensure that there's uh, non-discrimination uh, in any health insurance exchange against patients for religious reasons who use spiritual care. Uh, there sh should be no additional cost to the bill, and it's already provisions already found in Medicare and Medicaid, um, uh, several uh, federal employee health benefit option plans. I know there's other members that would like to speak on the bill, and I'd like to yield my time to them. Uh, first, I'd like to go to my colleague from Louisiana, Mr. M Mellon Song. Thank you, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I just want to support, uh, say that I support this bipartisan amendment and encourage my colleagues to do so as well. I think it's important to clarify there is no discrimination in the exchange against patients who choose to use spiritual care. Uh, it's my understanding that something comparable was included in the Senate Health Bill as well, and I'd like to thank the Chairman and Mr. Shimkus, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, now I'd like to yield to Mr. Blunt from Missouri. I thank the gentleman for bringing the amendment. He and I have talked about it. I, I thank him for offering it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a topic that you and I have talked about. Uh, it affects a number of religious groups. Uh, particularly in our state. Uh, there's a significant element of the Christian science uh, view of health care, uh, and this amendment we think would take care of them and others uh, and is um, patterned after amendments that are part of current health care plans uh, as well as current, uh, current benefit plans, and I'm uh, pleased to have the amendment uh, offered. I hope it's approved, and I thank my friend from Illinois for offering the amendment. Thank you. And I'd now like to yield to the Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Dingle. Native American shamans. I thank my friend for yielding to me. I uh, am happy to support this amendment and commend him for offering it. Uh, the amendment assures Americans who, for reasons of religious beliefs, rely on spiritual care for their health care and to assure that they will not be excluded from universal access to health care of their choice. This legislation does not create a new precedent. It is it affords coverage for spiritual care and such is included in Medicare and Medicaid as well as TRICARE, the federal employee health benefit plans and state employee plans across the country. It is also a medical care deduction under Section 213D of the Internal Revenue Code. I can remember my dad talking about this when he was on Ways and Means Committee and it was a regularly accepted exception which was made available to persons who uh, believed that this was the way that their health care and their religion should come together. The amendment does not mandate coverage for any particular health condition or benefit. It does not interfere with the Secretary's prerogative to determine which patient conditions will be included in minimal qualifying coverage. I support the amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Now I'd like to yield to my colleague from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shimkus. I, I want to add my support to this amendment and say that for me, um, in addition to knowing of many constituents who are concerned about the addition of these protections in the bill, um, that I was inspired to support this also through a personal friend. When I was first elected to the state legislature, there, legislature in Wisconsin, somebody who preceded me who served on the other side of the aisle was somebody who ultimately became a, a role model, a young woman legislator um, who was a, a, a Christian scientist. And over the years, she's given me a, a course, a quick study in, um, in the importance of including spiritual care in any comprehensive package. And precedent certainly exists for these services in TRICARE, um, in, uh, in other uh, programs. And so I commend the gentleman for bringing this forward and add my support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Would the gentleman yield to me before he yields back? I, I, yes, sir. 
I uh, thank the gentleman for the amendment. I agree that we should endeavor to ensure that the bill not discriminate against any religion. By the same token, it's important to make sure that we don't require the coverage of one particular religious benefit at the expense of another. I support the amendment and will urge its passage. I thank the chairman and I yield back my time. Are we ready for the question? All those in favor of the Shimkus amendment say aye. Aye. Oppose no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Mrs. Baldwin, you have an amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Oh, 05. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Ms. Baldwin of Wisconsin. And others. Uh, without objection, the uh, amendment will be considered as read and the general is recognized for five minutes. And I would ask members to... Uh, Could we reserve a point of order on it, Mr. Uh, Chairman? The uh, gentleman from Texas reserves a point of order. Uh, I'd ask the members to um, pay attention to the uh, speaker and recognize generally for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am honored today to offer an amendment that serves to unify us. Despite the diverse perspectives represented among progressives like myself, moderates, and blue dogs. Our members have worked together to find innovative ways to save additional dollars in health care, allowing us to address some of our differences and to restore the sub subsidies that we offer to middle-income families to make sure that premiums are more affordable for all working families. I'm proud of the way our unity package has come together. And I will attest to the fact that my colleagues and I have been negotiating around the clock, quite literally, uh, to get to this point. Over the past few weeks, our committee has seen movement followed by impasse, followed by breakthrough, followed by more impasse. Mr. Chairman, it is my hope. Committee will please come to order. Mr. Chairman, it is my hope that this unity package represents the final breakthrough that will lead us to advance health care reform. This amend amendment is a powerful response to the naysayers, the cynics, and the keepers of the status quo. And by adopting it today, we will demonstrate that Congress is capable of bridging our differences to finally make reform of our health care system a reality. It represents a common goal to advance national health care reform legislation out of this committee, out of the House, and see it signed into law this year. That is what the American public expects of us, and we agree the time has come. Many of my colleagues contributed significantly to this package, and I would now like to yield to a couple of them. I'll start with my friend, uh, Congresswoman Kathy Castor. Thank you. One of the ways we are going to lower health care costs for American families and hold down the cost to government is to lower the prices of prescription drugs. So my, my portion of this package is an amendment that grants the HHS Secretary the authority to establish a formulary within the public option. The a formulary is a list of drugs and pharmaceuticals. CBO has informed me that the amendment is a cost saver. And in fact, Representative Harmon bird dogged uh, the CBO director to get him on record here as well. Lower drug prices pursuant to a formulary in the new nonprofit public option places our new public option on a level playing field with the private health insurers that already established their own formularies. I thank my colleagues for all of their hard work on this package. I yield back to Ms. Baldwin. Thank you. I would now like to yield to my colleague, uh, uh, Chris Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Baldwin. There's an important piece in this bill which gets at the uh, savings we can achieve from administrative simplifications by uh, making more of our transactions electronic. We could potentially save 10 to 15 billion dollars in our health care system is something that uh, Representative Gordon has worked on as well. Um, uh, in general, though, I I'd really like to thank Ms. Baldwin and others for their work here. I think there is a lot of agreement that we need to squeeze every possible dollar uh, out of this bill, um, but not at the expense of the people that we are trying to help. 
not at the expense of the folks that were trying to get hooked up with affordable health care insurance. Uh, and this package, I think, points a very clear and workable way forward to squeeze that money out of this bill and out of our health care system, uh, but do it in the right way. Uh, and I thank all my colleagues for their work on this amendment. Yield back. I would now yield to uh, Ms. Harmon. I'm so happy to be part of this team that is uh, bringing uh, this unity amendment and then the next unity amendment uh, uh, before the committee and just want to comment further on the um, on, on uh, part of it uh, and say that uh, uh, we're not just talking about cost cutting um, when we set up a formulary, but we're also talking about better care. This is what members of Congress have. Uh, our private plans are managed by PBMs with formularies. And to emphasize something that Ms. Castor said, uh, when he was before us, uh, the CBO director, Doug Elmendorf, said the way to cut costs is to establish a drug formulary and let it negotiate for drug prices. And this way we will bring drug costs down in a quality environment. And I just want to finally ask uh, the chairman, um, uh, is, I would hope that this would be done in consultation with uh, USP. I know this is something you have considered, and I'd ask the amendment sponsors as well, the uh, U.S. Pharmacopoeia. Uh, I just want to be sure that we're using established practices as we set up the uh, formulary. Or maybe I should ask any of the sponsors of the amendment just to be sure we are creating that legislative history. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harmon, and w with that, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, and I yield back. Are you ready for the question? All uh, those in Could we have some time in opposition? Oh, yes, Mr. Barton. I heard your, your side screaming for vote. <laughs> a well, at least let us tell you why we're opposed to it before we get rolled on it. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it is proper form, at least, to give us some opportunity. Uh, we do. I oppose it. I won't say everybody on our side opposes it. Um, but it, we just passed an amendment. I, I give the Blue Dogs credit. They did try to cut costs a little bit, and, and hopefully that amendment will. Uh, it would seem to me this amendment is going to raise costs. It creates a pilot program for Medicaid uh, where the secretary would be allowed to increase the federal match dollars uh, up to 90 percent for the first two years and 75 percent for the next three years. This formulary uh, that has been discussed. Would, would the gentleman yield on that point on the pilot project? Yes, ma'am. I'll be happy to. Uh, this is uh, one of my contributions to the uh, bill, and it would actually be a cost reducer. Right now, there's a pilot in Medicare for accountable care organizations that is projected to save $2 billion over 10 years. This, if we extend it to Medicare, would produce additional savings. Of course, some of those would accrue to the state, some to the federal government, but that is the, um, uh, what we expect to be the results of this measure. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, and I hope you're right, but when you allow for increase in expenditures, it's hard to see how that's going to end up decreasing, but maybe it will. Um, the formulary, um, the Federal Trade Commission, the CBO, has looked at that idea, and uh, they indicated that if it had been part of the original uh, Part D, it would have probably increased Medicare Part D cost 10 percent. So, um, right. will the gentleman I, yield? Um, I'll be happy to yield the gentlelady from Florida. That uh, that on that point, that's not accurate, and and it was confirmed here by the CBO director at the, uh, in response to to Congresswoman Harmon's question. Uh, Mr. Orzag has also confirmed it. I think the difference is through a formulary. It's more akin to the VA system where they really do, where they're really able to save a lot of money. And in fact, CBO uh, commented on this and said just this morning, yes, this saves costs. Okay. Well, um, we think that this amendment, if adopted, is probably going to increase costs. We, we do appreciate the intentions of the authors, true. but we would respectfully oppose it. Mr. And I, I want to yield to Dr. Burgess before I go back. I just, <clears throat> there, there are things in this that, that are that are reasonable and, and worthy of further study. It's a shame it's brought to us this way. The f Physician Group Practice Demonstration Project has, has uh, started by Secretary Levitt in the last administration has been nothing short of spectacular in its delivery of savings. But I just got to tell you, from a clinician standpoint, if you've ever practiced with a formulary, you would not be happy about going back to that. 
I lived with a formula for four years at Parkland Hospital. It was the most, the most egregious, onerous thing that, that has ever happened to me. I was so grateful when Dr. McClellan under the Part D program said, look, there are going to be six classes of drugs that are going to be protected, and there's going to be at least two choices within each of those six classes of drugs. That's what's led to the success of the Part D program. That's what's led to the high patient satisfaction within the Part D program. But now you're going to have the Secretary of Health and Human Services determine a formulary. Well, oftentimes one size does not fit all. In fact, the more we find out about genomic medicine, we understand that medicine needs to become more personalized, not less personalized. So if you're going to have a formulary that only has one oral contraceptive, only has one option for, for estrogen replacement after menopause, only has one option for treatment of hypertension, only has one option for treatment of, of high cholesterol. As we find in other European countries who exist under a formula, I think you're going to find your clinicians unnecessarily restricted. And just on the point on PBMs, we went through this and, and went through it, enormous effort to try to not hurt the community pharmacists when we went through the Medicare Part D program. And in spite of that effort, uh, many of them felt that they still, got, they still got the short end of the deal. With what I see in front of me today, I, I think you're going to be hearing from your community pharmacists over August. I hope you do, because what you've got outlined here on this paper today is truly going to eliminate the, the mom and pop pharmacists that so many of our patients depend upon to get not just medical uh, medical devices and, and pharmaceuticals, but also medical advice. And thank you, Mr. Ch uh, I thank the ranking member. I yield back to the ranking member. Well, to Mr. Deal. Deal. I yield to Mr. Deal the last 20 seconds. Thank you. I would like to ask counsel, first of all, does the public option uh, come under the definition of a qualified health benefits plan? Yes, it would. So all of the reporting information that starts on the top of page four of this amendment as to the volume of mail order and retail pharmacy uh, prescriptions that are filled, uh, all of the disclosures about uh, price concessions, et cetera, the public option would be required to make those same disclosures? Uh, those disclosure requirements refer to information that the PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager, used by a plan, should the plan use one, have to report to the plan and to the commissioner. And that would include the public option? That's correct. That's, that's all the questions I have. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Are we ready for the question? All those in favor of the Baldwin Amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. You ask for a roll call? roll call vote. You want to do a hands? Um. <laughs> Let's, yeah, we'll do a show of hands. I don't see a. Yeah. That's, um, <laughs> all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. The clerk have the vote. All those opposed, please raise your hand. We like this hand raising six. Yeah. Clerk will announce the uh, vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were the division vote was 30 ayes, 25 noes. 30 ayes, 25 noes. The ayes have it. I, I think I'm going to ask for a roll call vote because I didn't. I honestly, I counted the hands. I didn't. Clerk count, will call the roll. I didn't count 30. Clerk will call the roll. Hands raised. Mr. Waxman. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't do it on close votes. <laughs> Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Dingle. 
Mr. Dingell, aye. Mr. Markey, Mr. Boucher, Mr. Pallone, Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Gordon, Mr. Gordon, aye. Mr. Rush, Mr. Rush, aye. Ms. Eshoo, Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak, Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green, aye. Mr. Green, aye. Ms. Deget, Ms. Deget, aye. Mrs. Caps, Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle, Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon, Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Schakowsky, Ms. Schakowsky, aye. Mr. Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Inslee, Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross, Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner, Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson, Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield, Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson, Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow, Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill votes aye. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen, Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton, Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns, Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal, Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer, Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich, Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts, Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bono Mack, Ms. Bono Mack, no. Mr. Walden, Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick, Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn, Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry, Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise, Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Boucher, Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? <laughs> Clerk will tally the vote and announce it. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 32 ayes and 26 noes. 32 ayes, 26 noes. The uh, amendments adopted. <laughs> Mr. Shattuck, do you have an amendment? I do, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. It's uh, Shattuck number 2B.
clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Shattuck of Arizona. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the midst of this debate, I think sometimes we have a tendency to miss what's good about American health care. Indeed, uh, medical innov innovation, drug development, expeditious diagnosis, and timely treatment has made the United States the world leader in breast cancer treatment and, indeed, in all forms of transfer cancer treatment. Um, as this chart shows, um, the five-year survival rates in the United States for all men's cancers are better than those in Canada, Europe, or England. It is also true for all women's cancers that our five-year survival rates are better than in Canada, Europe, uh, or England. The focus of this particular uh, amendment is breast cancer, but before we go there, I want to mention prostate cancer. The uh, survival rates, the five-year survival rates in the United States, as this graph shows, uh, taken from studies done by Concord and published in uh, Lancelot Oncology, the five-year survival rate in the United States is 91.9 percent. In Britain, by contrast, it's 50 percent, dramatically lower. Uh, the amendment I have put before you focuses on breast cancer. Uh, we have a saying in the Shattuck family, any time uh, or any day on which neither a member of the family nor anyone we love is diagnosed with cancer is a good day. I think cancer is the disease about which Americans are most concerned, and I'm pleased to have support on this amendment from my colleagues Mrs. Myrick of North Carolina and Mrs. Blackburn of Tennessee. This chart shows that breast cancer survival rates in the United States uh, again, are significantly better than in Canada or in Europe or in England. And I would hope we would want to preserve that. And so what the amendment simply says is that uh, once a year, the Government Accountability Office would conduct an annual study concerning breast cancer survival rates uh, and reveal that information. And that if uh, in any one of those studies it turns out that breast cancer survival rates in the United States are declining, uh, by more than one percent, one tenth of one percent, then uh, women in the United States could choose uh, to pick a plan that focused on breast cancer, a plan that devoted resources to preventing uh, and or treating breast cancer or otherwise focused its efforts on this terrible disease. Uh, I think it's a reasonable step. It's an effort to make uh, clear that we are concerned about this disease. And with that, I'd be happy to yield to my colleague, Ms. Myrick. I thank the gentleman. I, I'm a nine-year breast cancer survivor, and I was a beneficiary of our good health care system and the fact that literally I was able to see six, uh, six doctors all total have three mammograms and an ultrasound before it was finally diagnosed because I knew something was wrong. And in other systems, I would not have had that benefit. So it's extremely important that we do everything we can to protect this in this bill that we're sure that there is no decrease in the advantages that cancer patients have now today and that they will still have those under this plan the way it's subscribed today. Thank you. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman for, uh, gentlelady. And I would now yield to my colleague uh, from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. I thank the gentleman for the amendment and for what the amendment accomplishes for women. I think one of the greatest fears for women as they are looking at what would happen with a transition to government-run health care, they fear what would happen to their care, especially if they have a risk of breast cancer or if they are survivors. And there are five things that this bill would do that are important to breast cancer survivors. Number one, yeah. in no way would the care be diminished that a breast cancer patient mm -hmm. is entitled to receive. Number two is the GAO study that Mr. Shattuck mentioned, making certain that they look at the changes to the five-year survival rate. It would require, number three, the Secretary of HHS to annually certify that no decrease in those rates has occurred. And number four, it if they do find a decrease, the amendment allows women and their families with female members to purchase benefit mandate free coverage of their choice, something that would meet their needs and also address their fears. And fifth, it would uh, make certain that they are not forced to buy expensive essential benefit uh, insurance that would include items they do not need. I thank him for his leadership and I yell back. 
I thank the gentle lady for yielding back. My oldest sister is a 20-year breast cancer survivor. Uh, I praise the fact and am thankful every day that she has survived that disease. I think this is a reasonable amendment. Uh, I hope we'll adopt it, and I urge the committee to uh, do so uh, in the strongest possible words. What the, what the gentleman's, gentleman time, oh. gentleman's time has expired. And I, um, who is seeking recognition? Well, the chair will recognize himself. Uh, this, <laughs> this amendment is very similar to the other amendment. No, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. This amendment uses the, um, it really sounds good, but it has a, a little hook to it. It states any family with a woman in it, which basically means almost every family, can choose a plan that is exempt from minimum benefit requirements if the overall breast cancer survival rates go down by 0.01 percent in all private and public plans. Now, the connection between a 0.1 percent decrease in the five-year survival rate and minimum benefit requirements is a weak causation at best. The reason the bill has minimum benefit requirements is because too many private health insurance plans don't cover the necessary services and treatments that people need, and that includes breast cancer patients. I think one of the main reasons we're doing health reform is because people are sick and tired of paying for health insurance and believing that when the worst scenario happens, they're covered. That's why the bill, the underlying bill, will require that all plans can no longer exclude coverage because of pre-existing conditions or stop paying for services because of annual and lifetime caps. Ensuring that all plans have minimum benefits means that Americans can rest assured that they are getting what they pay for, and if the worst case happens, then they will get the medical care they need. This amendment is disingenuous. It will only lower the quality of care for the millions of Americans counting on us to finally ensure health insurance companies are giving us the services we thought we paid for. I urge the opposition to this uh, amendment. And uh, Ms. Esch, I yield to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to ask the, uh, the maker of the, uh, of the amendment uh, what um, uh, breast cancer advocacy groups are supporting the bill, if there are any. Um, I was not able to run it past any breast cancer survival groups. This is my idea. Uh -huh. We've been working on various amendments. Okay. Uh, I, would, I would like to point out that while well, the chairman read the word minimum health benefit mandates repeatedly into his statement, uh, in point of fact, it only exempts them from uh, those benefit mandates in Section 124, uh, titled which is uh, Recommendation and Adoption of Benefit Standards. Um, I don't believe some of the benefit standards that the chairman referred to are, in fact, in that section. Chairman. And with that, I would be happy to yield back. Mr. Green. Mr. Chairman, I, having read the amendment, and I appreciate you yielding to me, the, uh, the concern I guess I have about it is that the reason this, we need this bill is that we need to have the health benefit mandates. Those of us served in state legislators know that there are certain problems with, uh, in certain states that you will buy an insurance policy and you assume it covers something, but if it's not on the state minimum benefit mandate, it's not there. And I'll give you a great example. My first term in the state legislature in Texas, we had a bill that would mandate uh, health care for newborn children. The standard state insurance policy did not take in the children for the first 21 days in 1973. So there's a reason that we have minimum benefits, and I would hope that whatever this, uh, our agency would come up with would make sure that we have benefits at least as good as what we have under the Federal Employees Plan because I have to admit I fought with those, our current plan on not providing the number of uh, breast cancer screenings with family members and sometimes you have to fight for it but I would rather have a minimum benefit or a benefit package than going out on our own without anything that's guaranteed and so that's why I think the amendment's a bad choice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll try and be brief. I, having grown up with the number of women who have um, died because of breast cancer, um, 
I think I've come to the realization that preventative medicine, early detection are probably the most important gauges and, and not a matter of whether you're in a good plan or a bad plan. Um, but I would like to, to, to hope that uh, we could look at, at some language that would at least allow us uh, going forward in the future uh, to provide for some method to analyze what's the best way to detect, uh, what's the best way to get uh, women in for annual mammo mammographies and, and to do the things that are necessary. Um, I, I, re I, re I reclaim my time. I want to agree with the gentleman. That's a very important reason why we need this bill and we need to do more in that direction. But what this amendment does is, is uh, try to uh, exclude the ability of people to get the full range of benefits. I urge opposition. Uh, are we ready for the question? All those in favor of the Shattuck Amendment say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. On that, Mr. Chairman, I request a roll call vote. How about hands? No, sir. Roll call vote, please. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Gordon. I'm sorry, Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Gett. Ms. Gett, no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Mr. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton, Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns, Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal, Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus, Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Booyer, Mr. Booyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich, Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mac. Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. 
Mr. Scalise? Aye. Mr. Space? Mr. Space votes no. Mr. Boucher? Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Stupak? Mr. Stupak? No. Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross, Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Markey? Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Gordon? Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Sh Shimkus? Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Walden? Mr. Walden, aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change a vote? Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania votes aye. Sure, the clerk ready to report the vote? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 22 ayes and 36 noes. 22 ayes, 36 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Who do we go to now, Pervy? Ms. Schakowsky, you have an amendment. I do. I have an amendment at the desk. Premiums and Drugs 3 offered to Division A, otherwise known as Unity 2. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3200 offered by Ms. Schakowsky. Without objection, Illinois. amendment is considered as read. Gentlelady from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to offer this amendment on behalf of my colleagues, Representatives Castor, Sutton, Wiener, Caps, Baldwin, Sarbanes, Bradley, Matsui, and Gett. I particularly want to thank my co-sponsors, Mr. Welch, Mr. Murphy, and Mrs. Ms. Harmon for their work in putting this amendment together. We have been working in this markup to make health care more affordable for families, Mr. businesses, Chairman, and individuals. Mr. Chairman, the committee is not in order. Mr. Chairman, the thank you. General is correct. The committee is not in order. The um, author of this amendment deserves the courtesy of uh, having members listen to her. Please proceed. We've been working in this markup to make health care more affordable for families, businesses, and individuals, and this amendment will help us in three ways. One, it will help prevent excessive premium increases by limiting annual increases in premiums for exchange participating plans to 150 percent of medical inflation. Two, it addresses the need to have Medicare negotiate rates in order to lower Part D drug prices. Third, it provides that the savings achieved through these two provisions will be used to lower premium costs for consumers in the exchange. Um, I, I want to, to explain further. I want to yield to my colleagues first, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Welch, Ms. Harmon, and Ms. DeGette. Mr. Murphy? Would you like to yield to them one minute each so we'll be able Fine. to? Fine. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank my co-sponsor, uh, Ms. Schakowsky. Um, our biggest insurer in Connecticut announced uh, a couple weeks ago that they were going to raise rates by 32 percent on individuals and small businesses. Now, luckily in Connecticut, we have the ability to review that rate, and we're probably going to be, be able uh, to defray the costs to those individuals and small businesses. Uh, this um, amendment uh, allows under the exchange for that same mechanism to be used to protect not only businesses and individuals who will purchase insurance in the exchange, but the federal government who is going to pick up some of the cost. Uh, we are looking for ways here uh, to not only protect uh, the underlying costs to the government, but also to protect our consumers as well. And as we try to find ways to offset 
some of the potential uh, increases in cost to consumers that uh, were included in a previous amendment. I think this is a common sense way uh, to find savings both to the Federal Government uh, and to individuals by making sure that we are not passing along excessive premium increases on an annual basis. Uh, and I yield back. Who, who next? Uh, th uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, the American taxpayer is the biggest purchaser of prescription drugs. It buys wholesale but pays retail. This amendment would require and empower the Secretary of Human Services to negotiate bulk price discounts in purchasing bulk prescription drugs. Legislation to do this was passed by the House in 2007. But right now, Medicare Part D pays more for prescription drugs than literally anybody else. Compare it to what the VA pays. Just a few examples. Prevacid, 30 milligram capsule. VA, 332 bucks a year. Part D, $1,444. Protonics, VA, $214. Medicare Part D, $1,148. The list goes on. On average, for the median price increase, when you're doing it through the Part D program, is 58 percent higher. The Oversight and Government Reform Committee, Mr. Chairman, did a, a study last year that said if we had price negotiation, it could save the taxpayers $156 billion. What we want now is to have price negotiation on the donut. The President has done it on the donut hole. I yield back. Next is Ms. Harmon. I thank the gentlewoman for yielding and, and uh, uh, am pleased to be part of Unity Amendment 2. In Unity Amendment 1, uh, we passed uh, 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 the requirement that there be a formulary in the public option. That was a piece of the so-called care package, which a number of us introduced uh, several weeks ago. This amendment contains another piece, and that piece is to repeal the ban on uh, negotiating drug prices under Part D of Medicare. Uh, there are a number of new members uh, in this committee they were not there, as, as the oldies were, uh, at 3 a.m. on, uh, not here, at 3 a.m. on November 22, 2003, when an amendment was kept open for four hours uh, to ban uh, the, the Secretary of HHS from negotiating lower drug prices. It ultimately passed, after many kneecaps were broken, by 220 to 215. This amendment will fix what was broken that night. I yield back. Ms. Schakowsky, anybody else you? Yes, Ms. Degat. I just want to close, um, Mr. Chairman, by thanking Ms. Schakowsky, Ms. Baldwin, and everybody else, and, and the Blue Dogs for working together on this package of three unity amendments. And, and I want to say about the last two amendments, this hasn't really been focused on. Both of those amendments have a clause which says that any savings that we realize from these amendments will, will be used to apply um, to 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 the premiums. To, what they'll be used to do is uh, go towards making premiums more affordable for lower-income people in the health exchange by offsetting the reductions in premium subsidies under the Blue Dog Amendment. This is a great example of how this committee can work together, Mr. Chairman, and we're all really proud of our efforts, and we're proud that this bill will move forward to the floor. With that, I'll yield back. Time has expired. Mr. Blunt. I'd like some time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, this is the, I guess this is the amendment that uh, we almost debated uh, earlier that, that my friend from Vermont had. I'd just like to make a couple of points I made then. One is that this committee asked, the majority asked uh, the CBO director when he was here if, if government negotiating for drugs, government negotiating, as this, this amendment would suggest, would save any money. He said no. That's, uh, I don't know that there was a record of that meeting, but it was well attended, and the members are here. Uh, I did check that uh, Part D participation in people who have VA coverage. This is coverage where the government does negotiate for drugs. Forty percent of people who have VA coverage, uh, that's 1,225,900 people, uh, chose to go into Medicare Part D. Uh, because they can get the drugs they want. You know, the only way to negotiate for the government to negotiate for drugs is to be willing not to offer. Now, the difference in private companies negotiating is they negotiate di different combinations of drugs. I uh, certainly appreciate the numbers, the price numbers my friend gave on what you could pay on Part D under some plans. My, my guess would be that that is not the lowest number that you can pay, but the highest number you can pay. 
And certainly not every company that has negotiated Medicare Part D has negotiated the lowest possible combination of all drugs. That is why if you are finding your drugs under Medicare Part D, you need to look specifically at the drugs you take, which if there are two of you at your house, mo many, many times the two spouses do not find the same company unless they happen to take exactly the same drugs. Certainly there are some companies that have not negotiated well for these prices at all. And if you find, and, and that's not the company you should choose. So I just think there is, there's no evidence that this is a good idea. Uh, my friends on the other side have wanted to do it from day one. Uh, at one time in this committee, we suggested that the, uh, the, the price for Medicare Part D would be $35 a month. The year Medicare Part D started, the lowest average price was $24 a month. And in every year since then, it's been 40 percent below the projected level. Marketplace works. The government is not a good negotiator. The government's only a good negotiator if you're willing to have a very limited amount of drugs. And apparently in the biggest area where the government does negotiate, uh, those people that have that coverage already have gone to the extra effort to get the Medicare Part D coverage to the tune of 40 percent. Over 1 million people in VA have opted uh, to make the effort to be in Medicare. Would, would Part the gentleman yield? The so gentleman, would the gentleman I, yield? You first yield our five minutes sure. to anybody over the here. The gentleman yield. Uh, Mr. Booyer. Thank you very, very much for yielding. The VA, that, please. The VA's formulary has always been under attack since I've been here. And even before I arrived in, in the early 1990s under the Democrat controlled Congress, they thought that this would be a good idea to extend the VA pricing. Do you know it was repealed within six months? It was repealed. It was repealed because of the impact of, of pharmaceutical pricing. So it is really challenging. Uh, pharmaceutical companies do have multi-level pricing with regard to their drugs and even government purchasing of those drugs. The VA, we have the lowest with regard to our purchase of drugs. And why do we do it that way? Because it is a very precious and sacred population. The men and women who have sacrificed so we have said that we are going to have a very special population and we actually go in there and we will dictate under these manufacturers what type of price we are willing to pay. At the same time, a lot of these manufacturers will also then come back and say, you know what, we will even go lower than the, the Federal Supply Schedule. Now, why would they do that? They do that because many of our hospitals are also teaching hospitals and they want their pharmaceuticals to gain access to who? Those new docs. They want them to be able to know what the value of those pharmaceutical products. My only challenge is, or charge here is to all the members, we have looked at this before. In, the GAO did a report in August of 2000. And when they, when they examined this issue about expanding access to the Federal prices and its cause upon price change, here is what the GAO said with regard to its summary. By using its purchasing power principally derived from large purposes covered by the Medicaid program, Federal government obtains significant discount prices for pre prescription drugs from drug manufacturers, both Federal and selected non-Federal entities. Extending Federal prices to Medicare beneficiaries could result in paying less for drugs. However, these prices, these lower prices will come from with a trade-off. Federal and non-Federal purchasers will pay more if, when drug manufacturers raise prices to them to offset revenue losses resulting from extending Federal prices to Medicare beneficiaries. That is exactly what occurred in the early 1990s when they had to repeal when Congress took the action to extend other contracting powers of government into the VA's formulary. Please, let's not recreate the, this all over again. It may be a sound good idea. But it, it, it's just, it, it doesn't fit. So I'm, I'm making an appeal to the members, please don't do this again. I yield back. Okay. Um, all time has expired. The vote now occurs on the um, amendment offered by Ms. Schakowsky. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed no. no. The ayes have it. Okay, let's go for a roll call. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Dingell, aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. 
Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green. Mr. Green, aye. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett, aye. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Tchaikovsky. Ms. Tchaikovsky, aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, aye. <coughs> Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, aye. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Ms. Barton votes no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, no. Mr. Deal. Mr. Deal, no. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bono Mac. Ms. Bono Mac, no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, no. Mr. Rogers. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. All members respond to the call of the roll. Clerk will tally the vote. Clerk will announce the vote. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there were 32 ayes and 23 noes. 32 ayes, 23 noes, the amendments agreed to. Mr. Mr. Hall? Mr. Chairman, just a point of order. Uh, Gentlemen, status point of order. Is it possible that you could just give us an update on what the schedule might look at from your point of view? Uh, there are some members have some later flights, but I'm just curious if you had any feel. Well, for after, after Mr. Hall has offered his amendment and the committee has disposed of it, I'm going to call a, dem a, a Democratic uh, caucus, uh, a brief one, I hope, 
to uh, work out the schedule for the rest of this evening. Oh, I have no announcement to make. Okay. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman. We have, we have the Hall in it. Mr. Hall, can you identify your amendment a little bit? Does it look like this? Uh, yeah, I had Hall 1 and Hall 2, and I had one of them with Mr. Dingle. He had a problem. We worked that out. This may be the Hall 1 or Hall 2. On, on Medicare Advantage. On Medicare on Advantage. Medicare Advantage? Yes. I think, okay. Send that down to them if they need it. Hall one. Hall one. Hall one, I believe, sir. It's Hall one, I think. I think that's all I got right there. See if that will help you. Phase in reduction. Yeah. Okay. Has the clerk located the we amendment? We have, Mr. Chairman. Clerk, Sorry. please report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and Mr. Hall is recognized to explain his amendment. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief with it because I think the committee is uh, aware of uh, the fact that the proposed bill, the bill we've been working on for several days, cuts Medicare Advantage by roughly $156 billion. And my amendment simply uh, reduces the cuts by half. Now, we had a vote earlier on cutting, on re reducing the entire uh, $156 billion, but uh, that failed by a fairly close vote, and I'm trying it now to uh, just cut by 50 percent. Actually, the current provisions in the bill are going to result in reductions in uh, Medicare uh, Advantage funding by more than 20 percent, and a lot of the areas and likely limit seniors to uh, access uh, uh, to coordinated case through the Medicare Advantage program. It's going to really be limiting on them. And really, we ought to be uh, making cuts to the program, ought to be developed in a fair and equitable manner. The goal ought to be to provide Medicare beneficiaries with better access, uh, put the program on a more sound financial footing, and preserve some opportunities by Medicare beneficiaries to en enroll in plans across the country. Uh, just for very briefly, let me quickly say that in the far eastern district of my, one of the counties in my district, it would cut them $175, and there's an enrollment of around 1,600 people there. But in the smallest county in my district, it cuts uh, by $220, and there's only, I think, 58 or 68. It's a very small county there. A big county like Bear County, uh, they have 64,000 enrollment. It cuts roughly $230 per Medicare Advantage beneficiary there. Uh, same thing for Harris County. It cuts about 220 and there's 13,977 enrolled. I yield the rest of my time to uh, the gentleman from Indiana who has some good figures on this. I, th I thank the gentleman for yielding. The uh, Medicare Advantage plans are an important option for seniors and often have lowered out-of-pocket out costs for seniors. They cover more services than traditional Medicare, including vision, dental, hearing benefits, as well as prescription drug coverage and better preventive care. I oppose the cuts that the Democrat majority have offered uh, to Medicare Advantage. I believe such cuts would have a devastating impact on the access to beneficiaries in rural areas and could result in higher premiums, benefit cuts, and outright loss of Medicare uh, coverage. This is a very popular program. From 2004 to 2009, over 1 million beneficiaries in rural areas joined Medicare Advantage, an increase of 507 percent. So when I think about how many are on, on, in this program, in Indiana, over 148,000 Hoosiers are enrolled in the Medicare Advantage plans. So what I did is I thought I'd take a look at some of the members here and how many beneficiaries they have in their district that will, that will face these devastating cuts for, for a program 
that they feel is pretty important to themselves. So in Indiana, Mr. Hill, has, I'll round it off to 100. Mr. Hill has 14,100. Mr. Space has 24,000. Mr. Matheson has 31,200. Mr. Melanson has 19,878. Mr. Ross has 13,900. Mr. Barrow has 15,600. Mr. Inslee has 22,000. Mr. Gordon has 23,900. Mr. Boucher has 22,100. Mr. Gonzalez has 30,972. And Mr. Stupak has 30,438. Should these cuts be enacted, thousands and thousands and thousands uh, of seniors uh, will stand to lose uh, their coverage and uh, leaving them with, uh, without important health care coverage and options. And I, I just think that it's wrong and there's a better way to handle our seniors than, than this way. I yield back to the, to, I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Dr. Gingrich. Yeah, I thank, you for, I thank okay. you for your presentation. This focuses on chronic diseases. And who wants to, oh, Mr. Gingrich, Dr. Gingrich, I yield you I, I thank the general remaining the amount. <laughs> I thank the gentleman from Texas for yielding. And, and this goes to the point that I raised uh, a little bit earlier in a amendment that I submitted. I mean, Medicare Advantage was created for the purpose, I think, of providing more than uh, FIFA service and just episodic care. And uh, that's why it is a little bit more expensive. But in the long run, uh, theoretically, it would save a tremendous amount of money. Uh, and so the, the cuts, yeah, sure, we, we should cut. Uh, and try to reduce the cost, but uh, I think we've cut way, way more out of it than uh, just the fat. We've cut the muscle uh, off the bone, and, it, and I agree with uh, the amendment of Mr. Hall, and I yield back. Yeah, this cuts 10 percent rather than 20 percent, long and the short of it. And I, I yield to anyone that wants, has any questions. How about I, I yielding back your yield time? Yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair would oppose the amendment. It would result in adding $50 billion to the deficit or require, uh, un it does not require unspecified reductions to the bill. It would, it would, uh, it would cause a problem. And uh, I know that you uh, are concerned about the cuts we're making to the Medicare Advantage plans, but I think uh, the cuts in the bill are justified. And I urge members to oppose the amendment. And I'd like to go to a vote because it, night is, is late. Um, <laughs> okay. Mr. Inslee, one minute. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, many of the areas in the country that have suffered from a low reimbursement rate and unfair geographic distribution uh, have relied on Medicare Advantage plans. And there are concerns about this. But the good news is, is that uh, we have been working with the Speaker of the House, who has been um, helping us find ways to solve this, some of which is not in the jurisdiction of this committee. And I'm fairly confident that we will succeed in finding some bridge to help our communities to the new Medicare reimbursement system that will provide for high quality and will provide adequate reimbursement rates. And I'm confident we're going to head in that direction. It may not be tonight, but I feel good about that. And I just want to ask the chair if he will work with us, with uh, the speaker, to continue those efforts. Uh, gentlemen, yield to me. Absolutely. Uh, we want to work on that. And I think it's imperative for us to work it out before we have the bill up on the House floor. Are we ready for the vote? Uh, Republicans are asking for a roll call vote. Is that correct? The, chair, the uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. No. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Ms. Mr. Gordon, no. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget, no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. 
Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross? Mr. Weiner? Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson? Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield? Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson? Mr. Barrow? Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill? Ms. Matsui? Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen? Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor? Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Murphy of Connecticut? Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space? Mr. McNerney? Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton? Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley? Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch? Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton? Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Hall, aye. Mr. Upton? Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns? Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal? Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield? Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus? Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt? Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer? Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich? Mr. Radonovich, aye. Mr. Pitts? Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack? Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden? Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry? Aye. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers? Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick? Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania? Mr. Burgess? Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn? Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry? Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise? Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Melanson? Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Green? Mr. Green votes no. Ms. Ms. Eshoo? Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Mr. Hill? Mr. Hill, aye. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Space? Mr. Space, aye. Of all members, uh, Mr. Rush, how do you wish to vote? I Ms. Mr. Rush votes no. <laughs> Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania is not recorded. Mr. Mr. Murphy votes Mr. aye. Oh, there are members over here that wish to be recorded. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> Mr. Ru I'm sorry, Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Have all members <coughs> voted? <coughs> Anybody wish to change your vote? Clerk will tally the vote. Ready. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, the ayes were 27 and the nays were 31. Okay. 27 ayes. Thir sorry, 31 noes. 31 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Christensen has an amendment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, this is the amendment on the territories that we had uh, just put on hold. And I hope that the questions, we have the correct amendment. Without objection, the amendment will be before us and we're considered okay. as read. We're okay with it. 
Uh, we accept the it. Republican side accepts the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Oppose no. The ayes have it. Mr. Um, Barton, you have an in block amendment? Mr. Chairman, we have an in block amendment um, at the desk. Then we go upstairs. That was the it is the. Um, <coughs> we started earlier. It says uh, Burgess, Ryan, Eshu, Rogers, Burgess Appeals, Melanson, Dental, and Butterfield Medication. It is a bipartisan in block amendment. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Uh, Mr. Barton, I understand this is an amendment of non controversial items or at least agreed to items. That's correct. That, if that's correct, Anybody have anything to say about it? Then let's proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the end block amendment will say aye. 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 Opposed no. The ayes have it, and the end block amendment is agreed to. Uh, the Democrats, uh, uh, Mr. Gett, you were going to ask whether. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. Uh, please state your unanimous um, consent request. Th throughout the, the whole markup, we've had uh, time limitations, and many, many members have had statements that they have not been able to make. So, on both sides, I'd ask unanimous consent that any member may enter into the record um, statements and, um, and materials relating to their amendments that they were not able to, to enter. Without objection, that will be the order. Yeah, we have no objection to that, Mr. Chairman. Democrats will take a brief uh, uh, caucus in 23-22, uh, and uh, we will plan to be no more than 15 minutes, and then we'll return for the markup. The House Energy and Commerce Committee taking a break in the markup of health care reform legislation. The committee has spent the last two days debating and voting on amendments. And Chairman Waxman says he's taking this break, this 15-minute break, to meet with Democrats to decide on a schedule for the rest of the evening tonight. A reminder that you can read the committee's amendments at our website, and that's at cspan.org. While we wait for members to return for this markup to continue, a discussion on how the American public is viewing President Obama's first six months in office. It's from this morning's Washington Journal. Mark Noller, good morning. Thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Good morning. We've now reached the six-month mark of the Obama presidency. What's going to happen tonight and tomorrow, and is there precedence 